Chapter 1 of The Earl's Atonement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Vinay Mala. The Earl's Atonement by Bertha M. Clay. Chapter 1 The Germ of a Tragedy. A nobler girl had never lived than she whose saintly face and saintly ways were so appreciated that in the vicinity of her abode she was known as the village angel. Yet she was of humble origin, the daughter of a poor doctor. He was a struggling country surgeon with a small income, the reward of very hard work. A man of no particular family, with no great connections, of no influence, a man content to wear thick leather shoes, a somewhat shabby coat and frayed gloves, a country surgeon working hard for his daily bread and finding that difficult to win, a man whose daily routine never varied and who would one day pause in his work to die and the world would know him no more. And she was only his daughter, only a doctor's daughter as Sir Wayne Corleone said over and over again to himself. No fortune save the praise and love of all who knew her, no dowry save the blessings of the poor. Nothing but her fair girlish loveliness and sweet pure character. Among other girls, she was what a white lily is among other flowers. One drop of water in the great deep ocean, one grain of sand on the vast seashore, one leaf in the boundless forest is to Sir Wayne Carleon of quite as much importance as the doctor's daughter. She is one in a word of women, one out of the millions of fair girls, differing only from the others in that she is fairer and more graceful, true, sweet and pure as the petals of a white lily. He thinks idly to himself as he watches her. Shall he seek to win her or shall he pass her by? The world is full of fair girls who would smile on the possessor of such broad lands. There is no particular reason for wishing to win her except that it would be a noble sensation to wake up into fervent, passionate love the beautiful dreamy soul shrined in that fair body. A new sensation to quench the light of holiness and truth in the grave, sweet, violet eyes and fill them with the fire of love or the lurid light of passion. A new sensation to touch the sweet lips that now dropped words of gentle wisdom to utter passionate words that tell of love. To wake the soul, filled now with the rapturous love of heaven, to the pains, the pleasures, the ecstasy of earthly love. Quite a novel sensation. The only question was, should he give himself the trouble? Was anything on earth worth the fatigue and anxiety it would cost him? Would love even ever so sweet and deep repay him? In idle mood, with the cane he held listlessly in his hand, he struck down the fair blossoms of the wild saladin among which he stood. What was she after all? But a fair flower, growing in the green heart of the land, to be struck down and slain by the hand of man if he willed it. He had had more love affairs, more intrigues, more flirtations than he could remember. He had forgotten even the names of the women he had loved. He had loved fair and beautiful brunettes, good and simple girls, heartless flirts. If a face attracted him, he had never resisted the attraction. But he had seen nothing, no one like this doctor's daughter, with her dowry of beauty and grace. She was like a new creation to him. He had watched her praises wherever he went. He had watched her and owned to himself no other girl was half so fair. Should he, who had never refused himself any wish that he had formed, who had never let a woman's heart or a woman's honour interfere with his follies, should he win her or let her pass by? As he watched her, the blue sky shone above his head and the golden light of the sun lay around him. The summer wind brought every sweet odour from fields and meadows. 
and the great branches of the lime trees swayed gently to and fro the birds sang but not one of these sweet voices of nature spoke to him he was deaf to them one and all he thought only whether he should take the trouble to win this girl who looked fair and pure as though her heart were in heaven a question of little moment to him at the utmost it meant remaining some weeks longer at whitecroft then probably going abroad and the expenditure of a few thousand pounds to her it meant life or death honor or dishonor heaven or the everlasting darkness of the outcast the sweet flowers of the celandine fell to the right and the left as he struck them recklessly with his cane he looked once more at the face of the doctor's daughter the golden hair was like a halo round it from out of the violet eyes shone the truth tenderness and purity of a loving soul the mouth had the sweet pathetic graceful lines one sees in the portrait of betray's sensi the delicate graceful curves of the head and neck the slender faultless figure instinct with grace and refinement made a picture that was seldom equalled she had been playing the organ at the church and was busily engaged in locking the worn old door when he passing up to the vicarage saw her and stood watching her how love would transfigure that face he said to himself the people round here call her a saint it will be a novelty to make love to a saint i will stay away went the smiling heads of the celandine with another vigorous stroke of the stick i will stay he repeated and in those three words lay the germ of a tragedy the death warrant of the sweetest brightest of human creatures the death knell of a human soul she was still struggling with the key it would not lock the old worm eaten door and her white slender fingers were red and bruised man makes his own opportunities or mars them said sir vain carlion this is mine and i will make it he crossed the churchyard even if one of the quiet dead had risen from his grave to give him solemn warning it would not have turned him from his purpose once formed nothing ever did he was standing by her side the next moment hat in hand and the sunlight never fell on a handsomer face dark brilliant proud and full of power a face fatal in its irresistible beauty i beg your pardon he said but that door seems to give you a great deal of trouble if it be necessary to lock it allow me to do it for you i shall be very grateful she replied the lock is rusty and i cannot turn the key there was no blush no flutter of gratified vanity no attempt at even the least flirtation she was calm as sculptured saint the color on the sweet modest face deepened a little as she gave the key into his hand it was only a matter of course that he should pretend to find it even more difficult than it was why is it needful to lock this door you have no thieves in this part of the world he said no no thieves but there are plenty of children she said and when the doors are left open they will go in to rest in the cool shady church or to play at hide and seek in the pews neither the rector nor lady and ruven like it i should say not he cried dirty little urchins like those her face fell he saw the expression change and his dark eyes devoured its fair gentle loveliness they are not all dirty little urchins she said in a voice of gentle reproach i think the children of whitecroft are healthy strong sturdy girls and boys he made a gesture that implied contempt although he did not express it she replied to the gesture with a faint flush even if they are dirty each one has a soul he looked at her in wonder a soul he repeated the idea had not occurred to me but of course they have i have really never thought of souls in connection with village children the sweet grave violet eyes looked at him with attention i think the soul of a child is the most beautiful thing in creation she said softly 
It is the one thing nearest and dearest to heaven. She had been stuck with his face, beautiful as that of a young Apollo, but a shadow of disappointment lay now in the lustrous eyes. That he should not know the value of the soul, even of a village child, lowered him in her sight. But having made an opportunity of speaking to her, he had no wish to pursue this style of conversation. It was neither of village children nor of souls that he desired to speak. I am afraid the rector must go to the expense of a new lock, he said. This will not last much longer. I shall beg the old one when it is done with. Why? she asked with the simple wonder of a child. Because it has brought about that which I most heartily desired, he replied, an introduction to you. There was not the least affectation, not the faintest approach to coquetry in her manner. The grave, sweet simplicity charmed him as nothing had ever done before. Did you wish to know me? How strange, she said. I do not think it strange. I think it perfectly natural. I saw you first in church, three weeks since, and I have been longing ever since to know you. Not the faintest gleam of coquetry came into the eyes or face. He watched her keenly to see if his flattering words produced any effect upon her. He could see none. She did not seem even to understand that it was flattery. She took it as the announcement of a fact, nothing more. I am a very easy person to know, she replied. I think everyone in Whitecroft knows me. Then everyone in Whitecroft is singularly blessed and happy, he said. I wish I were one of them. I do not belong to Whitecroft. She looked at him, taking in with one comprehensive glance the handsome aristocratic face, the tall, well-knit figure, the air of superiority, then smiled thoughtfully. You do not certainly belong to Whitecroft, she said. We have no one like you. Our people are all poor and hard-working. And I am neither, you think? I am quite sure, she replied with a charming little nod of her head. By this time he had been obliged, sorely against his will, to lock the door. He had intended to ask her if she would meet him again, if he might walk across the fields with her. But as she stood in the shadow of the old grey porch, the thick green ivy making the background of the picture, the sunlight falling on her face, on her pale golden hair, and the grey cloak she wore, she looked so young, so pure, so far above the earth, so like what he had seen in pictures of the angels, that his courage failed him. He dared not even hint at making an appointment with her. The nearest attempt possible was to ask her if she had been playing the organ, and she answered yes. When she had any leisure, she spent it in that manner. There is nothing, he said, that I love like music, and the organ seems to me the most perfect of instruments. Do you go every day? That would presuppose a good deal of leisure, he replied. No, not every day. On Thursday, I give several hours to it and she had not the faintest idea why he smiled. He thought to himself that the boundary line was very narrow between the excess of innocence and the excess of art. This was Tuesday, and he would see her again on Thursday. With a few courteous words, he bade her goodbye and went home to dream of a fair, pure face and a halo of golden hair like the angels in the pictures a face into which he longed to put the light and glow of human love. End of chapter 1The Village Angel Everyone in Whitecroft knew and loved the doctor's daughter. There was no one like her and none of them remembered ever to have seen anyone like her. She had grown up in the pretty village without ever leaving it. She belonged to it as the old grey church and the pretty river reveled it. 
as the quaint old houses with overhanging eaves and the green lanes with the tall hedgerows did. No one ever spoke of Whitecroft without making Agatha Brooke, the doctor's daughter, the principal subject of conversation. Many long years had passed since Dr. Brooke came to Whitecroft. He was quite a young man then with his life lying before him. He liked the country much better than the town and thought Whitecroft the prettiest part of the country he had ever seen. He went to live there. When Dr. Slay died, he bought his pretty house and the old-fashioned garden with its spreading sycamore trees, a pretty house that looked as though it were dressed in flowers, shaded with rippling foliage, bright with gleams of scarlet and gold. Roses and passion flowers climbed the walls, framed the windows, clustered over the porch, where in summer it was pleasant to sit and watch the butterflies, the bees and birds. People at first thought him too young, but after a time they discovered that he was much older than his years, that he was gentle, studious and kindly of heart, rather absent-minded and easily imposed upon, kind to the poor and as much interested in saving the life of the poorest woman or child as though he had a duchess for a patient. Dreamy and in many ways unpractical, he was earnestly devoted to his profession and if ever he thought of himself at all, it was to believe that he had been sent expressly into the world to heal the diseases and assuage the pains of mankind. In a very short time, the simple, kindly young doctor had won the heart of the whole village. Men, women and children all loved him trusted him, believed in him, and sought him in all troubles. He married the village beauty Laura Innes, and they were the happiest pair in the world. She was the brightest, merriest doctor's wife, and their little daughter Agatha was like a sunbeam. Rather suddenly, a terrible accident happened, which plunged the whole village into mourning and blighted the doctor's life. He had been appointed medical officer for a somewhat straggling country district and in consequence had been obliged to purchase a little carriage and pony. When the pony was not required for duty, Mrs. Brooke liked to drive her pretty little daughter through the green lanes. But one day a terrible accident happened. She was driving to Westbury along the high road talking to little Agatha about the lovely sights and scenes around them. When suddenly, along the white straight road, she saw a wagonette with two unmanageable horses speeding toward her. She did the best she could. With a white face and beating heart, she told her little daughter not to cry. There was nothing wrong. She drew the pony near to the hedge and waited in terrified silence for the passing of the infuriated horses. It was all over before anyone knew what had happened, and the immediate cause of the accident was never clearly ascertained. Only this, that the little pony in its turn took fright and overturned the carriage on a heap of stones. Little Agatha rolled safely down a grassy bank. The doctor's fair young wife fell with her head on the stones and never spoke again. Death was such a strange, grim visitor in the bright, flowery cottage. The rooms never looked the same again. The world was never the same to him. The brightest and fairest of creatures had gone from it, leaving it dark and cold. In times, the smart of his pain had passed, and he talked and laughed like others. But the cold chill of desolation never left him. It was strange that he did not seek comfort in the beautiful child left to him. He loved her with a very great love, but he grew more dreary and more absent-minded as the years rolled on. How many people live on with the dead heart? He did. He devoted himself to his duties. Behind him lay an island of delight at which he seldom looked, because the sunlight dazzled his eyes. Before him stretched out the great dark sea called Eternity, on the distant golden shore of which stood his fair, well-loved wife. While crossing that sea, if he could heal the frail, ailing bodies and cheer the fainting hearts of his kind, he was glad to do it. The child Agatha was a wonderful child, beautiful as an angel, with the same pure bright face one sees in the pictures of the angels. 
a graceful head covered with curls of pale gold and eyes like violets steeped in dew shining always with pity and compassion almost divine all the overflowing love and tenderness the grand compassion the loving pity that had filled her mother's heart had come to her and with it her father's instinct for helping and healing every creature who required it when she was a grave sweet mite of 7 or 8 the doctor talked to her about all the little children who were ill at that early age the sweet angelic disposition showed itself she saved every little delicacy given to her for the little ones lying with aching head or injured limbs it was the prettiest sight in the world to see the lovely child with her hair of pale gold going into the cottages her little hands laden with gifts who is that strangers asked and the answer was always the same only the doctor's daughter and the doctor's daughter had grown up the village angel even her beautiful name seemed part of herself the old grey church with its ivy covered porch built hundreds of years ago had been dedicated to saint agatha who saint agatha was the village people did not know they had never asked on the great stained glass window at the eastern end of the church there was a picture of her a beautiful fair young maid with a pure sweet face and a halo round the hair of pale gold she carried a palm branch in her hand but what the palm branch meant they never understood the most curious thing was that mrs brook loved the old stained glass window with its fair young saint and her seat in the church was exactly opposite to it when the pretty girl baby was placed in her arms and she saw the pale gold of the hair and the tiny fair face she said to her husband let me call her agatha and he was willing so that the very name was an additional charm in the eyes of the simple people and the doctor's daughter in some inexplicable way was to them part of the church and associated with the mysterious agatha whose sweet saintly face shone on them every sunday the strangest thing was the influence it had on the child itself she was the only agatha in the village and she had been named after the beautiful lady who carried the branch of palm in her hand she asked about her and the doctor told her that saint agatha had been one of those who refused to deny god and worship idols and for that reason the pagan judge had ordered her to be put to death and the memory of her had lived in the hearts of the people ever since young fair delicate fragile beautiful she had preferred the agonies of death to the denial of god there was a grand lesson in the old stained glass window for those who cared to read it the little agatha did care to read it and the village people said as she grew older she resembled the old picture more and more there was no great provision made for education at whitecroft but agatha received the best there was the doctor gave her latin lessons and taught her the elements of science the old organist at the church taught her music nature had given her a voice sweet and clear as the carol of a bird she sang as the birds sing because her heart was full of music and she could not help it so she grew up among them fresh and fair as any white lily the world with its follies its gaieties its pleasures its loves its passions its tragedies was all unknown to her who lived in the pure atmosphere of goodness and charity how would the struggle between her and one like sir wayne carleon end it was more pitiful than the deadly fray between hawk and wounded dove end of chapter 2chapter 3 the saint and the sinner sir wayne carleon had had the word at his feet from the time he lay in his cradle he was born in the purple for his father died in rome of malaria some 3 months before he was born and his mother a gentle pious refined lady had devoted her life to her son she had made only one mistake 
she had completely spoiled him and he grew up handsome selfish fond of luxury impatient of control obstinate and proud he had some good qualities he loved his mother he was generous even to a fault he could not see oppression or injustice in others he never told a falsehood where truth could be managed he had grown up to consider that the world was made for him he was sir vain corlian of gaswood he owned silverdale abbey silverdale house one of the fairest mansions in belgravia belonged to him he was a power in the land for he owned some of the largest coal mines in england and drew a large revenue from them his charities were princely even as his revenue his estates were well managed he was by no means a man of pleasure a follower of fashion considering that he had been trained by the sweetest and best of mothers he was wanting in reverence and loyalty toward women perhaps it was as much the fault of those who pursued him as his own for during many years he had been the most eligible match in england and had been quoted as such everything possible and even at times the impossible had been done to win him but in vain he had broken the heart of more than one woman his own had never been touched he admired made love and rode away no matter if he left an aching heart or a shadowed life behind him that never troubled him there were one or two women who cursed the hour in which his handsome face had smiled on them to their destruction one or two sins were laid to his door that caused the world to shrug its shoulders and murmur some very apologetic sentences about wild oats he would marry and settle some day the matrons said to each other and in the meantime they must be indulgent to the faults of a fashionable sinner whose income could not be less than 200000 pounds per annum he was the pride of the day but as yet he had loved no one his mother lady carlion wished him to marry but he had seen no woman however fair whom he felt inclined to call his wife in this discontented frame of mind he went to pay a promised visit to lord croft of whitecroft abbey a grand old house some 5 miles distant from the village and 3 miles from the pretty county town of westbury lord and lady croft had frequently invited him and in an evil hour he went the visit was pleasant enough with only one drawback in his eyes lady croft was a great lover of the proprieties and she liked all her visitors to attend church on sunday morning there was no getting off comfortably with a cigar no pretence of letters availed and sir wayne found himself obliged to do as others did he had showed some hesitation and a desire to get out of it but lady croft looked him straight in the face you can please yourself she said there is no compulsion but i think when a man has enjoyed himself and served himself all the week round if he cannot give at least 2 hours on sunday to the worship of his god he is not worth much straight words that came to him like a blow in the face he went and in his heart respected lady croft ever afterward he went but it was a fatal hour which took him to the beautiful old church of agatha outwardly he was reverent enough inwardly he was in search of something to amuse himself with the rector who conducted the service the reverend francis ruwan was a gentleman from whom no one had ever yet gleaned the least amusement his wife who sat in the vicarage pew kindly fussy busy lady and looking about her with keen eyes noticed the languor of the handsome young baronet and thought in her heart how she would like to wake him up when he has reviewed all the people before him he sees in the distance a beautiful window which attracts his wandering eyes he does not know what it represents but the colors are rich harmonious beautiful he knows that the window is a work of art and gradually his attention is drawn to the fair pure face of the principal figure there the face and figure of a fair young saint who carries a palm branch in her hand he looks at it steadily for some few minutes thinking how beautiful it is and if goodness made women so beautiful what a sad pity they were not all good 
his eyes wander on and he sees underneath the window a face and figure so like the one there that he is startled a figure clad in soft grey kneels there a slender figure every line of which is grace the face is fair pure bright as the face in the window and the pale golden hair makes a halo round it he is startled for a minute thinking almost that the girl with the palm branch has descended but another glance shows him this perfectly beautiful and exquisite face is living as a matter of course at the earliest opportunity he inquired after her and heard the pathetic little story of her mother's death heard how the young mother had loved the old grey church and had named her baby girl agatha after the figure in the stained glass window he heard how she was called the doctor's daughter and how as she passed through the streets men women and children blessed her every one seemed delighted in awarding praise to agatha and this made vain the more anxious to know her her name pleased him there was a musical ripple about it that caught his fancy in his mind insensibly the two faces and the two stories became associated when he thought of agatha the doctor's daughter he thought also of the christian martyr who lived in the hearts of the people and who died rather than deny god the two faces ever in his mind were often one the chance to speak to her came at last when on his road to the vicarage he saw her trying vainly to lock the old church door after he had spoken to her after he had seen the liquid depths of her lustrous eyes the exquisite loveliness of the fair young face the sweetness of the lips whose smile was sunlight he made up his mind he should stay and woo her there would be a certain piquancy about wooing a saint how it would end he did not know did not care it was the fancy of the moment he never once said to himself how will it end end of chapter 3
the smile brightened and beautified it until in his turn his eyes were dazed if one frank bright smile so transfigured her what would love do she looked half hesitatingly at him if you really wish to hear the organ i will go back and play something for you i should like it he replied better than anything in the world but i do not like troubling you it will be a pleasure to me she replied i have been in another world all the afternoon the old hebrew world with samson and delilah manoah and micah this present world of gold and green seemed unreal to me yet it is the self same whereon grand old samson lost his sight for a woman's sake yes she murmured but delilah is dead there are plenty of delilahs living he said and she looked at him with grave reproach on her most beautiful face i do not think so she replied i do not believe that more than one ever existed he laughed aloud then stopped abruptly when he saw the pain on her face i honor such beautiful faith he said but she did not quite understand even that delilahs were not in her line and it was natural to her to believe in everything they left the glowing sunlight and the scented lime blossoms and went back into the cool deep shadows of the old church if you want to hear the organ to perfection said agatha it will be much better for you to remain down here in the church and i will play to you he answered cheerfully but a strange pang of disappointment shot through his heart she did not care then for a tete-a-tete with him it was the music and nothing more whereas he cared really nothing for the music and only wanted to be with her he remained below in the dim beautiful old church his eyes riveted on the grand eastern window listening to the light footsteps wandering a little touched a little finding the circumstances and surroundings quite different to any he had ever known before and there through the cool shadows floated to him sounds almost divine the pleading cry of delilah hear me but hear me hear the voice of love it was so perfectly rendered he could almost hear the voice and the voice seemed full of tears what a grand old story it was and this girl who expressed delilah's love and woe so perfectly did not believe the type of woman existed in those days knowing what he had planned in his heart that plaintive cry touched him it should have been spare me not here something better and holier woke in his heart than had ever taken root there yet should he spare her who had spared no one yet should he go out from the church and never look at the exquisite face a girl a child almost who had faith in all women and perhaps in all men it was like tearing the brilliant wings of a butterfly or putting out the bright eyes of a little singing bird there was a sense of cruelty about it the world was so full of others why should he seek this one guarded by her own innocence was it possible that standing under the light of the eastern window listening to harmony such as he had seldom heard before was it possible that in his heart there arose a half wish that he was a better man then the harmony changed and he knew the words that went to the beautifully pathetic ear while i have eyes he wants no light the music seems to roll in waves through the dim aisles ah there was indeed a word he had not reached a word in which this girl lived while i have eyes he wants no light he repeated the words over and over again and then the music stopped the old hebrew word faded away the light footsteps were descending she was pale and he saw that the little hands holding the great iron key trembled allow me to lock the door for you he said that was your difficulty last week a very happy difficulty i remember i heard you say that you should be here on thursday and as i longed to hear the beautiful old organ i thought i would come then she looked up at him with innocent surprise in her most beautiful eyes did you come on purpose she asked the simplicity of the words amused him so greatly that he laughed i did indeed and i would go 10000 times as far for the same pleasure he said you are going across the fields 
May I go with you? She was too much surprised to say yes or no. But when she opened the white gate that led from the churchyard to the fields, he went with her. No sense of impropriety came to her. The ways of life at Whitecroft were tolerably free and easy. She did not know what either propriety or etiquette required, for such a case had never happened in her experience before. A handsome, lordly young stranger offering to walk through the fields with her. He had gained the first step. He thought to himself, permission to be with her. But he was at a loss what to say. To anyone else, he would have paid extravagant compliments, made violent love. This girl's modest, graceful calm awed him. While with her and near her, he felt as though he were in a shrine, the sanctity of which he dared not desecrate. Still, he must talk to her. Why is this place called Whitecroft? he asked. She was quite at home with him then. Look round and see if you can guess, she replied. He looked round but saw no reason. She laughed again. Your eyes are not educated for the country, she said. Do you not see all the white blossoms? The hawthorn, the may, the cherry trees, pear trees. The whole village is a mass of lovely white bloom and that is why it is called Whitecroft. My road is down this lane. I will say good afternoon. And with a graceful bend of her fair head, she disappeared. End of chapter 4「Three weeks had passed since Agatha Brooke had played the grand music of Samson, thinking it the greatest treat she could offer. May had passed, and the beautiful month of June, with its glory of flowers and foliage, was here. Then came a lovely sunny day when Sir Vane stopped to ask himself if he had made much progress. For in spite of three weeks' wooing, such as he had never undertaken before, it was still quite uncertain whether he should win or lose her. He had owned to himself frankly more than once that if he had known none but such women as Agatha Brooke, he should have been a different man. Not even in the presence of the best born and noblest ladies in the land had he felt more respect, more reverence than he did for this young girl who was as unconscious of all peril as the wild rose that grew on the hedges. He had wooed her in the most chivalrous fashion. At first, all his meetings with her seemed quite accidental, but it was wonderful how frequent they were. He seemed always to have calls to make at Westbury and took any amount of exercise in the green lanes and fields around Whitecroft. Then he was always so differential, so full of homage and reverence, every meeting seemed so accidental that she had not the faintest suspicion. Every day life grew more sweet, the sunlight more golden. Every day the faint dream grew deeper. Every day she rose with new hope, new lightness, new beauty and the vague happiness that filled her heart made her so beautiful that the village people looked at her in wonder. She would have recoiled with something like fear had anyone said to her abruptly that she was beginning to love. To her innocent mind, love was a far-off mystery. She never connected it with the dreamy delight that was changing and colouring the whole world for her. Then what Sir Vane considered a piece of good fortune happened to him. He sprained a finger and one fine morning he came riding into Westbury and drew his reins at the doctor's door. He sent in his card with a message that he should be glad if the doctor would see him at once. As he had an engagement and very soon they stood face to face, the handsome aristocrat who knew no law but his own will and pleasure, and the village doctor, kind, generous, absent-minded and unsuspicious. The sprain was painful and the doctor wanting something as usual called for his daughter. 
she came in looking to his mind more than ever like the saint on the eastern window for she wore a pale blue dress and her golden hair hung loosely on her neck when she saw him there in her father's surgery talking quite at his ease a sudden sense of bewilderment seized her in a few brief words the doctor asked for what he wanted but sir wayne interrupted him i have never had the pleasure of a formal introduction to miss brook he said but i was fortunate enough to be of some little assistance over locking the church door and then while the doctor attended to the finger sir wayne told him of the little adventure and how he had afterward enjoyed the music of the beautiful oratorio his conscience almost smote him when he looked into the dreamy absent face of the girl's father for the doctor saw so little in it and thought so little of it he paid but vague attention it was as easy as deceiving the blind during the whole of the summer weeks that tragedy lasted he never once thought of his daughter at the same time with the young stranger he called daily for a fortnight over the injured finger he was clever enough to get to know when the doctor would be from home he always waited for his return so it came to pass that many hours of the beautiful summer days were spent by them in the shady flowery cottage the doctor had no suspicions agatha was a child to him that she had grown fair and slender as a young palm tree did not occur to him to whom she would always be a child fortune at times seemed to favor the designs of evil it certainly favored survey any other girl would have foreseen the danger to herself she lived on as unconscious of what was coming into her life as a dreaming child she did not notice how every day when he left her he said something which plainly indicated when he should come again and she quite as unconsciously was always there a great love is pitiful it is so often wasted so often lavished in vain this girl's whole soul had gone from her never to be her own again gradually her life became one long dream of him she remembered every word he uttered she could bring to her mind every expression of his face wherever he stood became a place at once sacred to her if he touched a book a picture or ornament it became a priceless treasure to her when he threw away a withered flower she treasured it it was love without stint without measure without limit or bounds and yet she knew nothing of what it was they had met each other one bright june morning in the beautiful old avenue of chestnuts that led to croft woods accidentally on her path intentionally on his a beautiful morning such as one often finds in england in the glory of summer pride some of the flowers of the chestnut had fallen and the leaves lay at their feet how bright the sunshine is today she said it must be a fancy of mine but it seems quite a different color his dark handsome eyes devoured the fair calm beauty of the angelic face perhaps the difference comes from within he said i have known times when the brightest sun held no light for me that comes from trouble she said gently yes or weariness or ennui that you see the light brighter proves do you know what it proves no i do not she replied will you tell me it proves that new brightness has come into your life he said she looked at him with such serious eyes i do not think so she said calmly my life is just the same as it has always been his heart sank as he listened had all his persistent wooing been wasted all his devotion been lavished in vain would this girl with the pure soul and angel face see him pass out of her life forever and make no sign he had lavished as he considered his best love making on her and he had not stirred the sweet sleeping soul shall you be content to live here all your life doing what you are doing now he asked suddenly the startled look in her eyes showed him that she had not thought of the future i do not know she said i am very happy i could not be happier would you not like to see something of the great world he asked out beyond the green hills that surround whitecroft there lies a grand world full of art science beauty and pleasure this place is like the happy valley of rasselas have you no wish to go beyond it i have never thought of it she said 
it must seem strange to you but my life has always been filled i have so many to help so much to do that i have had no time to think of such things i hardly realized that there was a world beyond the green hills there which i have never seen do tell me he said bending forward eagerly are you mortal human have you ever known what it is to to feel your own heart beat one throb more quickly to feel your pulse thrill to feel even your own face grow warmer are you really a mortal or are you as i sometimes half believe the agatha from the stained glass window come down to earth with nothing but soul and spirit which is it she laughed out merrily indeed i am not saint agatha she has iron bars across her face you know and you have iron bars across your soul he interrupted for the first time he saw that her beautiful face was crimson and her eyes fell the first time there was a breaking of the long sleep a stir of the tremulous rosy dawn you are very much like that figure miss brook he said and she laughed again the merriest happiest laugh he had ever heard i am very glad she said i would sooner be like that than a figure in a fashion book i should hardly have thought that you had ever seen one he said i could not think of you at the same time with fashion and finery you always come into my mind with the beautiful picturesque surroundings of the church or these lanes i do not believe you know what fashion is miss brook i am not quite sure that i do she said slowly there is a beautiful word you ought to know he continued that has nothing so frivolous as fashion the word of art and science and beauty you are too much i know you will forgive me miss brook too much like an angel nay that i cannot be sure of too much like a marble statue as fair as pure as lifeless how can you say so she cried why i am full of life i could say to you what the queen guinevere said of her husband you want warmth and coloring that i do not she cried almost indignantly and taking his words quite literally i am never cold and i have color enough for she paused for want of a simile for a wild rose he suggested yes or any other rose she said earnestly you do not understand he said you want warmth of manner i think not she said i am often ashamed of myself for the way in which the children caress and love me ashamed are you he said ah me i wish i were a child do you survey and why the simple wonder of her question was beautiful to the man of the world he whispered his answer and in that whisper the dreaming soul awoke never to sleep or dream again end of chapter 5chapter 6 of the earl's atonement by bertha m clay this librivox recording is in the public domain read by vinay mala chapter 6 conjectures and suspicions my dear said lady croft to her husband pray do not laugh at me and think that i am always fancying evils but i am not quite easy over surveying lord croft laughed what is wrong emily he asked i do not know i cannot guess she replied frankly i have nothing but suspicion and that i ought to be ashamed of but i cannot believe he is going on all right he spends so much time out of doors and i am told he seldom goes out without a bouquet of flowers flowers in his hands mean mischief i am sure they are very innocent messengers said his lordship who was always amused with his wife's scruples and fears lady croft continued anxiously have you heard anything about him are there any rumors in the neighborhood or what is more to the point are there any pretty girls you know he will get into mischief i think you misjudge him this time at least said lord croft there are no nice girls visiting in our neighborhood at least none that we know of they never thought of the doctor's daughter the girl whom every one called the angel of the poor both had heard of her both had seen her 
but in both their minds she was set apart from the rest of the world by the beautiful charity of her life he is staying so much longer than he intended continued lady croft you know i like him i think he is one of the handsomest and most courteous of men but i do not quite trust him lady brandon told me some strange stories about him i hope they are not true stories about people never are true said his lordship calmly do not trouble about it emily i should know if anything was wrong i should like to know where those flowers go said her ladyship plaintively afterward she knew another conversation took place that same day the rector dr ruwan had gone to his garden where every day he reviewed his standard roses and carnations his wife lady ann followed him frances she said i am not quite happy in my mind this morning she was a good-hearted generous kindly woman with broad views and sympathies busy rather fussy and effusive but genuine to the very core of her heart dr ruwan was so well accustomed to her little eccentricities that nothing she said ever surprised or ruffled him frances she repeated in a louder tone of voice do you hear what i say i beg pardon my dear said the rector this is the rose that i took such pains to engraft and i am afraid it is dying what is the matter your mind did you say yes replied her ladyship i said my mind i am not quite easy or happy in my mind and i want to speak to you about it i went into whitecroft yesterday and passing the end of the great cathedral avenue i saw what do you think i saw frances only heaven knows my love said the rector piously and patiently a sight she continued that made me very anxious agatha brook looking fair and angelic as she always does in earnest conversation with sir wayne carleon and who my dear is sir wayne carleon asked the rector for his wife had paused as though anxious not quite to overwhelm him oh frances cried lady ann when will you give more attention to such matters you must remember having met sir wayne two or three times lately at croft abbey what cried the rector that handsome young fellow with the dark eyes of course i remember him i was much struck with him that reminds me that he has called here three times and we have been from home we must ask the whole abbey party to dinner but why was he with agatha brook that is what i want to find out said lady croft agatha to my mind is the sweetest and the most beautiful girl i ever knew and the best she is as simple and innocent as the daisies that grow in the field she has no mother and her father good man as he is never comes out of the clouds i feel that i am in some way responsible for the beautiful motherless girl frances i am quite sure from the way in which he looked at her that he was making love to her making love to her repeated the rector my dear ann it is impossible my dear frances it is true she replied now what does it mean he cannot think of marrying her and he is only seeking a little flirtation a little amusement it must not be allowed her life must not be shadowed by a light love like that agatha brook is different from most girls there is more of the angel than anything else about her do you think i had better speak to her i should do it very cautiously and there may be nothing at all in it and you may suggest ideas that would otherwise never have occurred to her i will be careful enough said her ladyship but i shall certainly do it what a sad thing it is when a girl loses her mother another little event happened that same day sir wayne could not tear himself away he walked home as far as the cottage gate where he stood so long and looked so lovingly at the exquisite drooping face that john mayberry the doctor's faithful old servant grew impatient what was this handsome man looking as she thought like a young prince talking to her young mistress about surely this was the same man who had called so often and john's eyes were suddenly opened what have we all been thinking about he said to herself great heavens what is master doing for john who in early life had been disappointed by a faithless butcher believed that all men were like ravenous wolves and that one should come near this household treasure was not to be thought of the mischief is done 
thought Joan to herself with a deep groan as she watched Agatha enter the house, the lovely face blushing with the sweet shame of her love, the eyes down dropped, the red lips parted in a tender dreamy smile. That is just how I looked when John left me, she said to herself. She does not know where she is going. That is quite sure. She who has never had another thought except for the church and the poor. I must tell her she has no mother of her own. Yet when an hour afterward, she went into the pretty sitting room under the pretense of talking about the gathering of fruit, she was quite at a loss how to begin. The girl before her, with her fair, pure face and sweet, happy eyes, looked so unconscious of anything like flirtation, the old servant was at a loss. It was like warning an angel against earth. What is it, John? asked Agatha, finding that the old servant stood still with an expression of great uncertainty on her face. What is it? I want to ask you, honey, who was it talking to you at the gate? This morning, do you mean? asked Agatha. Yes, this morning. And he stood there so long he might have been a gate post himself, replied Joan. But she was relieved even before the answer came. The face into which she gazed so anxiously never changed. There was neither flush nor smile as Agatha answered. That gentleman is one of my father's patients. He is Sir Wayne Carleon, the only nobleman on our books, John. A nobleman? Is he, honey? Ah, take care. Men are bad enough, but noblemen? And the upraised hands spoke eloquently of Joan's opinion of noblemen. Bad? How do you mean, John? asked the young mistress who knew the episode of the faithless butcher. Deceitful, I mean, Miss Agatha, and what I should like to know is this, if a butcher can be so deceitful, what might a nobleman be? But John, do you think a man's crimes or sins or follies rise with his position in life? asked Agatha. You may be sure they do, honey, replied John, not quite sure of her position and looking very wise to make up for it. According to that, she said, a king would be the most wicked of men and a beggar the most holy. There is something in that, dear, said Joan. But you take care. Miss Agatha, do not believe a word he says and ask him what he means and do not let him speak to you. After which contradictory directions, Joan looked very triumphant but decidedly vague. What must I take care of, Joan? asked Agatha gently. Why must I never believe survey? John replied with a mournful gesture. I always look upon men as wolves, Miss Agatha, seeking the lambs. Ah, you may laugh, honey, but it is true. You are a lamb and a precious one too. Take care how they seek you. No one seeks me, John, she replied laughing merrily at the idea. She did not know that she loved this young man with all her heart and that he had been seeking her all these weeks past. End of chapter 6、Chapter、Warning Voices Agatha Brooke stood by the open window in the pretty sitting room reading a note. It puzzled her greatly. Lady Anne Rouen wanted to speak to her and would be glad to see her that day if she could. Agatha decided upon going at once. The vicarage was not far distant from the doctor's pretty home. In a short time, she found herself with Lady Anne, who received her with her usual kindness and fuss. My dear, she said, I sent for you because I want to speak to you on a very important little matter. Will you come into the garden with me? I do not wish anyone to know what I am saying, and one can never be quite sure in four walls, for walls have ears. Wondering from what this great desire of secrecy arose, Agatha followed Lady Anne and walked with her down a broad path that was shaded by fruit trees and bordered with sweet old fashioned flowers. You have no mother, my dear, began her ladyship. Therefore, I have sent for you to talk to you myself. Now tell me quite frankly, who was that gentleman talking to you in the lane the other morning, and what was he talking about? He is Sir Wayne Carleon, one of my father's patients, and we were talking about the word in general, she replied. 
an expression of great relief came over lady anne's face that is it she said i could not imagine how you came to know him so well but agatha was too truthful to let an evasion pass she told lady anne all about the church door and the music and the rector's wife who knew something of the word declared to herself that he had purposely injured his finger there could not be the least doubt of it he was most certainly seeking the girl although she was entirely unconscious of it lady anne felt that she must interfere she must speak out yet like joan she was awed by the girl's pure sweet face and childlike innocence my dear she said slowly it is a sad pity that your mother is not living just now why just now more than at any other time asked agatha because you need her more but i will say for her what i believe she would have said you must be careful you should not talk to gentlemen above all to one who is a perfect stranger he has been very kind to me said agatha and he has taught me a great deal that i did not know lady anne looked up quickly there was nothing but bright fair innocence in that exquisite face a handsome young man is not the best teacher you can have agatha what has he taught you a great deal lady anne i knew so little you knew enough my dear to make your life of use to others and to get to heaven i know more of heaven now she answered with unconscious warmth an earthly heaven i fear said the elder lady but the girl by her side did not even know what an earthly heaven was she saw that agatha had not the faintest suspicion of what she meant she went on gravely it is always unpleasant to open the eyes of an innocent girl to the evil ways of the world but i must warn you agatha this young man is evidently one of a class you have never met with lax notions in all probability of right and wrong and caring only about pleasing himself let me tell you how such young men do enjoy themselves they come to a quiet out of the way spot like this and finding no other mischief ready to hand they amuse themselves by flirting with the nicest girl they can find and then leave her to break her heart they think no more of such things than a mower does of cutting the grass the girl may be warned but she never listens to the warning she may be cautioned but she always thinks herself wiser than others she gives away her heart and her love they amuse the young man very much for a few weeks then he goes away and forgets her name i have known many instances of it forgets even her name the beautiful face has grown pale and there is a shadow of fear in her violet eyes yet she speaks out bravely what she thinks oh lady anne she cries i do not think men are so cruel i have known many but i have never heard of such a case lady anne turned to look at her the innocence of 18 pitted against the experience of 40 my dear she said which of us two has lived the longest which knows the most you have never left whitecroft i have been through the london seasons i have seen ah well i will not tell you what i have seen but what i tell you is true a man like sir vain rich eagerly sought after amuses himself often and often by pretending to love and a few months afterward has forgotten even the name of the girl who it may be never looks up again after his departure dear agatha i have seen such wrecked blighted lives be careful believe me for your own sake for heaven's sake be careful i will indeed said agatha if you will tell me what about if he talks nonsense to you do not believe him said lady anne he does not talk nonsense replied agatha if you heard him you would enjoy all he says it is so fresh and eloquent that i do not doubt said her ladyship dryly but you must not believe it does he flatter you tell you you are beautiful no she replied then remembering how fervently he had wished to be a child she stopped blushing crimson does he ever talk about love continued lady anne feeling that she could not go any further no was the brief reply i am glad to hear it there is only one honorable love in the world and it ends always in marriage 
such a man as this sarvain would never have that love for you agatha such men marry women from their own world from their own sphere of life lady n cried the girl why do you say these things to me i do not deserve them i have no thought of marriage i shall never leave my father you you pain and grieve me i did not intend to do so said lady n all you have to do is to pass him with a bow and if he should speak to you in the streets lanes or fields tell him that lady and ruwan does not approve of it will you do that yes she replied and lady and could say no more her warning after all had been a poor one she had taken but one view of a wide subject agatha was not to believe not to trust but she spoke no word to the girl of the passionate love which carries all before it when she had finished had kissed agatha and dismissed her lady and felt very much as though she had taken the veil from the eyes of her child after all she said to herself i am not quite sure whether i have not done more harm than good the child knows nothing and cares less about love i may have put ideas into her mind which were not there before agatha walked home in a state of bewilderment for old john and lady ann had said very nearly the same things and the spirit of what they had said was the same for one whole day agatha did not see sarvain the next her father told her during breakfast that one of her favorite children was ill and asking to see her little john brine who lived on the other side of whitecroft it was a beautiful morning he would drive her there if she liked or she could cross the bridge and walk through croft woods some impulse made her choose the woods she loved the green shade the golden gleams of light the soft grass the hundreds of wild flowers the songs of the happy birds she loved them all she would not think whether she would see something even more beautiful than wood and river in her eyes he was there in the green lane the key of the whole position in whatever direction she went he could see her and he followed her to croft wood the moment his eyes met hers he knew that something had happened she had always met him with the frank innocent smile of a child it was a woman's blush that burned her face now and made her eyes droop he saw the change and he understood it how glad i am to see you he said yesterday seemed a century long you did not leave home did you no she replied i was busy all day long but i am glad that i have met you i have something to say to you and the words were so unlike her that sir wayne stood rooted to the spot with wonder you have something to say to me miss brooke that is a very happy novelty will you tell me what it is yes i am sorry to to tell it but lady and ruwan desired nay i may say she commanded me to do so he had a presentiment of what was coming for he drew nearer to her and listened eagerly lady and said that i was to tell you she did not approve of my talking or walking with you what has lady ann to do with it he cried she looks after every one in whitecroft she said simply and she talked to me because i have no mother he knew then what had passed as well as though he had been present old women's gossip he thought as he ground his teeth but all the old women in the world shall not take her from me the strange thing is she continued that john talked to me about it john is my old nurse what had she to say he cried almost savagely in spite of herself agatha smiled she says that men are wolves what a horrible idea is it not they both seemed to imply worse than they said i am quite sure that lady ann would like talking to you and you yourself what do you say miss brook i hardly know a great blush came over the sweet face and a light of triumph came into his eyes let us even if it be for the last time go through the woods together i too have something to say to you end of chapter 7chapter 8 of the earl's atonement by bertha m clay this librivox recording is in the public domain read by vinay mala chapter 8 the confession 
there was a beautiful little nook in the wood which might have been made for the fairies. A cluster of fine beech trees grew close together. Grand old trees, whose branches swept the ground, whose leaves rippled in the wind, in whose boughs the birds had built their nests. The space between them was carpeted by thick soft grass, in which king cups and wild celandines grew. All kinds of wild flowers clustered round the roots of the trees, scarlet creepers twisted themselves through the grass, a piece from fairyland. And here, Sir Vane found a place for Agatha, throwing himself at her feet. I have something to say to you, Agatha, he said. Do you hear what the happy birds are singing to each other? Three little words, over and over again. They never tire of them. Do you know what that purple-winged butterfly is saying there to the wild roses? Do you know what the flowers say to the wind that woos the sun, that warms the dew, that freshens them? Do you know, Agatha, three little words? Can you guess them? Not quite, she answered shyly. And because her eyes could not meet his, and because the new life that thrilled in her heart made her tremble, she gathered the golden blossoms of the serendine. In the after years, she never looked at them or touched them without a stir of bitter pain. She sat quite silent with the golden blossoms in her hand. A great calm came over her. It was like standing at the threshold of another world. The sweetest words in the world, he continued. Just these, I love you. And what the birds say to each other, I say to you, my darling, I love you. He had often longed to break the calm of that exquisite face and to see the fire of love in the eyes that held the light of heaven. I love you, he repeated, taking her hand in his. Do you know what that means? The calm was broken now. Rich crimson blushes covered the fair face, her lips quivered. Her eyes grew dim with happy tears. Yes, I know, she replied. I love you, Agatha. I loved you the first moment I saw you standing in the old grey church. Do you remember it, darling? The sunlight was on your brow and lay athwart the little white hands that could not lock the door. I stood and watched you. A lark was singing over your head and your shadow fell on the grass. My heart went out to you in that moment, and it has never come back to me. It never will. It lies there now. What shall you do with it, this heart of mine? You loved me, she whispered, and you had never spoken to me. I loved you even before that, Agatha. I saw you first of all in the church. You were kneeling under the eastern window, and you were so silent, so motionless, that at first I half fancied the figure with the palm branch in her hand had come down to kneel and pray. I loved you then. It was a new revelation to me, a new life. Seeing you there changed all the world for me. It is for love of you that I have been lingering here. It is for love of you that I mean to stay here until you promise to go away with me. He did not understand the sudden light that broke over her face and died in a smile on her lips. She was saying to herself that Lady Anne and Joan had both been mistaken, had both misjudged him. The fact was they had warned her wisely enough against the love that lightly rides away. But neither of them had spoken to her of the love that would carry her away with it. They had warned her against the man who would win her love and forget it. They had not warned her against the man who wanted her love in return and would not go without it. They were both wrong and a sense of unutterable gladness filled the pure young heart. You are so silent, Agatha, he pleaded. Say one word to me. I tell you I love you. I lay my heart at your feet. Will you try to love me? She twisted her fingers nervously from his and gathered the golden celandines once more. He took them from her and gathered her hands in a passionate clasp. You must listen, sweet, to me. And you must not look at the pretty celandines. I am jealous of them. I brought you here to tell you how dearly I love you, to ask you if you love me. What answer will you give me, sweet? 
in all these weeks when i have been like a shadow to you have you not learned to care for me no answer came from the girl's sweet lips but the drooping face was enough for him he knew that he had won his victory you have never loved anyone in your life have you sweet he asked no never that is except my father and all the poor in whitecroft he smiled but you have never had a lover agatha oh no she cried in genuine distress i have not thought of such a thing do you know agatha that before a woman learns to love her heart sleeps sleeps in a delicious calm knows little pleasure little pain little rapture little despair it dreams but when love comes it wakes wakes to a new life full of sharpest pain full of sweetness that is yet half bitter of bitterness wholly sweet and the dawn of love is like the beautiful rosy flush that breaks in trembling on the still gray of the morning skies has your soul awoke yet it was sleeping when i saw you first sleeping in deepest calm has it awoke lift up your face my darling and let me see but the beautiful face drooped even lower she dared not raise it lest he should read her secret in her eyes i must see for myself he continued i cannot say more until i know whether you are willing to listen he raised her face in his hands and looked into her eyes alas it was the face of a child no more all the passion the tenderness of woman's love was there showing itself in crimson blushes in the drooping eyes the trembling lips ah too surely the calm was broken never to be calm again she tried in vain to hide the flushed face he would read it and she was powerless i see he said slowly your heart is awake agatha it is the rosy dawn now not the grey light you have been a marble statue long enough why your very face is changed it was no longer the pale pure face so like that of agatha with the palm branch blushing sweet half confused a new life shone there and the old life of peace and calm was gone for ever more do you care for me a little he said earnestly he had begun his wooing from fancy or caprice he had grown so earnest over it that it was as though his life depended on the answer a little agatha i must have made some difference to your life tell me i i cannot she said gently i do not know i do not understand let me teach you do you think of me when i am away from you can you recall my words and looks yes she replied your face and voice are never out of my mind when you see anything beautiful when you hear sweet music when you watch the skies and the sunset do your thoughts go to me they never leave you she said do you dream of me at night and wish for me all day the fear had drooped lower but he knew the answer was yes when my hands clasp yours does your heart beat faster for it if i were to kiss your dear face would you tremble with happiness as i do now he gathered her in his strong arms and kissed the sweet lips that had never been kissed save by the women and children who loved her kissed her with passion so wild and vehement she was awed and frightened my darling he said if you knew how i had longed for this hour i never dreamed it was so sweet to wake a woman's sleeping heart and yet when i saw your face i thought how human love would brighten and beautify it will you tell me now do you care for me it seemed to the trembling girl that her very life had gone out to him that her heart and soul had left her to go to him and she could not recover them she was dazed with her great happiness the blue sky the tall trees the green grass the golden celandines all seemed to whirl in one confused mass the song of the birds the hum of the bees the rich deep sound of her lover's voice filled her ears it was as though a dazzling ray of sunlight had fallen at her feet and blinded her if she had been more like other girls if she had had small flirtations and little loves it would not have affected her but 
to the pure sensitive heart and innocent soul over which breath of evil never passed this great human love came with the depth and earnestness lighter natures could never know came like a revelation you will tell me agatha he said i must hear it from your own lips in your own fashion he laid her arms round his neck if you are afraid of the sound of your own voice he said whisper to me you are speaking to your own heart when you speak to mine she did whisper and he thought them the sweetest words he had ever heard i do love you she said i care for you more than for my own life i i love you and then she was silent with unutterable content my darling it is more than i deserve that you should say this to me but they are words i would have died to hear i would have given my whole life for one kiss from you and he loved her so deeply and so earnestly in that one moment that he positively half thought he would leave croft abbey and never see her again but the beautiful face charmed him bound him captive and the half formed wish died you have loved your father and the poor every sick or sorrowing soul in the parish seems to have found comfort in you you have loved inanimate things such as the old grey church the organ the eastern window the grand steeple the meadows and those bony woods but until now you have never given your heart to a human love never she said now you must give it holy agatha there is nothing in life so sweet you must give me all your thoughts your love your interest your heart i am to be your word your life everything promise me with happy eyes and smiling lips she promised him you belong to me now he said you must think my thoughts love my loves dislike what i dislike believe what i believe will you agatha of course she would she was only too pleased to promise what could be better if they were only to have one heart one soul one life between them it would be 10000 times better that they should have but one set of ideas i want you my darling he said not to think of the past or the future but to live only in the present and to keep all your heart concentrated on this one fact that i love you and you love me will you yes she answered he drew her to his heart and covered her face with kisses are you happy he asked i am as happy as the angels in heaven she answered and the words smote even that worldly heart with keenest pain end of chapter 8「9 9 of the earl's atonement by bartha m clay this librivox recording is in the public domain read by vinay mala chapter 9 life without honor worthless for the next few days agatha was seen no more in the cottages the children looked in vain for their beautiful gentle friend the women for their benefactress as she had given up her whole heart and soul before now to fair and gracious deeds she now gave it up with the simplest and most earnest worship to love sir wayne came no more to the cottage half hidden by flowers he knew that there was a guardian angel there in the shape of old john as he had grown more interested in his wooing he had grown more careful over it he never met her now where the keen eyes of lady ann could discover him he had assumed a mastery over agatha which was delightful to the girl who loved him with her whole heart her whole days were one long act of obedience to him you will walk through croftwood tomorrow agatha he would say and you will find someone there who would wait a whole day even in the sharpest frost just to see you pass by or the moon will be shining my darling tonight come into the lane that i may see the moonlight in your eyes he managed every day to see her once or twice and his wooing was so sweet that only for his long stay at croft abbey he would have prolonged it he was watching the awakening of the truest purest heart that had ever beat 
the tremulous brushes, the sweet coy smiles, the thousand new and beautiful graces that love had awakened in her. It is not pleasant to write of human cruelty. One does not linger over the details of the torture of a bird or the slaying of a butterfly. She was so young, so spiritual, so innocent, he might spare her. So long as he lived, he would meet no one like her. He had the greatest influence over her. He could persuade her to believe anything that he told her. And he set himself deliberately to work to destroy the whole fabric of her life. Everything in this world had made progress, he told her. But nothing perhaps greater than what was called religious belief. He tried to explain to her how so-called clever men of the present day had found out that there was no need for faith, for self-restraint. He had pointed to the old great church which made his words a living lie and said, All the kind of thing taught there is old-fashioned nonsense. Good enough, you know, for the simple people here, but the word has shot ahead. This is not the age of narrow ideas. One by one, as during some cruel siege a fair castle is destroyed, he beat down the ramparts of faith with specious word, with clever argument. Not that she ever loved heaven less, but that she began to have a confused idea things were not as she had believed them to be, that there were many other views of life than hers. They lingered one evening in the shade of Croftwood, a warm, beautiful summer evening. When the very wind seemed to whisper of love, the flowers all languid and fragrant with the heat of the sun, the birds singing the sweetest good night to each other. Now was the time to ask her the question which should decide his fate and hers. Poets say that when a man's soul is most desperately tempted, legions of good spirits rush to its aid. No soul ever needed help more than hers, for the crisis in her life had come. Agatha, my darling, said Sir Wayne, I have something to tell you. I have had letters this morning about business. She was sitting on a grassy mound and he was half kneeling at her feet. She looked at him with a smile. That word of business was far from her. Her whole soul just then was steeped in poetry and romance. His face was somewhat agitated and pale. I am very much afraid, he said. That I must go to Gaswood, that is my home, you know. There are several business matters that require my presence, and I fear I must go. Go? She repeated slowly. Go? I had never thought of that. He watched the beautiful color fade from her face, leaving her white even to the lips. I had thought of it, he continued. I knew that a life so beautiful... A dream so bright as this dream of ours could not last. Cannot last? She repeated, and he watched with keen cruel eyes how the light faded from her eyes and her white lips seemed to grow mute and stiff. You will come back again? She said in a low voice. Will you not? I do not think so, he replied. You see, darling, I came originally for a few days to Croft Abbey, and I have been here many weeks. I cannot return at least this year. I could not come to stay at Whitecroft. It would be offensive to Lord Croft. But, she faltered, do you mean that I shall not see you for a whole year? I am afraid, my darling, that I cannot promise even as to a year. Perhaps Lord Croft may not ask me down again. Man of the word as he was, and utterly careless, where only the heart of a woman was concerned, he turned away from her for he could not endure to see the anguish in her eyes. The white fixed face with the strained wistful look in the large violet eyes hurt even him with a physical pain. Could you not come? She asked in a low voice, without anyone asking you. You can do as you like always. It would involve more than you think of at present, he replied. But we will not think or speak of parting on this fair summer's eve. It would spoil all its beauty. She looked up at him with eyes full of reproachful wonder. Is it not spoiled now? She asked. Ah me, while I live the sun will never shine for me again. Do you care so much for me? He asked. You know, she replied and her face lay hidden on his breast. I do not know. I want to hear it from yourself, he said. From your own lips. 
Do you care for me so much? More than for my own life, she replied. Would you give up the world and all you love best in it for me? He asked. Yes, she answered. I would. Without counting the cost? He asked. There would be no cost. In following my love, I should follow the highest good, she replied. Then her tender arms were laid round his neck and she said, You make me think of my beautiful namesake, Agatha, in the old church. They asked whether she would have all this word could give her, honour, wealth, pleasure, love, and deny God or whether she would die praising him. What would you have done? He asked her. If you had been tried in the same fashion, she was quite silent for a few minutes. Then she raised her fair young face to the blue skies. I would have died as Agatha did, she replied. Life without honour is not worth living. The words were like a blow in the face to him. Was it worth his while to try to win a girl who held honour dearer than life? He had but one hold on her, one weapon with which he could struggle, and that was her great love for himself. I believe you, he replied reverently. He drew her closer to him. Now tell me, he said, if you had to choose between death and giving me up, Never to see me or hear me speak again. Which would you choose? She clung to him. She clung to him, weeping as surely woman had never wept before. Death, she said. Death a thousand times over, I could die for you. I could never live without you. When he kissed her and bade her good night, he said, Will you come here at the same time tomorrow and then I will tell you what I think about going away. She promised while her eyes were wet with tears. End of chapter 9Sir Vane could not have done a wiser thing for himself than allowed Agatha to leave him with that sword of bitter pain in her heart. What should she do? What was to become of her? She passed a long sleepless night and arose from her couch unrefreshed and pale. The tedious hours dragged slowly on and the end of the bright afternoon brought her to Croftwood again. It required no practised eye to see that the young face is worn with pain, that all the brightness and radiance have left her, that the great purple shadows under her eyes come from the shedding of many tears. It was painful to see the quiverings of her lips as she tried to speak to him in her usual fashion. It was as though a bright and beautiful flower had been smitten with biting frost. He took her hands in his without a word. Poor child. She looked wistfully in his face. Is it the last time, Wayne? She asked simply. That will depend on you, my darling, he replied. He was more gentle, more caressing than ever. His eyes never wearied of drinking in the loveliness of that fair, sad face. He said more loving words to her that night than he had ever done before. This was the crisis. He should either win her or lose her that night. He was not sparing of kisses or words. He made her rest where the golden celandines bloomed and the meadow sweet trembled in the caress of the summer wind. You look so tired, Agatha, he said. What have you been doing? Sitting up again with some of those dreadful children? You must not do such things. He knew well enough why the sweet and beautiful face was so pale. But he wanted to make her say so herself. The assurance would be doubly sweet if it came from her own lips. He was kneeling by her side, drawing the pale face to him and kissing the quivering lips. Your life is too precious, too sweet, my darling, to be wasted on these little rustics. You must take more care. What would it matter when he was gone? Who would care? Who had ever been like him? Cared for her health and comfort? What should she do? It is not that vain, she said. I have not been sitting up with anyone. I have been thinking of you until my heart has almost broken. Of me? He repeated. I ought to be proud and happy. 
Are you really going away? He said, and so soon? Do you want me to stay? He whispered. Yes, with all my heart, she replied. His heart beat with triumph. But Agatha, sweet, if it be impossible, ah, then may heaven take pity on me and let me die, she cried. There is another alternative, he said slowly. I cannot stay with you. You can go with me. Then we shall have no more parting, no more sorrow, no more tears. Come with me, Agatha. She flung herself on his breast in a very rapture of joy. How good you are! How kind you are! I never wish to leave you. When you are away from me, the light of my life is gone. He gathered her to his breast and held her there. He kissed the white eyelids and tremulous mouth until the color came into her face again. Come with me, he said. I, too, I could not live without you. If I had gone away alone, I should have left the best part of my heart and life behind me. We need never part if you will trust me. Trust is a hard thing, but give me yours, and death alone will have part to part us. Ah, Joan and Lady Ruwan were wrong, and she right after all. He was not one to love and run away. They had never warned her against such a wooing as this. They had said he would leave her, but they had never taught her to say no if he asked her to go with him. She was unprepared for this view of the matter, and it seemed to her that the very heavens were opened when he clasped her in his arms and said, Trust me, Agatha, and in this word we need never part again. End of chapter 10「Chapter 11 of the Earl's Atonement by Bertha M. Clay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Vinay Mala. Chapter 11 The Test of Faith Half the evil in the world, said Sir Vane, comes because the people will not and do not trust each other. I trust you, she said. Why should I not? I will not believe one word of what they said warning me that you would love me and leave me. You see for yourself that they are wrong, he said. Yes, they are wrong. You do not want to leave me. You want me to be with you always. He wondered in his heart if they had warned her against that. But after a time he decided that whatever Lady Anne and Joan might have said, they had never contemplated her going away with him. She shivered in the strong grasp that held her. He laid her head on his breast. No music was ever so sweet as his voice while he wooed her onto the broad path which had so fatal an ending. You would be so unhappy, my darling, without me, he said gently. I can picture you in the long years to come, thinking of me, looking at the places where we have met, true to me always and loving no other. No, I shall love no other, she replied. And when? I am sure that I should not live long. All last night I was awake thinking what I should do when you were gone. I could not eat or drink. All food was like dry ashes to me. I should soon die. I did not know love was anything like this. It is deeper than life. It is a storm, a whirlwind and sweeps everything before it. I did not know. We will have no storm, my darling, whispered Sir Vane. We will have profound and beautiful calm. Why should you be miserable when you may be happy with me? Why die when our lives can be passed together? Only trust me and all will be well. I do trust you, she repeated, just as I believe in heaven. Heaven, she thought, could be no dearer to her than this handsome lover whose dark eyes seemed to look through her soul. She believed in him as she had always believed in heaven. We will not part, said Sir Vane. You shall come with me, my darling, and I will show you everything most bright and beautiful under the sun. You shall see the fairest lands, the grandest works. We will go to sunny Italy and fair sunburnt Spain. We can linger where we will and go where we like. There is nothing this world calls famous or lovely that shall not gladden your eyes. She clung to him, weeping from excess of happiness. I want nothing but to be with you, she said. You are so beautiful, Agatha, he continued. 
in all the world i have not seen so fair a face and your beauty shall be adorned with dress and jewels until men's eyes shall be dazzled as they look at you no she cried that would not please me i only want to be with you you have lived in this little village and know no other life than the dreary round of duties you shall live where the sound of music and laughter never stops where the sun shines ever and fairest flowers bloom where the days pass all too quickly and the nights are fair as the days you shall never know a shadow or a care you shall learn to look back with wonder on this present life that you could ever endure it earth shall be like paradise to you if you will but trust me you are too good to me she said i can never thank heaven enough for sending you to me i see now that my life lacked something but you you fill it if i had died without knowing you my life would have been incomplete so would mine have been so it is without you he replied and now agatha you say you trust me yes she replied earnestly i could not trust you more i lay my heart and life in your hands as she spoke she laid her white hands in his and the face she raised to his was full of light and faith full of loving confidence that one sees in the face of a child you give yourself to me he said yes she replied to be mine always and forever never to doubt or leave me to be mine through life unto death these are solemn words agatha they bind you to me for all time think before you utter them i need not think vain she replied i mean them with all my heart place your hand in mine agatha and plight your troth to me simply as he told her she laid her hand in his half kneeling as she did so it was the most solemn moment of her life poor child you promise to love me and me alone always to trust me implicitly in all things to believe that i know best and do what i wish you to do i promise most faithfully she said you will be true to me until death never love me less or desert me for another never she replied how could i my heart is one with yours my soul my life are all one with yours he said and now agatha do you know what you are at this moment no she answered with a smile it makes you my wife dear now as we are kneeling together under the blue heavens as heaven hears us you are my wife darling and we can never be parted again the beautiful face leaning on his breast grew deadly pale ah if mother in heaven or father on earth had but seen her danger then and could have snatched her away to her excited fancy the birds ceased singing to listen and the leaves stood still on the trees if a dart of lightning had been hurled at him from the skies who could wonder some men take lives and are punished by heaven he was deliberately and wilfully slaying a human soul taking from it the life nothing could give it again my wife he said listen agatha how sweet the words are my beloved wife she did listen poor child and she thought to herself that no music on earth was ever so sweet then she raised her head and looked at him but vain he said gently how can that be to be a wife one must be married and wear a wedding ring i have not been married i have no ring you shall have one my darling a wedding ring thick and solid as gold can make it tell me what marriage is she looked puzzled for a few minutes then her brows and eyes cleared like those of a child who suddenly remembers a lesson marriage she repeated it is when two hearts and two souls become one right and were two hearts ever more surely one than ours he asked no i should think not she replied now follow my reason agatha marriage means the union of two hearts in love and faith our hearts are one therefore i say we are married his heart smote him for one moment when she looked at him with the eyes of a child and the smile of an angel how strange she said musingly but when marriage is a ceremony with all kinds of blessings and prayers attached to it i know 
for I have several times been to the weddings in the village. People cannot marry each other. It is the minister who marries them. My darling, that is the first sent ceremony that the word has chosen to surround it with. Believe in this, the far more simple doctrine of love. What need of all those announcements and ceremonies? I love you with all my heart. I have given you my heart. I have pledged my faith. I have plighted my troth to you. You have done the same to me. What marriage can be more true, more solemn than ours? She knew so little now to controvert it or what to say, that she was silent. The idea was quite new to her, and with the glamour of love blinding every sense, it was so easy to deceive her. He went on, I admit that this law could not be general. There are men so weak and women so frail that they require vows, oaths and penalties to keep them right. But to high-minded, honourable people, what need? If I were a woman, I would sooner put my hand in my lover's hand and wander with him, if needs must be, to the other end of the earth, trusting always to his honour, than feeling that he was bound to me by chains that are sometimes of iron. Do you see, my darling? I see, she said faintly. I cannot explain, but it does not seem to be right. According to that, you could marry as you like, it seems to me. It is a belief intended only for those who love truly Agatha, he said loftily. Of course, my darling, if you cannot trust me, I do trust you, he said. But when, let it be after the old fashion, not this new one. Poor child, she did not know that what she called the new fashion was as old as sin itself. You do not know how beautiful the words of the marriage service are. We will kneel down here and say them together, Agatha. It never occurred to her for one moment that he was luring her to her ruin. She never at that time doubted the truth of what he was saying. I should like best, she continued slowly, to be married in a church and to hear all those grand blessings. I should like the ring to be placed on my finger just as I saw it on Anne Gaze not many weeks ago. I will place it there myself, he said. Is it quite the same thing? She asked doubtfully. Quite, he answered. That is, if you have trust and faith in the one who placed it there, you have that faith in me. Tell me, Wayne, she said gently. Why do you like this plan best? Why not go to the church as everyone else does? Pardon me. Everyone else does not. But this is the reason. I will tell it to you. If we went through all the fuss and ceremony that is usual, of course the marriage would be talked about. And that would not do. There are grave reasons why my marriage with you must not be known. Grave and weighty reasons. I will explain them to you later on. It would be my ruin if it were known. That must not be, she said gently. No, I am quite sure you would not allow that, Agatha. We must keep our secret for some time at least. Afterward, it will not matter, and I shall be only too proud to introduce you to the whole world. But for the present, you will be content, will you not, with love and with me? I shall have all the world when I have you, he said. When it is not that I mistrust you, I do not. But it is all so new and so strange to me. I can hardly understand it. It is like a funeral where no one is dead. Let me ask Papa what he thinks. He will know better than either of us. The simplicity of the words amused even while it irritated him. She was still a child in heart. Do as he would. Say what he would. It seemed impossible to shadow the innocence of the pure simple soul. You must trust me in all Agatha, he said. You must not speak of it either to father, friend or anyone else. Our secret must rest with us. You say you trust me. Give me a proof. I will put your faith in me to the test. It will not fail, she replied. Test and try it as you will. I believe you. And that makes me love you so dearly. The surest way that a woman can take to win a man's heart is to show unbounded faith in him. Now for my test. Bend your head a little lower, Agatha, and listen. End of chapter 11
Chapter 12 of The Earl's Atonement by Bertha M. Clay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Vinay Mala. Chapter 12 The Broken Lily. This is the test of your love, Agatha. Will you go away with me tonight without telling to any creature what is to happen? Go away with me to be with me always and never to return? Will you believe what I say? That pledged and plighted as we are, there is no need to go through the different forms and ceremonies affected by people. You shall have the wedding ring. I will put it on your finger and it will bind us together fast as any vows. She trembled violently. In the whole of her short simple life, she had never heard such a question discussed. No one had spoken of marriage. After she had grown up, she had been asked to some of the village weddings and they had seemed to her solemn as church services, all blessing and prayers. Whether there was any variation, any difference, she did not know. She had not thought of it. Her instincts, keen and pure, told her it was wrong. But her feelings and wishes were not in accord with her reason. That is my test, Agatha, he said. Come with me and stay with me for all time. Give me all the rest of your life without reserve. Or let us part now. Trust me all in all or not at all. She trembled violently and clung to his arm. May I just speak to Joan? Ask Joan what she thinks? She pleaded. No, he replied sorrowfully. Unless you believe in me implicitly, give me no half faith. Do you want Joan to confirm what I tell you? Do you appeal from me to her? Oh, no, no, she cried. It is not that. But it would comfort me so greatly to hear someone else speak of it. It is so new and strange to me. Say no more, Agatha. You, you doubt me and I can never forgive the doubt. And Sir Vane turned from her as though he had tears in his eyes. The next instant, the tender arms were round his neck. Has the test failed, my darling? He asked, kissing her face. Has it failed? No, she replied. I will trust all to you. What you tell me is new and strange to me. It is not what I have been taught to believe. But the belief of my life I give up to you. You would not tell me what was not true. I will believe what you tell me on the good faith of your own word. I will and do believe that I am. She paused and a hot blush covered her face. That you are my wife, he cried and he kissed the faltering lips that could not utter the words. And darling, you will go with me. You will not let me go away lonely and wretched. I will go, she said. You promise inviolable secrecy, not one word to your father or Joan or anyone else. If you desire it, I will be quite silent, she replied. You will be as obedient as you are beautiful, he cried. And an obedient wife is a great blessing. I must love, honor and obey, she said. Those are such beautiful words. When they comprise everything. You will have plenty to do, Agatha, darling, if you will go with me. Listen to my directions. Write first a letter to your father. Tell him you are married and that you have gone away with your husband. That you will write to him in a short time and that he need not have the least anxiety over you. You will be rich, happy and beloved all your life. Add anything else you like. But be sure about this. Write every word as I have told you. Do not pack any boxes. We will go straight through to Paris and there you shall buy everything you can possibly want. Poor father, she said sadly. It seems very hard that my happiness should make his misery. Do you think he will miss me? I should say that he will miss you very much indeed. But he will be pleased to know that you are happy. The beautiful eyes with their shadow of listless doubts looked wistfully at him. No, nothing of the kind. He will be all right. Most fathers expect their daughters to marry at some time. Why should not you? You can return to see him in a year or two. What will the children do? What will all my poor people say? She cried. There will be no one to comfort them when I am gone. Would you rather have them than me? He whispered. You, she replied. You know, Wayne, 
Then there is the church and the organ. Everything I have loved in my life. You prefer me to all, he said. Ah, yes, a thousand times yes, she replied. If you feel downhearted about it, Agatha, you must say over and over again to yourself, I am going to my love, who loves me, never to leave him again. You will have courage enough for anything if you will say that. And now I want you to listen to me still further. We will not go away together. We should be so easily traced. I shall leave the abbey at five in the morning and you, my darling, come by the train that leaves Westbury at night. Take a ticket to Hetminster. I will meet you there and we will go to London. Will your courage fail you? No, I think not, she said. But, oh, Wayne, if it could have been different, if I could have gone with you to church like other girls do, I should have been much happier. You will laugh at me, I know. Yet I must say goodbye to the beautiful Agatha on the eastern window. I wonder, it is a foolish wonder, I know. But if she could speak, what would she say to me? But even he, who dared to lead this pure and innocent soul to ruin, had not the courage to put on the lips of this Christian virgin words that were of the devil's creed. He laughed, but there was something constrained and embarrassed in his laugh. He had said to himself, it would be piquant to woo and win a saint. He did not find it so pleasant. There was a sense of shame in his victory. The odds had been so greatly in his favour. He remained with her another hour, caressing and soothing her, making her heart glad with his loving words. Her heart beat with his kisses and thanks. He never tired of calling her his wife, and the name had a magical influence over her. When they parted, every arrangement had been made for the meeting on the morrow. He watched the girlish, graceful figure as Agatha walked slowly down the lane. He had won the victory. She would be his. This beautiful girl, who had hitherto been content with the life of charity, his. And he did not believe that any other could have won her. Yet he was not quite happy. A matter which surprised him. He did not sing to himself as he went through the green fields. Yet what did it matter? She was only a doctor's daughter. He went home through the lanes and passed through the churchyard as he had done once before to shorten the distance. How well he remembered seeing her there, under the ivy-covered porch, with the light on her face that would shine there never more. As he passed through the grounds to the abbey, he saw a tall white lily growing alone, a fair lily whose petals were like snow, and with one blow of his stick, he cut it down. That should not stand up in the face of the blue heavens while she fell. Some voice had spoken and startled him. Whether it was pity, regret, remorse, who shall say? But as he looked round just before he entered the house, something like a curse rose to his lips that he had ever seen the place at all. He tried to say to himself that it would have been a cruel thing to have left one so beautiful to fade away in this unknown village. But he could not blind himself as he had blinded her. Little sleep came to him that night. He left early in the morning, having made his adieus overnight, and the last thing he saw as he left the grounds was the beautiful white lily he had wantonly slain the night before, lying dead on the grass. What sentimental nonsense have I taken up? he said to himself. And what a flower, beaten and dead, can have to do with my beautiful love, Agatha, I cannot imagine. Yet he knew best why the flower reminded him of her. End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of The Earl's Atonement by Bertha M. Clay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Vinay Mala. Chapter 13 A Woman Without a Female Friend Two years have passed since Sir Wayne persuaded Agatha Brooke to leave home with him. Two years had changed her from a beautiful girl into a magnificent woman. She was just twenty now, and a more perfect vision of loveliness had never gladdened man's eyes. She had grown since she left Whitecroft. She was taller and stronger. 
the look of delicacy had given place to most perfect health thought travel much reading and the deep love that filled her heart had given to her face an expression of refinement and intellect her beauty was of the highest type her education was complete she had learned french and italian she had perfected her lovely voice she was better read and had clear ideas than most women of her age she was a delightful companion she could talk well and brilliantly on any topic her words were well chosen and picturesque her mind was well stored with fact and poetry a graceful beautiful accomplished woman and sir wayne repented more than once that he had not made her mistress of silverdale it seemed to him a thousand pities that she must spend her life in concealment her beauty and talents would have adorned any rank he saw it now that it was too late it was too late he had so adroitly kept her to himself that she still retained intact her old faith and belief in him he knew her well enough now to be quite sure that if her faith and trust died her love would be as surely slain he knew that if she once understood how he had misled her she would never look upon his face again he thought of it long and often for he had awakened to the perfect conviction that so long as he lived he should find no other woman like agatha one or two little incidents had happened that would have opened the eyes of a more worldly woman it so happened that they reached florence when one of the court festivals was celebrated and they found all the hotels crowded english french and americans lovers of court spectacles were all gathered and sir wayne still travelling as mr harriot was compelled to put up with two small rooms at the hotel de lorio and at this same hotel as he went down the grand staircase he met an old friend with whom he had been at college captain farmer who with his wife and children was staying there in his genial cheery manner the captain cried out sir wayne how glad i am to see you how long it is since we met then perceiving agatha he took off his hat with a low sweeping bow evidently thinking she was lady carleon are you staying here he asked i am glad my wife and children are here i cannot tell you how delighted i am to see you but there was little response in sir wayne's handsome face his friend went on careless of everything except his pleasure at the meeting i did not know you were married they told me at the carlton that you had disappeared somewhere that no one knew your whereabouts then he stopped abruptly for he saw that sir wayne had no intention whatever of introducing him to the lovely woman at his side sir wayne whispered a few words to her and she went slowly upstairs again then with a pale face he turned to his old friend you are mistaken he said i am not married you will excuse me just now at least i must decline any introduction to mrs farmer may i ask you also not to mention my name i am known here as mr harriot the captain's gay face clouded over you will never learn sense sir wayne i was honestly glad to think you were married to an angel like that girl what a good and beautiful face i wish to heaven i were married he said with a groan i need not ask you farmer to say nothing of this we are leaving tomorrow and it is not worth while to have any scandal his heart was on his lips as he asked the question he had placed her in the very position in which she was liable to slight and insult but he could not have borne to see it a quiver of pain on her sweet face would have maddened him i quite understand said the captain you may rest assured of my silence i will not speak of having met you even to my wife i do not wish to preach but i should like to ask if you have ever thought what the end of this will be it does not seem to me so very long since lady h lost home and friends for you that has nothing to do with the question said sir wayne haughtily i thank you for your promise of secrecy forget you have met me good bye the genial gladness had all faded from the captain's face he looked stern and grave good bye sir wayne he repeated 
sorrowing in his heart for what he felt to be the degradation of his old friend. They parted not to meet again for many long years. Slowly enough, Sir Vane went up the staircase after Agatha. She stood there blushing and smiling. She laid her arms round his neck and hid her blushing face on his breast. Oh, Vane, she said, how did he know that we were married? He took it for granted. I suppose seeing us here together. Will it matter? Will he speak of it? Will it be known now? She asked. Are you quite sure that it will not harm you? He will not speak of it, darling. No, no harm can come to me. But he dared not tell her that he distinctly told his friend he was not married. That same afternoon, she was going up the grand staircase alone and on the first landing, large as a room, a lady stood waiting with a little boy. A beautiful rose-tinted boy with long fair curls. A sudden rush of memory filled her heart when she saw him and thought of the children at Whitecroft who had loved her so dearly. The child looked at her with laughing eyes as she passed, and the little riding whip he held fell to the ground. She stooped to recover it and held it out to him. I thank you, said the boy in such clear, perfect English. She was just a little startled and said, You are English? Yes, he replied, I am English. Just at that moment, a stern voice called, Charlie. Yes, Papa, the boy answered. Come here, I want you. And looking up, Agatha saw the same gentleman who had claimed Sir Wayne as his friend, the only one she thought in her simple heart who had spoken of their marriage. He never looked at her, but came forward and took the lady and the child away. There was something in his manner which told her that he had done it purposely that he would not allow his wife and child to speak to her. Why did he do it, Wayne? She asked afterward when she was describing the scene. Why would he not let the boy speak to me? I cannot tell, said Wayne. Most probably we have lost case in his eyes by taking rooms on the fifth story, but we could not help it. She laughed. How foolish! I should never care where anybody lodged or lived, she said. She did not doubt him. They did and said such wonderful things in this word of his. She never pretended to understand them. At last, she did begin to think it strange that she had not made one lady friend since she left Whitecroft. With the exception of the servants in the different hotels, she had not spoken to a woman. When they were quite among foreigners, Sir Wayne introduced her as Mrs. Harriet and spoke of her as my wife. With English people, they rarely associated, and she knew none by name. When, she said one morning, I am tired of seeing all men's faces. I wish I knew a nice girl. I should like a girlfriend. When I see one nice enough for you to know, I shall be glad too, he said. But Agatha, you are not growing tired of me, are you? She made an answer that delighted him. Such love as hers never grows cold or dies, unfortunately. He saw more clearly every hour that the moment in which she should learn how he had betrayed her would be the last they should spend together, and he loved her each day more and more. He had but one desire now, and it was that they should go farther away from the beaten track, where they would not be exposed to these scenes. Spain, Germany, Switzerland, where should he go? What corner of the land was free from the intrusion of English people with their narrow ideas? It seemed to him like an inspiration when he read that a Swiss lady residing at Lucerne wished to receive an English family for the summer. There, away from Babels and great cities, away from the throng of tourists, there would surely be peace. He wrote at once and his letter was answered by Madame La Bohona Denver, a Swiss lady who gave him every particular about the Chateau Bellaflas and told him frankly that she had lost the greater part of her fortune during the Franco-German War and was compelled to let her house during a greater part of the year. It was quite retired beautiful beyond all words. Yet if he wished for a little change, he could easily reach some of the fairest cities in Switzerland. Sir Wayne was delighted. At last, they would have perfect peace and he should have his beautiful Agatha all to himself. 
Some few years ago, the prospect of a chateau by a Swiss lake with nothing but hills and mountains around would have filled him with dismay. But now he longed for it. Love had transformed him. It will be the most delightful life in the whole world, cried Agatha when he consulted her. And when do you think that my father could come to see us there? He promised that he would think of it. Madame Danvers had written very frankly to him. It was certainly dull, she said. She would not hide that from him. Dull except to those who loved nature or had great resources in themselves. My great resource is you, Agatha, said Sir Vane when he read the letter. We could never be dull when we are together. Madame went on to state the number of her servants and added that her husband's niece, Mademoiselle Valerie Danvers, lived with her but spent the greater part of her time in Paris. Sir Vane never thought of that part of the letter again until he saw Valerie. Then the word changed. They started at once for their new home. Sir Vane was most impatient. But if he had known what was waiting for him on the shores of that blue lake, he would rather have been dead than have gone there. They were delighted with the chateau. It well deserved its name of beautiful flowers, for it was literally smothered with them. Nothing could have been more picturesque or beautiful. Flowers of every hue, of every description, of every kind of loveliness. They climbed the walls. They peeped in at the windows. They covered the doors and iron railings. The gardens were filled with them. The whole place seemed laughing in the sunshine. The fragrance of the flowers greeted them. How happy we shall be here, Vane, cried Agatha. He kissed her beautiful face as he answered. We should be happy anywhere together. And he meant what he said. End of chapter 13《ジャプター14の The Earl's Atonement by Bertha M. Clay。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Read by Vinay Mala。ジャプター14 Sir Vane's Warning。Mr. and Mrs. Harriet, as Madame La Bahona implicitly believed them to be, were very warmly welcomed at the Chateau Bellefloss. Every preparation had been made for them. Two magnificent suites of apartments overlooking the lake were set aside for them. Madame and her niece occupied the other side. They would be as free from intrusion as though living in their own house. Madame had reserved one small part of the garden for herself and her niece. All the rest was at their disposal. Any friend they might care to invite could be well accommodated. Madame La Bona received them herself. She had been a handsome woman, but was now somewhat passy. She was a thorough aristocrat, although she was compelled to let part of her ancient house. Sir Vane was delighted when he saw her. No fear of vulgar curiosity there, he said to himself. She is a gentlewoman. Madame showed them around the grounds, the house, pointed the different servants that were to wait upon them. Ordered dinner, showed them the piano and the organ, of which she was very proud, and then said Or Ravia. As she was leaving them, turning with a graceful bow to Sir Vane, she said, I know, Mr. Harriet, that you seek solitude here. Your letter told me as much. Therefore, I shall never intrude upon you. But if at any time Mrs. Harriet would like a chat or a stroll, I shall be only too pleased. My niece and myself speak good English. Her mother was an Englishwoman. He thanked her and Agatha turned to him with smiling eyes. Oh, Wayne, I am glad. I am so pleased. It seems so long since I have spoken even to a lady. Hush, Agatha, he said. You must be careful not to let Madame hear that. Our circumstances have been peculiar. As a rule, it would be very unwise to say that you have no lady friends. Then I will not say it, she replied. I will be careful and remember. But all the same, I am so heartily glad. I am glad for you, darling. Do be careful. Do not speak of yourself in any way or of me unless you cannot avoid it without being singular. I will be most careful, she said, and she kept her word. They found life at the Chateau Bellefloss a taste of paradise. The scenery around was so magnificent, the lake so clear and blue, the grand mountains in the distance covered with snow, eternally white and calm.
the green lovely shores, the endless variety of scene. It was beautiful to rise in the morning and breakfast while she looked on the blue lake, to watch the pleasure boats and the shadows on the waters. Sir Vane purchased a boat and never tired of rowing Agatha from shore to shore. It was the calmest, sweetest, brightest life that had ever fallen to anyone's lot. Agatha was extremely happy. This fair picturesque home of theirs was most delightful. They drove into Lucerne for the sake of variety. They went once or twice to the ball, more frequently to the theatre. And they never met any of the compatriots whom Sir Wayne so heartily dreaded. I have never been so happy in my whole life, he said one day to Agatha. I should like to live here always. Must we go away? she asked. Not yet at least, and perhaps not for a long time. I must go to England some time, never without taking me, she said. Never, he replied, kissing the beautiful loving face. It was the month of June then. They had not been seven weeks at the chateau and Madame La Bahona had grown much attached to the gentle, beautiful lady. She found her so well-bred, so gifted, so fair in every sense of the word. Nothing pleased Madame more than to take Mrs. Harriet through the beautiful grounds that reached even to the shore of the lake. She discovered at once that Mrs. Harriet did not care to talk about herself or her antecedents and she never made the least attempt to induce her to do so. A sincere liking existed between them, and for her sake, Sir Wayne was pleased to see it. He was answering a business letter one morning, and it occurred to him that he had been away from England more than two years, and that during the whole of that time he had been constant to his love. Never before in his life had he loved longer than two months. He wondered if the time would ever come when he should tire of the angel face and gentle manner of his fair young love. For the thousandth time he regretted that he had not married her. He believed it was within the bounds of possibility that he might have been true to her for life. The same evening, while they were at dinner, Sir Wayne fancied that he heard a carriage driving up to the entrance. Agatha said, That must be Madame's niece. She was to return today. Madame's niece? He repeated absently. He had almost forgotten that mention had been made of such a person. He would never forget again. I am sorry our peace is invaded, Agatha. How quiet and happy we have been. She will not interfere with us, said Agatha. Madame often speaks to me of her. She spends all her time here at the piano. Madame is very fond of her. It was a matter of perfect indifference to Sir Wayne, who finished his dinner and took his cigar out on the terrace. Agatha did not follow him at once, and he sat there thinking. Suddenly, at the other end of the garden, he saw the tall, graceful figure of a girl, with red roses in her dark hair, a figure that was perfect in its subtle grace, perfect in its symmetry. A tight-fitting dress of dark velvet showed every line and every graceful curve to perfection. But the face was turned from him. Madame's niece, said Sir Wayne to himself. And a grand figure too. What shoulders? She has the same inimitable turn of the neck that I admired so much in the Diana of the Louvre. The face will not match the figure. It never does. He found himself watching every movement of the tall slender figure and every movement was so perfect. She stood looking over the orange trees, her white hands clasped and looking like ivory as they lay listlessly against her velvet dress. Then she bent forward, and from the crown of her head to the long sweep of velvet that lay on the grass was one perfect line of beauty. Then she gathered some of the heavy red roses that grew so plentifully and placed them in her dress. She walked up and down the pretty terrace that overlooked the lake, and he said to himself that it was the very poetry of motion, but he did not see her face. Agatha came with the books and papers, and he forgot the girl with the red roses in her dark hair. When Madame's niece is come, said Agatha, and Sir Wayne gave some languid answer, except that she had a perfect figure and moved with perfect grace, he had no interest in Madame's niece. She is so beautiful, continued Agatha, but not at all like English women. They sat out on the terrace until the sun set, 
and then by the moonlight they went to the shores of the lake that looked like a sea of calm quite silver neither of them thought or spoke of madame's niece again a beautiful woman with red roses in her dark hair and in her dress sat talking to madame these visitors of yours do not make much difference in your life aunt he said not much wellry but that it is more cheerful to know they are here do you never go out with them she asked i have been several times on the lake with mrs harriet harriet repeated the girl with a scornful drooping of her full curved lips i know english names very well aunt but this is strange to me harriet it is not noble it is not i do not suppose he is noble wellry but he has plenty of money that is a very good thing sighed the girl oh aunt how i long for money you must marry well said madame that is just where my character is so utterly inconsistent and where i shall fail altogether i love money i want money no one can want it more but i feel sure i shall marry for love hush my dear said madame who did not think that at all a decorous word on the lips of a girl wellry laughed it is a dreadful thing to speculate about aunt is it not but about your lodgers i thought you told me they were so wealthy so they are wellry said madame complacently i believe if mrs harriet could eat gold and drink pearls her husband would get both for her i have seen much of married life but i never saw such devotion it is quite touching does he love her so much asked wellry quickly i never knew how much a man could love a woman until i saw mr harriet there is plenty of money the strangest thing about them is that they will not have servants of their own and do not care to meet english people a long honeymoon i suppose laughed wellry the english are queer people mr and mrs harriet must be a small fortune to you my dear aunt i must not complain replied madame one thing i avow as need drove me to let part of my home i could not have possibly met with nicer people than mr and mrs harriet i am quite anxious to see them said wellry at that night when the pretty chateau of belle flaws lay in the white moonlight no one dreamed of the tragedy dawning under its roof end of chapter 14She had liked Lady Anne very much, but there was a warmth about the Swiss lady that the rector's wife lacked. Wayne was strolling carelessly on his favourite promenade, the terrace that overlooked the lake, when he saw the same graceful figure that had attracted his attention the night before. Madame's niece again, he thought. I hope this place is not to be pervaded by her. Then he saw her face. she was sitting on a quaint old carved seat that stood close to the marble font she had been busy gathering roses for madame's rooms and sat down to rest with the basket of roses in her hands her attitude and pose were of the most perfect grace but studied to the last degree she knew that by half turning her head the graceful lines of her neck were seen to greatest advantage she knew that when her hand lay upon the roses its beauty of color and shape could be perfectly seen she was the true type of the parisian beauties always dressed with the greatest care and elegance polished suave and caressing in manner with a worship for appearances rarely equaled she had pondered for some time how she should meet mr harriet not that she had any idea at that time of seeking to gain his attention the innate instincts of coquetry told her that here was a rich english gentleman who might be to her a very useful friend therefore she would do her best to attract his notice and to please him she was a great believer in making friends and in making them useful to herself she had decided in her own mind that the most beautiful association a man could have with a woman was through flowers 
If he saw her first gathering or tending to them, he would always for the future associate her with them. So accordingly to her own arrangement, he found her with the basket of blooming roses, which seemed to absorb her whole attention. She started as he came in sight, and rising hurriedly, the roses fell in a crimson shower to the ground. Would anything have been better, prettier or more picturesque? She uttered a low musical cry of dismay, and Sir Wayne hurried to her. This is my fault, he said, raising his head. I am sorry, I startled you. I am sorry to have dropped my roses and given you trouble, she replied. They shall soon be back in the basket, he said, if you will entrust it to me. Have I the pleasure, she said, of speaking to Mr. Harriet? He bowed. I have the pleasure of addressing the lady known to us lately by the title of Madame's niece. I am Mademoiselle Denvers, she replied with stately grace. And Sir Wayne bowed again. I hope, she added, that I am not intruding on any part of the grounds that are appropriated to your use, Mr. Harriet. There can be no question of intrusion, he replied. And he felt that to meet this beautiful dark-eyed brilliant girl in the sunlit gardens would be a pleasant rarity, but not too often. And she read his thoughts with wonderful clearness. He is wondering whether I shall bore him, she thought whether I shall come too often and interfere with the honeymoon tetetetes. You are very kind, Monsieur, she said, but I must not avail myself too often of your kindness. It is strange that this terrace is my favourite spot and it is also yours. It is, but I shall not like to think that I have deprived you of the pleasure of frequenting it. She looked up at him with a frank smile that attracted him irresistibly. I must watch my opportunities, she said, and go when Monsieur is absent. He laughed and began to pick up the roses. I shall not know how to arrange them as tastefully as you have done, he said, but I will give them all to you. Nothing could have been more pleasant, she thought with a smile. And the next few minutes passed happily in the fresh sunlit air with the odour of roses all round them. How handsome and how kind he is, thought Valerie. His wife must be happy. She was too adroit to flatter him. She knew that Englishmen looked on flattery with great suspicion. But during that short interview, she gave him to understand with great tact and skill that she admired him. I am always so pleased to see fresh faces at Ballet Flowers, she said. The chateau is very beautiful but far too quiet for my taste. And to mine, its solitude is its greatest charm, said Sir Wayne. She laughed again, that pleasant frank laugh of hers which Sir Wayne liked to hear. That is because you have brought all your world with you, she said. A desert would doubtless seem like paradise under similar circumstances. I have no word. The loss is the words, not yours, he retorted with a bow. I can imagine that you find valley flowers very quiet. Those who are growing tired of life like my aunt and those who are looking eagerly forward to it like myself could never be very happy together, she said. I suppose not, agreed Sir Wayne. His thoughts had wandered to Agatha. She was quick enough to perceive that his interest was failing and she was too clever to remain after that. He rose from her garden chair. Thank you for your help, Mr. Harriet, she said, and good morning. He watched the graceful walk, the easy carriage with the same pleasure as he would have listened to a strain of sweet music. Then he went in search of Agatha. Ah, what rest, what pleasure in her fair presence, what calm and repose. He forgot Valerie talking to her, and nothing could show how deeply he loved Agatha better than this fact that he, who had been so great an admirer of beautiful women, did not think twice during the day of the one who determined that she should always be associated in his mind with roses. End of chapter 15《An Angel and a Coquette》. Valerie Danvers stood before the large mirror in her room, looking with intent eyes at the face reflected there. It was fair enough, surely, to charm any man, oval in shape, 
brilliantly tinted with large bright eyes, dark as night. Surely, if any face could win admiration, hers could. Brilliant, sparkling, piquant. Yet it had not won any of the great prizes of life for her. She was twenty, and though she had legions of admirers, no one had yet been over to Madame La Bahona to ask for the honor of her hand. There was an indefinable something about her that startled most men. She was beautiful, polished, and graceful, but there was a foreshadowing of violent passions in her. One felt instinctively that she could be jealous, envious, and bitter. Evidently, she said to herself, as she looked earnestly in the mirror, "I have not made any great impression on the English people. They have not asked to see me." Valerie had been three days at the chateau, and as yet no invitation had been sent to her. Nor had she seen Sir Vane again. He could not have been much impressed with her. never to remember her existence she had puzzled herself over it but with her usual skill had come to the right conclusion it was not so much because he had not admired her as that he was entirely engrossed with his young wife and a sharp pang of envy shot through her heart why were fates so unequal why was fortune so unkind Why should one girl be idolized by a handsome rich husband and another equally young and beautiful be passed by she went to her mirror to be quite sure if she were as attractive as she had always imagined herself to be the answer was certainly a reassuring one her face pleased herself why should it not please others she had been much struck during these few days by the evidence of wealth and luxury shown by these english people they did not seem even to understand the value of money if monsieur thought that anything would please his wife he ordered it and to valerie accustomed to the economical ordering of things this was wonderful it added another pang of envy to that which she felt already at last came the invitation she had been so long expecting a courteous kindly little note from agatha asking if madame and mademoiselle would join them in spending an hour or two on the lake madame declined but was most delighted to accept for mademoiselle who dressed herself with the greatest artistic skill in colors best suited to her brilliant tints and dark eyes even if the english monsieur had no eyes to admire her with they might meet friends of his Valerie had not realized yet the complete solitude in which they lived. For the first time, these three, who were so strongly to influence each other's lives, were together. The morning was fresh and beautiful. The waters of the lake clear as crystal. The sky without a cloud. The air balmy and odorous with the breath of a hundred flowers. A morning to make even the most miserable happy. Sir Vane looked at the two beautiful women. Agatha's face was bright as with the light of a soul to whom nature was dear and whose thoughts rose from nature to nature's god valerie with the pleasure that comes from gratified vanity and well pleased senses an angel and a coquette thought sir vane as they sat side by side in the boat it was the most delightful morning for a row they agreed and conversation went on easily enough but it was not of the kind they generally indulged in they talked generally of the scenery around them of the waters and the lonely shores and of all the thoughts to which such scenes gave rise valerie had just returned from paris and she had caught the perfect tone of parisian salons she could tell them the latest news of the emperor and empress she could retail in a brilliant fashion all her own all the court scandal and gossip what the emperor had said of the american beauty and how the emperor distinguished certain noble english women by his attentions she knew why this marriage between a russian duke and a french princess had been broken off she knew the whole history of the beautiful young duchess whose romantic suicide had filled all paris with gloom sir vane listened at first indifferently but in a short time he warmed to the subject It was so long since he had heard this kind of conversation. 
all the brilliant bon mots that she repeated all the witty repartees the piquant stories amused him and made him laugh as he had not gone for many long months what a witty wicked brilliant word this was from which he had shut himself out he did not sigh for it long for or desire it but this passing breath of it was sweet to him he began at last to talk himself with some animation while for the first time since they had left england agatha sat by in silence she did not mind it in the least she was so pleased to see him happy the sound of their laughter died away on the blue waters there was a ring in sir wayne's voice how he enjoyed those stories of men and women whose names she had no interest for she fell into her old strain of thoughts and did not even hear the point of the stories until sir wayne said to her agatha where are your thoughts on the water she replied laughing i may say in this boat i am afraid we are monopolizing the conversation it cannot be very amusing to you agatha valery looked up quickly i beg a thousand pardons she said but has not madame been to paris oh yes i was in paris for some months then you must have known and seen some of these people said valery agatha's face flushed she remembered that during the whole of the time they had been there she had not spoken to a lady sir wayne came to the rescue mrs harriet was not well or strong just then he said and we lived very quietly we amused ourselves by seeing the finest sights in paris but we did not go into society ah said valery with a long drawn breath there was not much in the monosyllable but sir wayne felt that he had fallen socially at least in her estimation he was a rich englishman but evidently he had not the entry of the french court he heard it in the sound of her voice and saw it in the expression of her face what would she have thought had she known there was no princess at that imperial court but would have been proud of the attentions of the englishman before her that must have been a trial for you said valery turning to agatha never to have seen paris must be dreadful but to have been there and yet not to have joined in the most brilliant gaieties in the world must have been a trial it was no trial to me replied agatha i could never care for such things not for court balls cried valery with astonishment so genuine that sir wayne and agatha both laughed not even for court balls she replied my tastes and desires do not lie in that line at all mine do said valery frankly and then sir wayne asked if they would like to land and stroll about on the lovely green shore while he fastened the boat the two ladies went on valery said suddenly mrs harriet should you mind my asking you what name it is you give to your husband it struck me as being very peculiar she wondered why that flush rose and fell on the gentle face what name do you mean asked agatha wondering if the surname of carleon had in any way come to light your husband's name the one by which you address him is it fain no it is vain replied agatha and valery said musingly vain harriet a very english name is it not and a nice one it is uncommon replied agatha briefly she did not quite like to discuss her husband's name with this brilliant stranger then sir wayne overtook them it seemed quite natural that he should walk between them he would make agatha talk and show less interest in the parisian stories my wife knows such pretty legends of flowers and trees he said and valery looked up with supreme indifference does she she said they all seem to me very much alike sir wayne laughed just what kings queens courtiers court balls and society stories are to you trees and flowers are to her he said she is easily satisfied said valery and again he detected the faintest accent of contempt in her voice it amused him greatly he understood valery so well her keen worldly nature with its love and appreciation of wealth and luxury was quite transparent to him she was the type of woman he had known well and had despised years ago yet there was something fresh and piquant about her 
valerie as the time passed on that morning became more and more resolved to cultivate these english people and make great friends of them she saw that if she wished to please the husband she must please the wife and she did what was under the circumstances the very wisest thing she could do paid far more attention to agatha than to sir wayne of course he perceived it equally of course he understood the motive end of chapter 16chapter 17 of the earl's atonement by bertha m clay this librivox recording is in the public domain read by vinaymala chapter 17 you never tell me of your life four weeks had passed since valerie denvers returned to bellaflos and already there was some trifling change in the place she had given herself up to the indulgence of two different feelings one was dislike and bitter jealousy of agatha the other great and boundless admiration for her husband how happy such a lot in life would have made me she said to herself why should she have so much and i so little she knew and understood the infinite superiority of agatha and became bitterly jealous of her sir wayne was so devoted and even her aunt she saw loved agatha best side by side with this feeling grew one verse an unbounded admiration and reckless liking for sir wayne he was so handsome so courtly she liked the dark beautiful face and the rich voice the gentle caressing manner sir wayne was always deferential to women of all the men she had met she liked him first and best it angered her that he had fallen to the lot of this fair english woman whose looks differed so entirely from her own why could not fortune have reserved him for her or at least have given her a similar chance agatha who was as unconscious of her jealousy and envy as she was of her growing liking for sir wayne's society liked the brilliant young beauty and when sir wayne was reading his daily papers or otherwise engaged the two young girls passed many happy hours together during these hours valerie told her whole history to agatha described all the friends she had in paris all the gaieties of that beautiful parisian life told her of all her admirers and gave her to understand that it was entirely her own fault she had not made one of these aspirants happy one day she looked at agatha and said you never tell me of your life mrs harriet but it must have been a very pleasant one again the warm flush on the beautiful face and the wild longing that she too could have spoken fully of her life of the old fashioned village the gray old church the eastern window with its fair young saint holding the palm branch of the simple people who had loved her so dearly and who called her the angel of the poor she would have liked in her turn to have spoken of these things so near and dear to her heart but her lips were sealed and dumb my life has been very quiet she said i lived always with my dear father in a quiet country home the only event in it was my love and my marriage very excellent events too mrs harriet laughed valerie for you as well as for mr harriet love is life but your own friends and relations do you never care to speak of them and agatha turned away as she answered they live always in my heart aunt said valery one morning to la bohona i should not be at all surprised if there were something just a little strange about mrs harriet strange in what way valery asked madam she does not belong to the same class as her husband i am quite sure they have belonged to different worlds before they came here i never found this much out said madam dryly i have said her niece i do not pretend to say which was which but i am sure they were not equal it is possible he may have been below her in station or she may have been below him but that there was some disparity i feel sure then some little change appeared sir wayne who had shrugged his shoulders at his wife's invitation to madame's niece said frequently let us ask mademoiselle to go out with us this evening or mademoiselle valery will go with us on the lake if you ask her agatha she amuses me after two years unswerving constancy he felt that he was really entitled to some little reward 
and if this brilliant young beauty could amuse please and flatter him at the same time why should she not so it came to pass that the invitations were more frequent and at last valerie spent so much time with them they were almost like one family sir wayne never dreamed of a flirtation with her it was the last thing that occurred to him but valerie was queen of the whole science and it was impossible always to avoid the plots she laid for him he had a peculiar faculty for finding out when he was alone for meeting him in the garden and grounds when agatha was absent and sir wayne was never very strong at resisting the advances of a beautiful woman he met smiles with smiles repartee with repartee if she gathered a flower for him he once or twice kissed the white hand which held it yet in justice to him it must be said that he behaved in the same manner to her when agatha was present as when she was absent she had lost nothing of her charm for him insensibly they drifted into a half sentimental kind of flirtation which delighted valerie but was the most dangerous and fatal thing which could have happened to her agatha was too simple and unsuspecting to notice it although one or two things did seem to her strange they had arranged one morning to go on the lake but when the appointed hour came agatha had a headache and could not go sir wayne would at once have given up the idea but agatha begged of him not to disappoint valerie and sir wayne turned to her with laughter in his eyes it will be the terrible infringement of the laws of etiquette if i do persuade you to go mademoiselle he said i am quite ready to infringe them she replied indeed i should enjoy it then we will go he said and to him the idea of rowing this brilliant beauty on the lake was by no means displeasing once out on the clear blue waters she turned to him i love the lake she said and i was afraid you were going to disappoint me after all why need you have thought that he asked you seem to have such notions of etiquette and propriety i do think english people are so so what he asked seeing that she paused and laughed so stupid she replied and so narrow in their ideas i can bear that and more from you he replied and then she became her most brilliant self he talked to him and amused him until he was really attracted by her ready wit and brilliancy she took a sudden and pretty caprice for learning to row and her little hands flashed so white and fair with their shining jewels he could not help admiring them and while giving her lessons in the art of rowing what was more natural than that he should hold those pretty hands in his she grew more beautiful and more brilliant as he grew more demonstrative in his admiration i have enjoyed that hour she said i am almost sorry that we must go back will mrs harriet think you too long i hope not he replied suddenly growing serious i should be very sorry if she missed me you spoil your wife mr harriet she will always expect the same amount of attention from you he looked at her in wonder she will always receive it he said quietly and valerie laughed to hide her confusion end of chapter 17chapter 18 of the earl's atonement by bertha m clay this librivox recording is in the public domain read by vinaymala chapter 18 the marked handkerchief there were times when sir wayne looked at his young wife and wondered whether it was possible to excite the feeling of jealousy within her not that he wished to do so it was simply curiosity to know whether one so perfect so seemingly far above all the meaner passions of earth could feel as other people did he would have been pleased to know that agatha was just a little jealous he would have liked those white tender arms laid round his neck a faint gleam of reproach in the violet eyes and a sweet voice to whisper did he really love her best that was the kind of thing that he understood and was accustomed to if agatha had been inclined to jealousy she had plenty of cause the time had been when sir wayne had shrugged his shoulders at the mention of madame's niece and lamented that their solitude was broken but now it was quite a different matter 
he seemed to look with eager longing for her ask velry to go with us were the words constantly on his lips and agatha never once hesitated it was natural she said to herself that he should like someone who could talk to him about his own word of which she knew nothing sir wayne never meant to hurt her when they were all three out together it often happened that velry laughing and jesting walked with him while agatha went on alone then suddenly his heart would be touched and hastening to her he would say darling why are you alone come with me and it struck him with wonder that she always turned to him a face as sweet and bright as a loving face could be it would have been better for them all had she looked just a little more keenly after her own interest for velry day by day disliked her and liked her husband more and more there came a day at the end of the beautiful summer when the lovely air was faint with perfume that they arranged to go to lucerne together sir wayne was ready first and waiting for the ladies in the drive madame could not go she was only too well pleased that her niece should have the opportunities offered to her she seldom if ever accepted an invitation for herself velry walking slowly down the drive saw sir wayne put his hand into the pocket of his coat coat that was either too small or the pocket was too full for a white handkerchief fell out and fluttered to the ground she took it up and her attention was at once attracted by a mark in the corner she looked at it long and curiously there was a crest half worn away and underneath the letters v h c she repeated them over and over again v h c they were not his initials they would have been simply v h still it was strange that they should be identically the same with his with the addition of another letter v h c she tried to make out the crest or mark but could not and a faint idea that she had been right in suspecting a mystery came to her i will see what he says when i give it to him she thought and she arranged it in such a fashion that the letters were the first thing on which his eyes must fall mr harriet she said suddenly holding it out to him is this yours he looked to see what it was and as she anticipated he saw the initials at once she looked straight into his face no passing expression could escape her and she saw distinctly when his eyes fell on the three letters his color changed is it yours she said looking up at him with great innocent eyes i hardly know he replied with some hesitation the initials are right she said laughingly but there is a c added to them which is not yours yet i saw it fall from your hand it has been put with my things by mistake he said but velry saw that all was not quite as it should be sir wayne little dreamed as he talked to her and amused himself with her brilliancy that she was trying to penetrate the dearest and nearest secrets of his heart a few days afterward they were driving over to see some fine ruins and as usual sir wayne suggested to agatha that velry should go with them but she declined she had quite made up her mind that the next time they went out she would look through their rooms and try and find out if there was any repetition of these mysterious initials so while madame took her usual siesta and the servants were all busily engaged she went quietly to the suite of rooms occupied by sir wayne she was a lady by birth and had all the instincts of good breeding her face flushed hotly when she found herself in those rooms all is fair in love and war she said to herself i know that which i am doing is mean false bad but it is the only way in which i can discover the mystery and i am quite justified in adopting it she did not remember that in no possible way could this mystery concern her there was a lingering hope always in her heart that something or other she cared not what would arise that should part husband and wife and that she herself should take agatha's place i am a thousand times better suited to him he likes brilliancy as much as he likes beauty and that fair piece of perfection has none was her constant thought she had hardly admitted even to herself that she should like to see them parted but it was exasperating to see so much love and devotion lavished on one while there was none for her 
Since the arrival of her lodgers at the chateau, Madame had never entered the part of the house reserved for them except once or twice by special invitation. A certain number of servants had been left in charge of it, and Madame knew all was well. Valery said to herself that even if all the servants came in a body, it would not matter. She had but to say that Madame had desired her to inspect the rooms. No one could offer any objection to that. There was no prying eyes or curious ladies made to interrupt her. She was struck with the amount of luxury displayed in those dressing rooms. No want of money here, she was quite sure. The first thing that attracted her attention was a magnificent dressing case mounted in silver and here again on the richly chased bottles, on the ivory-backed hair brushes, on almost every article of value belonging to him, she saw the same initials. VHC. She found many of his things marked with a crest and she admired very much a crown sporting an olive branch. No modern crest then, thought Valerie to herself. Then on the toilet table lay a book that seemed to have been well used, Keeble's Christian Year. And here, to her great delight, she found the coat of arms, an eagle sported on either side by lions rampant, a warlike house she thought, and now if I have any wit at all, I shall find out who he is. The initials are VHC, the crest, a crown and olive branch, coat of arms, an eagle, sported by two lions. Motto as written here, truth conquers, winkit veritas. If with all these landmarks I cannot make my way, I am dull of wit and deserve to lose the game. Sir Wayne's drawers and boxes containing private papers were locked. The locks were patent, and he carried the keys with him, or Valerie would have soon found out who he was and all about him. I will send to London for Debrett's peerage, she said to herself. And then, if these initials and arms are his, I shall know all about him. She went into Agatha's dressing room. There was a magnificent dressing case, far more costly than Sir Wayne's. There were articles of luxury such as she had seldom seen, all presents given to Agatha by Sir Wayne, the most exquisite and beautiful toilet appointments. But on no one single thing were there either marks or initials. Just as I thought, she said to herself with a triumphant smile, no name, no crest, no coat of arms here. Ah, Mrs. Harriet, you may be very fair and you are very sweet, but why do you not share your husband's crest and motto? There is something to find out, and as sure as I live, I shall find it out. She searched through everything. On one worn collar, she found marked in red cotton the two letters, A, B. I will remember them, she said to herself. A, B. It may be Agatha Blythe or Badu. There are many names beginning with B. She was better rewarded for her trouble when among some books she found a copy of the Oratorio of Samson. A name had been carefully erased, so carefully that with all the skill in the word she could not make it out. But she did make out the word Whitecroft. Whitecroft, she mused, that is the very name for a country village. I shall remember it. And long before Sir Vane and Agatha returned, she had collected information enough to help her in making out a far more intricate history than theirs. End of chapter 18
well it is rather unexpected she did not contradict him at first but drew the folds of her dress more closely over the volume i cannot help asking laughed sir wayne to what phase of your character this love for study belongs she saw that he was inclined to laugh at her and ridicule kills love i am not reading a bible mr harriet perhaps all the more unfortunate for me i have a profound respect both for the bible and its readers any little witticism you may feel inclined to make on that score will be entirely lost on me i beg your pardon indeed mademoiselle i had no intention of offending i am not offended she said with a sudden change of manner and laughing in her brightest fashion you will be amused when i tell you this is only a book of old family receipts my aunt is very proud of it it contains 400 receipts for puddings and a countless number for sauces why are you studying it neither pudding nor sauce are at all in your line said survey no not at all she said but madam thinks the cook does not give you variety enough and i am searching for something quite new there is no such thing under the sun laughed survey everything is old and very often the oldest is the best i must not stop to listen to treason old wine old books old friends are all right but what about old maids and old women mr harriet you need not answer me i must go or my aunt will wish to know something about my absence au revoir monsieur i wonder if it is a receipt book he said to himself she looked very guilty and there is certainly nothing wrong in receipts while well recovering the precious volume entirely hastened with it to her room what an escape she sighed as she laid debrett's peerage on the table if he had seen what i was reading he might have suspected me i am sure what an escape i will keep it here for the future she spent the whole of the bright sunny morning in literally poring over the book the only way in which she could be quite sure was beginning at the first leaf and going straight through to the last then if there was any truth in her suspicions with what she knew already she should soon know his secret it was a tiresome task from the table of contents and list of abbreviations to the word finis at the close of the volume she was a picture of earnest intent as she rested her white arms on the table and bent her beautiful head over the puzzling pages her head was soon in a whirl dukes earls marquises but among them all nothing that answered to what she wanted ah yes there was an earl whose name was victor hay carrington the very initials but according to the entry he must be quite 60 again she found the motto winkit veritas belonged to several families the crest of the crown and olive branch she could not find still she was not discouraged she could not wade carefully through a thick volume in a few hours but she could return to it again and again at last she came to the end of this long list of peers she had been through it carefully she had not missed one single entry and she was slightly disappointed she would like to have found out that he was an earl at least then she went to the baronetage i may have better fortune here she said to herself it was night then every one else in the household was asleep she alone was awake vigilant and active the moon shone as it does in that lovely land bright as day she could see perfectly well to read by and a very fair picture she made leaning by the open window the moonlight falling on her face and hair and on the open pages of the book she held she went through the letters a and b without any result her face clouded what if it were all a myth she came to the letter c and her interest deepened if she could find a name that those initials filled she must be right carleon creation 1603 of silver day the name took her fancy she read on sir wayne harriet carleon 16th baronet born 18 succeeded his father sir arthur carleon 18 baron of silver day seat gaswood and silver dale abbey lord of the manor of birkdale silver dale house mayfair arms an eagle sported by lions rampant 
rest a crown and olive branch. Motto of the Carlian family, Vincit Veritas, Ruth conquers. As she read, her eyes flashed. The breath came in hot gasps from her lips. Her hands trembled so that the book almost fell. I have it, she cried. I have found him at last. She was almost petrified with astonishment. She had felt quite sure that he was not what he seemed to be, a rich English commoner of no great account. But she had hardly anticipated such perfect success. There could be not the least doubt of his identity. Now for what reason in the world had Sir Wayne Harriet Carleon laid aside his rank and title? Why did he choose to hide himself in the solitude of a Swiss chateau? Would he possibly have done anything which compelled him to leave his native land? No, that was not the reason. She felt sure. She remembered the saying of the French king that a woman was at the bottom of everything. Then it flashed across her suddenly that he must be in exile for Agatha's sake. For Agatha. Her face suddenly grew pale and a light came into her eyes that was not pleasant to see. She turned to the book again and looked at the date. It was that same year, 18, and there was no entry of his marriage. On the contrary, it said, heir presumptive, Arthur Blackberry cousin. There was no entry of a marriage. Yet Agatha, speaking the other day to her, said it was nearly three years since they were married. How could that be? Had the marriage been a private one? Was she below him or above him in position? Or, if it were possible, such a dreadful thing could be, perhaps they were not married at all? She laughed at the notion. This handsome aristocratic man who worshipped his wife with the fondest love that could be lavished on any creature, it was quite impossible that he could have stooped to such folly with that beautiful angelic Agatha who seemed to belong to heaven rather than earth. As well might she believe that the stars could fall from heaven as that one so pure and perfect could have gone wrong. In her own mind, Valerie had often thought that Agatha was a little too good for this worldly world. Of course, the idea was utter nonsense. Yet it grew upon her. She could not thrust it from her mind. That fact could explain everything if it were true. There was no doubt but that he loved Agatha with his whole heart, loved her well enough to live in exile his whole life long for her sake. That being the case, why had he not married her? There was a flaw in her case. If he loved her well enough to give up rank, title, position and everything for her, why had he not married? Or was it possible that this was a private marriage, one that he would perhaps never acknowledge? She longed to know the truth. She would have given anything she had in the world to have found it out there and then. If they had been privately married and he dared not for some reason or other let his marriage be known, then even the knowledge of the secret might be of value to her. If there has been no marriage and her thoughts inclined that way, how could she tell what might happen? She might in all probability be his wife herself. A thousand plans and schemes rushed through her brains. She would find it out. She would know whether they had been married or not and then shape her plans accordingly. Not one word would she say to Madame. It would be fatal. But she would watch and lay in wait. There were little signs and little words that must betray the truth. She laid the book aside. No one must see that, she said to herself or I shall lay myself open to suspicion at least. Can it be possible that that quiet, fair, fond girl is Lady Carleon? I do not think it. But it lies within the boundaries of fate that I may sometime be Lady Carleon myself. If she is not his wife and I can win his heart, win him to better ways, I shall do so. She can go back to her friends and I shall be happy, for I am sure he is beginning to like me. She was too agitated for sleep. Little did Sir Wayne think that under the same roof there was one who had followed his story, whose keen wits had looked through his disguise, and whose heart was set upon finding out the truth about the girl whom he loved and honoured with all his heart. If he had known it, he would have left Bellefloss that same hour never to return. 
very late thinking how without attracting attention she could ask such questions as would at least disturb their self command i can ask more from her than from him she thought and i will make my questions so journal she shall suspect nothing she tried surveying first as they were all together the day following she turned the conversation to english scenery mr harriet she said do you know loamshire gaswood was in the very heart of loamshire but sir wayne had too much self control loamshire mademoiselle he repeated certainly i know it well it is one of the prettiest and most fertile counties in england is it she said the scene of the last english novel i read in paris was laid there i thought the scenery must be very fine i do not think it is so fine or picturesque as either of the neighboring counties said sir wayne coolly you should extend your travels still farther and go to england mademoiselle the words made her heart beat i hope to do so some day she said but just then she felt a little doubtful if all she suspected was true he was certainly able to keep his own counsel not a muscle of his face moved as he answered her the next attack must be made on agatha whom she was better able to manage end of chapter 19chapter 20 of the earl's atonement by bertha m clay this librivox recording is in the public domain read by venemala chapter 20 i hold her death warrant do you believe that may marriages are unhappy asked welry suddenly she was with agatha in the music room where the grand organ stood and after singing together for some time they stood talking at the open bay window and welry thought it a fine opportunity for asking some of her most searching questions do you believe that may marriages are unhappy i never thought about it said agatha i should think not it is the loveliest month in the year why should anything about it be unhappy i like weddings when there are plenty of flowers said welry they seem very dull to me without what month were you married in mrs harriet taken quite by surprise and without time to reflect she answered in june suddenly there rose before her a vision of that scene in the wood and her face flushed not a common blush that came and went but a scorching flame of fire that seemed to burn even to the roots of her hair and which was noted with supreme satisfaction by welry in june she repeated that is a more beautiful month than may you were married in some grand church by a bishop i suppose i should like to see an english marriage very much she spoke in a low musing tone and was looking at the far off waters of the lake were you married by a bishop mrs harriet no was the brief reply and for the first time it occurred to agatha what would any one say who knew how she had been married would they think it very curious what for instance would this brilliant french girl think she fully believed in her marriage herself but she felt now that it might seem a little curious to others i thought said welry that all rich people were married by bishops no not at all indeed i think very few but i know very little about it no one less i like the form of an english wedding repeated welry of course you had a long train of bridesmaids young and beautifully dressed it was a pointed question and welry looked into the young face as she asked it again the deepened flush no replied agatha i had no bridesmaids do not talk about weddings welry i do not think them the most cheerful subject one can discuss they seem very cheerful to me laughed welry where did you go for your honeymoon mrs harriet to paris replied agatha and this she spoke so frankly that welry saw if there had been a marriage the honeymoon was a safe subject what a curious expression it is a honeymoon she said laughing lune de miel a month of honey we say but i like the english expression best tell me about your wedding mrs harriet i am sure it must have been a pretty one and i must own to a great weakness in the matter of weddings i like to hear about them 
who cried why they cried who laughed who made speeches and what they said tell me all about it no one cried at my wedding replied agatha then she bethought herself how many tears must have followed it how her father and john the women and the children must have wept over her and her face grew pale no one cried was there no one sorry to lose you yes many but i saw no tears she might have added that she saw no smiles either but she was growing nervous and confused it was perfectly natural that one girl should talk to another about weddings but she knew so little what to say if she could have given ever so small an account if she could have said i was married in such a place in such a church there would have been a story to tell how would it sound if she told velry that sir wayne had knelt down by her side and had read the marriage service over with her and had then solemnly assured her that she was his wife how would that sound velry of course would not understand it even though it were all true i have nothing to tell my marriage was i suppose like others velry's heart beat high with triumph to herself she said i do not believe there was any marriage at all and if not i will be lady carleon after all the nervous confusion and agitation of agatha convinced her that she was right if she had been married legally with all the proper form and ceremony she would of course be able to tell when and by whom from that moment she gave her life to the finding out of that secret and the winning of sir wayne's affections for herself looking over one of the english daily papers she came across the advertisement of a private inquiry office the very thing for me she said and that same day she wrote to john mcleavich asking for all information concerning sir wayne harriet carleon of gaswood whether he was married whether he was supposed to be paying his addresses to anyone where he was and if his name was mixed up with scandal of any kind she arranged the terms herself enclosing one half of the sum she considered sufficient and promising to send the other half when she had his reply then came a week of anxious suspense the answer came saying that in 3 weeks he would be able to send every particular they were 3 weeks of great anxiety to her she made the most of them by assiduously seeking surveil by doing her best to amuse him to draw him into a sentimental flirtation and she did not fail the answer came at last and she vowed to herself that it was worth double the money she had spent upon it sir wayne carleon of gaswood was immensely rich 28 years of age exceedingly handsome was not married nor had there been any rumors of his engagement he had had many affairs dinor and did not bear the highest reputation more than one ruined life lay at his door he was now on the continent somewhere it was believed in switzerland but the whereabouts was not certain and he was not alone a young and beautiful girl had left england with him of whom nothing was known velry's face flushed and her heart beat with triumph as she read this letter i hold her death warrant in my hands she said to herself with a smile but i must take my time after a few days she wrote again asking john mcleavich to find out a place called whitecroft where sir wayne had been visiting and to do his best to discover whether he had been privately married there or whether he had eloped with any one from that place there was to be no question of expense he said to herself she would fling her whole fortune on the die if she succeeded she should be lady carleon if she failed it mattered little what became of her the answer was longer this time in coming but when it did come she was repaid for the waiting mr mcleavich finding the inquiry to be an important one and likely to be lucrative also had gone down to whitecroft himself and made all his discoveries with his own hand it would be useless to narrate all his disguises how he went to the rectory as a footman how he beguiled old john as a fortune teller and after condoling with her over the faithless butcher won her to talk of miss agatha who had disappeared so wonderfully he found his way into croft abbey disguised as a groom and from the other grooms there learned plenty of survey he did still more he searched the marriage registers of all the churches in the neighborhood he found out the exact date on which agatha had disappeared from whitecroft 
and he discovered the exact date on which they went to paris and he knew that on english ground at least there had been no time for a marriage he went on to say how agatha brook was loved and worshipped how her memory was shrined among the poor as the memory of a saint how they associated her with the figure on the stained glass window and how she had been known among them as the angel of the poor there was no house he entered where she had not taken hope comfort and relief there was no man or woman who spoke of her with dry eyes not a very likely person he added to have run away with sirvain nevertheless the proofs that she had done so were incontestable he added that among the villagers there was a certainty that she was married that they had also a sure conviction that she would return to them some day beautiful and good as ever and better able to help them but old john and the doctor wept over her as one that was lost and would never return did mademoiselle wish to know any more it is still an open question whether the most good or the most harm is done by detectives they may at times serve the most useful and honorable of purposes again they may be used in the most disloyal fashion and for the most dishonorable purposes certainly welry denver would never have found out sirvain's secret but for them now at last she held the secret in her own hands she could stab her slay her do as she would with her at one word from her the whole of the fabric would fall at once into ruins at one word madame would rise in righteous wrath and expel them but such words welry was not likely to speak she would wield her power as she liked and always with the same end in view that she should be lady corlian herself knowing the real purity and goodness of agatha's character she felt quite certain that sir wain had deceived her in some way over the marriage she was too keen a reader of character to believe for one instant that agatha had willingly or wilfully gone wrong or that she had been with him all this time without formally believing herself to be his wife she paid her that much respect quite unconsciously what a power it was to hold she looked at the lovely refined lady clad in gorgeous dresses and costly gems by sir wain's desire and thought to herself that by one word she could strip her of all this and bring her down to the very dust by one word she could hurl her from this the height of her social grandeur to the very lowest depths of shame and disgrace yet she was woman enough to feel sorry that another and so peerless a woman should be sacrificed she had a strange and complex nature she would have done anything to achieve her ends she would have trampled the beauty from agatha's face she would have tortured her she would have slain her yet she recognized the value of the woman whom she was about to destroy i have read she said to herself of generals who have made a ladder of the dead bodies of soldiers to scale a fortress i shall have to tread upon one human heart and it must be broken for my sake end of chapter 20chapter 21 of the earl's atonement by bertha m clay this librivox recording is in the public domain read by vinaymala chapter 21 now i can bear my fate one holding a sword in the hand naturally longs to strike there were times when welry had the greatest difficulty in refraining from striking the blow the one thing that restrained her was this she was not yet sure of sirvain many a heart she knew was caught at the rebound what she really hoped for was that when agatha was dethroned no matter in what fashion it happened sir wayne would turn to her would seek comfort and amusement from her even if he did not love her so much at first it would not matter that would come afterward in the meantime she must try more than ever she had done to fix his attention on herself she knew every art in the science of flirtation she knew when to laugh or to look sad when to advance when to retreat when to be coy and when to be demonstrative she understood the whole science hitherto she had been most amusing she had helped them to while away many hours she had been ready to respond to their invitations and had seldom neglected a chance of placing herself in sir wayne's way 
Now she did exactly the opposite. She declined most of the invitations on one pretext or another. She avoided rather than sought Sarvain. When with them, her brilliant spirits seemed to have left her. She was silent, very often sad. When Sir Wayne addressed her, she never looked at him and she did just what she had wished to do. She picked him. More than once, he found her in her favorite seat by the marble fawn and the moment she saw him, she rose hastily and went away instead of welcoming him as she had done before with kindly words and bright eyes. One morning when this happened, he hastened after her. Hearing his footsteps, she quickened hers. If it's to be a race, I shall most surely beat you, mademoiselle, he cried. I must speak to you. He overtook her and held out his hand in kindly greeting to her. I never see you, he said half reproachfully. How is it? I cannot tell, she replied. But the frank pleasure with which she had been wont to greet him was all gone. Her eyes drooped, her face was turned from him. It must be my fancy, continued Sir Wayne, or I should feel quite sure that you avoided me purposely. She made no answer. Mademoiselle, speak to me, I beg of you. Have I done anything to displease you? No, she replied hurriedly. You could never do that. Then I am very fortunate, he said. But how is it we spent such very pleasant hours together and now we never meet? She was silent and turned away her face. Sir Wayne understood that he was in for a sentimental scene and his best plan was to go through with it. He was rather amused that she gave such evident signs of admiration for him. It pleased his vanity, showed him that he had not lost his old power over the fairer sex. A little incense burned before him was very sweet. I have not displeased you and nothing has happened. Then why are you not the same with us, mademoiselle? She raised her eyes suddenly with one swift sharp mesmeric glance into his face then dropped them. How do you say that I am not the same? She cried. I see it for myself. When you see me in the distance, you avoid me. When Mrs. Harriet sends you pretty little notes of invitations, you find excuses always. Now frankly, what have we done? Nothing, she replied briefly. Then why do it? Can you not understand? She said, interrupting him, that there are reasons one can hardly explain, hardly speak of. No, I do not, he said. I can imagine or understand no reason why you should avoid us. With equal certainty, I must add that if you see no cause, I shall not enlighten you. The accent on the you caught his attention. He looked in the dark, beautiful face. Do you not know, she said, that some pleasures are too dearly purchased? I do not know, he replied. I have never counted the cost of a pleasure yet. Nor had she of a caprice. You will have to count it some day, she said. The day is, I hope, far distant, he replied. Let me see what I can find in your words. You evidently mean that you find a pleasure in being with us, but that you have to pay a price for it. Now what is that price? Can you not guess? She asked. I dare not guess, he replied in a low tone of voice. In his heart, he cared nothing for her. He thought her very brilliant and very amusing. He admired her wit and her accomplishments. But he was not the least in love with her. She was the kind of woman who might attract his fancy for a short time. But she would never win his love. Yet he could not resist the opportunity of a sentimental flirtation. He had thought to himself that she was evidently fond of him and it was some time since he had had any little affair of the kind. It was no breach of truth and fidelity to Agatha because he cared nothing for her. At the same time, if a pretty girl did admire him, he could not be so ungallant as to refuse to perceive it. He knew nothing of the strong passion that filled the girl's breast for him. He did not know that she had for him the maddest love one creature could have for another. He might have paused, might have been careful had he done so. How was he to guess that this girl with the beautiful averted face had mastered his secret, knew his whole story, held the death warrant of his beloved Agatha in her hands? All he saw was a beautiful woman who from constant association with him had grown to love him. He must not deal hardly with her, 
for after all it was a great compliment to him and the flattery of it was very dear and very sweet i dare not guess he repeated but you will tell me do not hasten away surely you can give me a few minutes after being cruel to me so long come down this ilex grove i must not i cannot she cried yes you will you have piqued something more than my curiosity mademoiselle velry let me use your name you must come he took her hand in his and led her to the shady grove who would have thought of a love adventure here he said to himself in the solitudes of lake lucerne it reminds him of olden days when bright eyes grew brighter and fair faces fairer for him the old instinct dulled by his great love for agatha woke within him now you shall tell me all about it he said why you avoid me what is the cost of the pleasure of being with us what is the price you pay for it he was in powerful hands now there was no escape for her she was willy he was more willy still he wanted to know that he had not lost his old power over women's hearts and here was an instance he won it from her at last the acknowledgement that she had learned to care for him that being with him so much and finding him so different to other men she had grown to care a little too much for him he spoke with lowered eyelids a dangerous light gleamed there when they were raised she spoke with the repressed passion that suited her dark brilliant beauty he did not care for her in the least but it was sweet incense to his vanity it was amusement to him it was death to her she was determined to know one truth little dreaming that the man before her thought truth quite superfluous where women were concerned and never used it it seems a curious question to ask she said mournfully but as we have been talking confidentially i should like to ask it ask what you will he replied it must always be a pleasure to me to answer any question of yours you will perhaps soon be far away from here he continued sadly and you will look on the time spent here as a dream a few words more or less will matter nothing to you then but they will matter much to me tell me this if if years ago you had met me when when you were quite free should you have loved me what did a falsehood more or less matter in a case like this he was really touched by the quivering lips and faltering voice he knew in his heart he should never have loved her he had flirted with scores of such women and had forgotten even their names but why tell her so can you doubt it he whispered tenderly so beautiful so gifted so loving as you are can you doubt me that whisper drove her mad and that falsehood sealed his fate she looked up at him and the expression of her face haunted him for long afterward is that true she repeated had you been free when you met me you would have have loved me is it true he raised her hand to his lips it is quite true he replied she grew deadly pale her heart beating so quickly she could hardly breathe her senses grew dizzy with her triumph he should soon be free his love should soon be hers one word from her lips and his chains would fall from him she stood pale dazed and humiliated by the completeness of her victory i i shall live on these words she replied and he thought to himself what a tragedy queen she is one question more she said let me whisper it to you bend that handsome head of yours down to me what a proud head it is he bent down until his brown curls touched her face what is it he said tell me one thing more you say that if you had met me before when you were quite free you would have cared for me he made no reply only gave her hand a warmer clasp in sooth he was growing a little tired of the sea love is delightful but flirtation is very monotonous it was time he was back with agatha fair sweet agatha who would have died a hundred deaths rather than have done as valry was doing now tell me she repeated would you supposing in the future you were free and met me should you care for me then of course i should he replied and she was too much agitated herself to notice how carelessly he spoke i thank you she said gently now i can bear my fate whatever it may be 
those few words will comfort me all my life long. She trembled with the consciousness of her victory, but now it was time to leave him. She held out her hands to him. This is goodbye, she said. After what has passed, we can never meet as friends. We must be strangers. But I shall be happier all my life for knowing that you would have loved me if you could. Goodbye. She was gone before he could speak another word. And it was well for her that she did not see the smile on his lips as she disappeared. End of chapter 21
she decided that she would say as little as possible to Sir Vane and as much as possible to Agatha. It so happened that the day after this, some friends of Madame's, the Count and Countess Fleshen, came to spend a day with her, and Madame, thinking to give pleasure to her English lodgers, invited them to dine with them. The Countess herself was a pretty little blonde woman, very vivacious, animated, and fond of gossip. The Count, just the reverse, tall, dark, silent, yet evidently delighting in the social talent of his wife. Agatha looked supremely beautiful that day. She wore a dinner dress of white brocade with a suite of superb pearls. Valerie wore her most bewitching costume of pale amber, with marital nail roses in her dark hair and on her white breast. The Countess admired Agatha the most, but liked Valerie the best. She was more of her word than the refined spiritual girl who looked as though she only wanted wings to make her an angel. The Countess and Valerie understood each other, other by instinct. The Countess and Agatha rather avoided each other by instinct. It was a very pleasant party, and Madame gave them a most reche reche dinner. The dessert was placed out in the garden under the shadow of tall trees with great spreading boughs. Very pretty and picturesque it looked. The dishes filled the ripe luscious fruit, the glasses with their long slender stems, the sparkling wine, the rare flowers and the beautiful women. The countess warmed to her task. There were several very piquant scandals floating about concerning those in high places. She related one or two which were received with marked admiration by Mademoiselle and suppressed amusement by Sir Vane. At length came one less comical and more tragical than the rest. It was of the beautiful young Princess D. It was well known that she had loved with her whole heart a distant cousin of hers, who was in the army. But her parents had wished that she should marry the Grand Duke Rainberg, whom she disliked as much as she loved the other. All Europe was sorry for the beautiful young princess who was compelled to do what she was told and marry the old Grand Duke. That which might have been foreseen happened. In time, the beautiful princess hated her lot and found it unbearable. The Grand Duke became a jealous tyrant. The young lover appeared upon the scene and she ran away with him to the sorrow of all Europe. It would be all right in time, the friends of the princess said. The duke would, of course, obtain a divorce and then she could marry the old love. It was a sorry plight at the best, but she had that one chance of redeeming herself if indeed there was any redemption. But the wily old duke had laughed to himself. Did they think to manage him so cleverly? Not if he lived for fifty years longer would he seek a divorce. As the tree falls, so it must lie. As his wife had chosen to disgrace herself, she should die as she lived. No divorce should be won from him. Then her friends had tried to persuade her to leave the young lover and try to make some kind of compromise with the old duke, which she stoutly refused. Then they avowed an intention of taking her from him by force. The result of it all was that the beautiful young princess poisoned herself and in the very height of her beauty and youth had been buried forever from the sight of men. They listened eagerly. It was a tragedy. But then, as the Count suggested, it would have been more complete had the young lover killed himself as well. There was a languid smile for what was evidently intended as a witticism, and every one present seemed to draw a great moral lesson from the anecdote. Agatha's fair face had grown very pale. She had never heard such a story before. Sir Vane had done her the greatest wrong that could be done, but he had at the same time evinced the greatest respect for her innocence and simplicity. He had never allowed the scandal or gossip of the word to come near her, and he looked round now most uncomfortable. He felt quite sure that it was the first story of the kind she had heard. Her eyes were dark with horror. All her smiles and brightness died. She hardly knew the meaning of the word divorce. In Whitecroft, it was unknown. Husbands and wives loved each other there and were quite content to live together, loving each other in primitive fashion until they died. Such a thing as divorce was not known and yet here they talked of it as if it were an everyday event. The white scared face made Sir Vane feel very uncomfortable. He rose and invited the Count to take a cigar with him. 
the two gentlemen walked toward the lake the countess and madame had mutual confidences to make the two girls agatha and velry wandered to where the marble faun stood with the eternal smile on his young face you look pale and tired mrs harriet said velry glancing at the pale thoughtful face and shadowed eyes i am not tired but velry is that horrible story true do you think which of them asked velry calmly she knew what was coming and she was ready to make the most of her opportunity that terrible story about the young princess who poisoned herself replied agatha yes i should say it is perfectly true i remember something of it when i was in paris why need you look so white and frightened about it it seems so horrible she replied such a foul mass of sin and they talked about it as quite a common event it seems to me a horrible crime to marry without love a perjury what would you think then of those who love and do not marry asked velry love and not marry repeated agatha that could never be no one would be so foolish as to love when they could not marry you do not know much of life mrs harriet said velry with a smile one might think you had always lived in a church i know little enough of that kind of life said agatha i have lived among people who called sin sin but i have never heard such things as these you do not know much then said velry i am glad i do not it seems to me velry that these people call any and everything by the name of love what do you call love said velry a sudden light came into the pale face a beautiful gleam shone in the violet eyes oh velry there is but one kind of love there could not be more i believe in the love that begins on earth and ends in heaven with marriage as an intermediate station laughed velry i have always thought of love and marriage as one she replied and then velry laughed to herself of a certainty this fair spiritual girl had been cruelly and wilfully deceived and she tried to make herself believe that it was her duty to open the eyes so long blinded by the truth end of chapter 22chapter 23 of the earl's atonement by bertha m clay this librivox recording is in the public domain read by vinaymala chapter 23 distilling the poison velry was for some days quite at a loss how to use her power it seemed almost useless to her she had given herself infinite trouble and expense to learn sir wayne's true history and now that she did know it now that she had it by heart it seemed to her of no avail her plan was to separate them and to put herself in agatha's place he would not dare to trifle with her she was mademoiselle denvers belonging to a good old french family she had been to the court balls and more than once at the tuileries the beautiful empress then in the very zenith of her beauty and popularity had spoken to her several times and the emperor had praised her indeed had there been any way of pushing her fortune at court she felt that she should have made a great success there even an english baronet would not dare to trifle with her a country girl a doctor's daughter was a very different person from a descendant of the old line of denvers she was not afraid that he would trifle with her to win her heart was very different from winning the heart of an obscure girl like agatha brooke but she felt that all her skill would be needed if she made the least mistake her plans would all fail the elaborate structure she had raised would all fall to the ground she must use such cautious skill as would ensure her success when agatha was dethroned the difficulty would be to part them she felt quite sure now in her own mind that there had been no proper legal marriage that in some way best known to himself sir wayne had deceived her she saw plainly enough that agatha honestly and in all good faith believed herself to be his wife she must part them without drawing down his anger upon herself or running the risk of losing him afterward there was one great danger which she could foresee and it was this 
if any suspicions came to agatha that she had been wronged she would most probably go to sir wayne with sobs and tears and he loving her as he certainly did would perhaps offer to make her his wife in earnest then valerie's hopes were all in vain he must prevent that and a plan shaped itself in her mind by which she could let agatha know that she had possession of her secret without saying anything to sir wayne it would be easy safe and sure it was worthy of her worthy of the french stage and showed as her inquiries had done a genius for intrigue that was almost unsurpassed she could imitate handwriting and what she proposed to herself to do was this she would write an anonymous letter and address it to herself she would send it to paris to one of her friends who would post it to her address to mademoiselle danvers chateau belleflas lucerne switzerland and this letter should contain the story she would read it to agatha and then let her do as she thought best she was not afraid of letting sir wayne know that she had received such a letter he could not be angry at her showing it to agatha it would seem only natural that she should do so as she could not be supposed to show it to him if she had been mistaken and there had been a real marriage then all she had to do was to denounce the writer of such a letter and profess the utmost contempt for it if there was truth in it she had but to profess sympathy in any case she was quite safe as no one could ever suspect her of writing such a letter no one knew she hated agatha loved sir wayne or interested herself at all in their affairs they would never suspect her she quite approved of her plan i am developing quite a genius she said to herself with a well pleased smile i believe i could write a drama for the stage after all it is quite true that men and women are only puppets and one can pull the strings at one's pleasure she was walking on the terrace as she matured this plan of hers and suddenly over the roses came a sweet voice crying wellry wellry she looked round agatha was walking toward her and at the sight of that fair innocent face something like remorse smote her how could she torture one so gentle so sweet and fair when a man resolves upon torture he is cruel enough but when a woman makes such a resolution she is a thousand times more cruel wellry stood still to watch the beautiful girl coming toward her why should i mind she asked herself why should i hold my hand because she must suffer when a great general wants to conquer a kingdom he does not stop to count the slain to count the mangled bodies the widow's tears the broken hearts he does not stop to speak of the torture the agony the pain he goes on to victory and so must i i must not stop to speak of the tears she will shed of the sobs and sighs that will rend her fair form of the shame that will burn and scorch her fair life i must go on to victory she went to meet agatha with a smile on her lips she who had deadly hate against her in her heart who had planned her ruin went to her folded her arms round her kissed her face and spoke loving words to her you look fresh as the morning itself mrs harriet she said were you calling me yes madam saw that your head was uncovered and felt anxious about it i promised to tell you poor auntie she has always shown more anxiety over my head than my heart laughed wellry you english ladies think more of your hearts than your heads it is hoped so said agatha wellry's eyes were fixed on her in admiration the tall graceful figure in the white dress the fair flower like face the golden hair the light of the violet eyes it is true she said to herself she is more like an angel than a woman she looks fair enough and ethereal enough if she had wings to fly even when she had arms round agatha's waist while she caressed her and talked to her she was wondering what the fair face would be like when she knew the truth how the eyes would lose their light and the lips their smile it will most probably kill her she said to herself and the merciful thing will be for her to die i do not see what is to become of her if she lives when a woman acts the part of judas she does it far more thoroughly than a man the hand that was to deal agatha her death blow touched lightly the golden hair i know ladies 
said Velry, who would give all they have on earth for such hair as this. If they gave everything for it, of what use would it be? asked Agatha. You do not know the value of beauty, said Velry. Wait until you go out into the world, Mrs. Harriet, and then you will see what is the value of hair like yours. Pale, pure gold is thought almost as much of as a crown. At one of the balls I went to at the Tulliers, there was an English woman with just such hair, and the whole court was infatuated with her. She was the rage for many weeks. I would rather hide my hair under a cap than be the rage anywhere, said Agatha. You will not always think so, laughed Velry. You have the glamour of love on you now. But the time must come when that will fade, even ever so little, and you will want to see the word you think so little of. I have my word with me, said Agatha with a sigh of content. Velry's brilliant face paled a little. You mean Mr. Harriet? He is your word? Do you think any man ever went on loving all his life? I should hope so, said Agatha with a happy laugh. I know one who will. It is happy for you to think so, said Velry. I think most men tire of love in a very short time, in one, two or three years, as the case may be. You remember the lines? Man's love is of man's life a thing apart. This woman's whole existence. I do not believe them replied Agatha, and when it is the case, I should think, there is some fault in the object beloved. It is the nature of a man to tire soon of one object, said Velry. I know to the contrary, said Agatha with a happy smile. Velry laughed. She did not want her companion to see the poison underlying her words. I think, she continued, that women are more selfish in their love than men. If a man marries a woman for love, he raises her to his level and gives her his name and position. If a woman marries for love, she wants her husband to give up the whole world for her and never is so happy as when she has taken him from everything useful and noble in the world and keeps him all to herself. But Agatha was too simple and too unconscious to take the words to herself. The sunny light and laughter did not die from her face as it would have done had she understood the sting that Valerie intended to convey. I often wonder, although you will say that I have no right to wonder, how it is that you can allow Mr. Harriet to give all his life to you as he does? Why should I not? asked Agatha with a happy smile. The reason seems to me plain. He is so clever, so gifted. What a statesman he would make. What an eloquent speaker. What a polished orator, and now he is lost to the word. He is happy, said Agatha, and her rival had no reply. People look at things so differently, said Valerie. A retreat for a few weeks or a few months in a quiet place like this is excellent. But if I were in your place, I should urge my husband back into the world, to take up a position and make the best of his life. I should be ambitious for him. Now you, on the contrary, enjoy the quiet of an existence like this. For the first time, the fair face was troubled, and a cloud came over it. Could it be possible, she asked herself, that her love was selfish, that by acceding to his wish to live here in this beautiful solitude, she was doing him an injury, marring the usefulness of his life? Valerie's keen eye noted with delight the shadow, the first she had seen on that sweet face. He pleased himself. It was not she, Agatha, who had asked him to come here. He had told her that he was tired of the brilliant word, tired of noise and gaiety and fashion, that he longed for quiet, for rest and love. And then it occurred to her how much was in his life of which she knew nothing. When he had lived in the great cities, when he had travelled, he never spoke to her of it, but seemed to live entirely in the present. Was she selfish in loving him so well, in making life so happy to him, that he was content to live in this quiet place and never spoke of returning to the world at all? Her troubled eyes sought Valerie's face, but she was too proud, too delicate to discuss such a question with her. If ever she spoke of it at all, it would be with her husband. Valerie saw that she had gone far enough. How foolish I am to ramble on in this fashion, she said. But sometimes when I see Mr. Harriet, I think what a grand statesman or officer he would make. 
he has an air of command such as you see in fine men but then of course he knows best now i will make my aunt happy by going in search of a garden hat but she had troubled for the first time the course of the happy life which had been untroubled until now end of chapter 23 Chapter Twenty Four of the Earl's Atonement by Bertha M. Clay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Vinay Mala. Chapter Twenty Four, The Coquette's Advances. Valerie spent many anxious hours over the composition of that letter. One word too little would make it ineffectual. One word too much would be fatal. she brought all her wit talent skill and ingenuity to bear upon it and when it was finished she said to herself that it was inimitable perfect of its kind she sent it to one of her gay careless friends in paris a lady who gay and careless as she was would have burned her fingers off rather than have posted such a thing Valerie made her believe that it was a corrected bill which she was obliged to show to her aunt. The lady posted it and never thought of it again. Valerie thought to herself that before it came, it would be as well if she could make sure of Sir Wayne's real intentions toward her. Whether, if he were free, he would really marry her, if he did not care for her sufficiently for that, she need not take any further trouble. it was useless for her to set him free for another sir wayne was not averse to the little sentimental scenes they amused him while they lasted and he laughed at the recollection of them as for ever caring about valery she was the very last kind of woman whom he liked or tolerated a tiresome coquette he had flirted with hundreds and valued them at their worth there could be no greater contrast than between his fair sweet agatha and this brilliant girlish creature still she amused him and men have lived who enjoyed even the physical torture of their kind if any one had told sir wayne that this queen of flirts had conceived a violent passion for him he would have laughed the idea to scorn grand passions did not according to his theory belong to that class if ever he thought of valerie's future at all it was with an amused smile she would probably marry some old marquis with a string of titles and an unpronounceable name a great amount of money and large estates he would give her costly dresses and magnificent jewels would find her good carriages and that great consideration an opera box he laughed to think what a belle she would be and how she would flirt with all the gay cavaliers in paris to her heart's content while the marquis rested and slept he had known hundreds of such women they were very beautiful very amusing but as for love ah what had they to do with it had any one told him that valerie believed she could part him from agatha and take agatha's place he would have laughed the idea to scorn he was not tired of her yet and he wondered at himself in all his life he had never been constant to any one for half so long in fact he loved her better than he had done when he persuaded her to run away with him every man has one great love in his life and this was sir wayne's the chances are that if he had been compelled to choose between leaving her forever and marrying her he would have married her at once if they had lived in the world in the ordinary fashion if they had mixed in society had been able to vary their lives even ever so little the chances are that his love would have increased it was a great proof of its strength that it had borne the strain and tension of solitude and valdri thought that she could part a man like this from the woman he loved all was fish that came to his net and when on this lovely day he met valerie out in the beautiful sunlit grounds where he had gone to enjoy a cigar he was by no means averse to a little amusement if she liked to spend her time in telling him how she admired him and in intimating how much she loved him it did not hurt him and it amused her he could have laughed at each little maneuver he knew them by heart years ago 
he never dreamed that she was serious that her own infatuation was so great she had begun to believe in his she met him with a coy sweet smile and by the expression of her face he knew that he was in for a sentimental scene she made a step backward as though she would retire but sarvain held out his hand in greeting good morning mademoiselle he said in his cheery genial tone you have brought the sunshine with you but that was not the mood in which she expected to find him or in which she wanted him dare she venture on one word against agatha to see how he would take it it is rather surprising to see you alone she said mrs harriet is generally on guard she gave him the benefit of one glance from those dark eyes a glance which should have gone to his heart and made strange havoc there but it failed and fell quite harmless i am glad you think mrs harriet cares so much for me he said it is very nice to be guarded as you call it by a beautiful lady still she said pleasantly it would be a treat to see you sometimes alone would it then i must manage it he said and the girl so clever in all other things had not the sense to see that he was laughing at her let us walk as far as the fountain she said how beautiful the lake is this morning the water is quite clear and deep blue i wish mrs harriet would come out she loves the lake when it is in that golden blue light he said hastily oh happy mrs harriet said welry how delightful it must be to be thought about and watched over every minute i envy her sir wayne laughed a hearty genuine laugh in which there was not one shade of sentiment some day someone will envy you he said and someone will watch over you she shook her beautiful head with the most bewitching air of doubt i am not quite sure about it do you know if i had my choice now in life what i should be i cannot guess he replied your secretary he said i would choose that rather than any other lot on earth i should see you every day then and you would be obliged to talk to me are those two such elements of delight he asked thinking to himself how weak and foolish women were all but agatha they form my notion of delight she said i should like to be your secretary i should like to write your letters to discuss all your affairs with you but once life is mapped out no one can choose for him or herself that would be my choice if i could make one she said i ought to be very much flattered he said i would rather that you were touched than flattered she replied and her voice was so earnest and tender so full of music that he was really touched he looked at the beautiful brilliant face with the sensation of wonder that she cared for him of course he was grateful what man is not grateful touched and flattered by the love or homage of a beautiful woman sir wayne was no exception they had reached the beautiful fountain where the marble fawn stood in all its eternal beauty i shall always love this spot she said as she sank languidly on the garden seat placed among the myrtle trees it was here that i first talked to you she said that we had our first real conversation i shall always like this better than any other place about bella flowers you are very good to think so much of me he said and the light in his eyes grew warmer as he looked at her what a beautiful picture she made the myrtle thus formed a background the fountain threw its rippling waters high in the air the marble fawn stood calm and serene in all its grandeur she sat there in an attitude which might have been copied from cleopatra it was so full of grace this beautiful face with a look of consciousness dark eyes that drooped from his and long lashes that swept the dainty cheek she wore a picturesque morning dress with a bunch of fresh fair roses at her belt and a man might have gone far before he could find a lovelier picture what a difference meeting you has made in my life she said how little when i came home did i anticipate anything of the kind i often ask myself whether it has been for good or for evil how can you be so cruel welry he asked the dulcet tones of that low voice influenced him insensibly it is you she interrupted who are cruel and not i why should knowing me bring you any harm he asked she raised those dark eyes of hers with a gleam of fire and looked at him long and steadily 
Do you not know? he said. Can you not guess? It has been the one happiness of my life to meet you and know you. But this pleasure has become too dear to me. What shall I do in the years in which I shall see you no more? They will not come yet, he said. I have no thought of leaving Belleflas. Perhaps not just now, she said. But yours is not a life to spend in this fashion. All your energy, fire, action, dying. You will not care for it much longer. It does not follow of necessity that because I leave Belleflas, I leave you, he said half laughingly. Before he had time to finish his sentence, she had caught one of his hands between her own and had covered it with passionate kisses and tears. How happy you make me, she said. I was afraid that when you once left Belleflas, I should drop out of your life. She had roused him to something like enthusiasm by her honeyed words and caressing manner. She bent her beautiful head down to his until the odor of the flowers she wore reached him and spoke to him. You made me very happy the other day, she said gently. You told me, and the words were sweetest music to me, you told me that if you had met me when you were free, you might have loved me. Did I? said Sir Wayne. He did not even remember the words, but she thought he perhaps questioned their wisdom. I do not expect to have very much happiness in this world, she said gently. But if you would tell me that and assure me that it is true, I would not ask greater happiness. If we had met three years ago, should you have loved me? Her voice seemed to die away in liquid music and he was only human, very weak and severely tried. You need not doubt it, he said. I should certainly have loved you. But he did not add that it would have been with a light love and that he would soon have ridden away. It is wonderful how people can at times blind themselves. But there is no creature on earth so blind as the woman who loves a man who in his turn is indifferent to her. Valerie was quite blind. She judged Sir Vane by herself. She thought he must have grown tired of Agatha, however much he might love her. I shall cherish the memory of those words, she said, and some day I may remind you of them. But in her blindness, she overlooked the fact that if he loved her and had any thoughts of marrying her, he had nothing to do but put Agatha away from him. The little scene ended entirely to her satisfaction and Sir Wayne laughed heartily when he remembered it. End of chapter 24read by vinaymala chapter 25 sir wayne's uneasiness valerie saw her way quite clearly now her passion had completely blinded her she made herself believe that sir wayne cared as much for her as she did for him and that if he were free from what was after all an encumbrance it would not be long before he asked her to be his wife she would not look the inconsistencies of the matter in the face. She considered herself much more beautiful, more brilliant, more gifted in every way than Agatha, more like himself a great deal. Therefore, it seemed quite natural to her that he should prefer her and love her best. She did not even understand the charm of such a character as Agatha's. It was lost upon her. She drew up her superb figure to its full height as she said to herself, I shall make a far better Lady Carleon than that fair-haired dove who has not three ideas outside her church and her Bible. She is not fitted to be the mistress of Gaswood. I am. And from that moment, she thought of nothing else. A bright morning dawned. The sky was blue with the few lovely white clouds floating over it. So fair a day had seldom gladdened the beautiful earth. To Agatha, it was like a smile from heaven. Her heart went back to the beautiful fields and meadows, the lovely hanging woods and clear streams at home. She wondered how all her dear old friends were. The children whom she had cared for and tended would be growing up. And her father, the dear absent-minded father. Her eyes filled with tears as she thought of him. This fair sunlit morning had taken her back to him and her old home. She should see them again. She had no fear of that. When this pleasant dream of theirs was broken, 
and Sir Wayne had to return to the realities of life, he would take her home, she felt sure. And when her father saw how happy she was, he would forgive her her reticence. She wrote to him at intervals and her letters were forwarded to Sir Wayne's bankers. She did not understand how or why this morning she could not take her thoughts from Whitecroft. The lake of Lucerne was beautiful enough, but it lacked the clouds of white blossom that made home so fair. Afterward, she knew that it was a singular coincidence that on that day above all other days, her heart and thoughts should have gone back to the dear old home and the grey church. She dressed herself with unusual care and elegance. She felt that she must be in accordance with the day, bright and fair. She took out, poor child, a morning dress reserved for special occasions, a beautiful white Indian muslin cut after some quaint artistic fashion, showing the graceful curves and lines of the beautiful figure to the greatest advantage. The luxuriant golden hair, lovely enough in itself to have made a plain woman beautiful, was brushed back from the white brow and fastened with the snood of blue ribbon. She gathered from the casement window a deep crimson rose and fastened it in the dress. She looked very embodiment of all that was most lovely, pure and angelical. No wonder that Sir Wayne kissed her as though he could never let her go again. You are brighter than the morning, Agatha, he said, and you are the loveliest girl. How proud I am of my darling. It seems to me that you grow more beautiful every day, and that I should have thought impossible. Proud of me? she said. Ah, Wayne, I do not want you to be proud of me. Only love me, that is all. I want nothing but love. I could not love you more than I do, Agatha, he replied. He drew her to his heart and caressed the golden hair. His voice was full of emotion. She had never been so dear to him before. Just at that moment he wished that he had married her and bound her to him forever. And there came to him a conviction that if she knew how he had deceived her and that if he wanted to atone to her by marriage, she would refuse him. Looking at her in the morning light, so fair with so much of the light of heaven in her face, he realized the purity and spirituality of her nature, and he knew that she would never forgive such a sin as he had committed against her. He comforted himself by saying in the depth of his heart that the world would never know it. He felt that he would rather slay her with his own hand than that she should ever know the truth. She would never forgive him. He had learned during these months to understand and appreciate the beautiful purity and simplicity of her character, which made her seem akin to the angels. Thank heaven she would never know anything about it. He had thought of her future and he had resolved whenever he returned to England, he would take her and find her a pretty house in some remote out-of-the-way place where he could often go to see her and she would never know. As he kissed the white eyelids and red lips, he vowed to himself over and over again that she should never know. Better plunge a knife in the soft white breast than let her know what she had lost and what she was. All these thoughts passed through his mind as he caressed her. How you spoil me, Wayne, she said, arranging with her white fingers the ripples of golden hair. No matter what pains I take with my hair, she added laughingly, you will disarrange it all. You should not have such beautiful hair, he said. This morning in the sunlight it looks, well, I am at a loss for a comparison. I know nothing that it looks like. There is the bell for breakfast. Darling, come in. In some strange way, her thoughts would go home that morning when she entered the salon where the daintily appointed table groaned under the weight of ripe, luscious fruit and homely luxuries. Sir Wayne startled her by an exclamation as he took up one of his letters. I was just going to ask Agatha what we should do with ourselves today. Row to one of the islands and take our books, she answered. That is just what I should have liked to do. But unfortunately, if this letter be true, I must go to Lucerne. There is some mistake about a letter of credit at the bank, and I must attend to it at once. Will you go with me, Agatha? It is possible that the whole course of her life might have been altered had she done so. The great events of most people's lives turn on trifles. I think not, she said. Madame is returning the box of books, and I should like to look through them again. 
I was much interested in that last story of Victor Hugo and I should like to finish it. I meant to take it to the island. Then I will start at once, he said, and return as quickly as possible. I do not like leaving you alone through this bright sunny day. I shall not be alone, Wayne. I shall be with Victor Hugo and Mademoiselle. You can ask her to be with you, said Sir Wayne, if you feel dull. I shall not be dull, said Agatha. I shall go to your favorite place on the terrace, read my book and think of you, Wayne. A strange unwillingness to leave her came over him. A foreboding or presentiment of evil such as he had never known before. I wish you were going with me, Agatha, he said. I shall not leave you again. She raised her face to his with a loving, beautiful smile. You speak as though you were going on a long journey instead of a few miles, she said, and his own sense of uneasiness increased. Yet there could be no reason for it. He was only leaving her for a few hours and in perfect safety. Can I bring you anything from Lucerne, Agatha? asked Sir Wayne. No, she replied. The only thing I care to have from Lucerne will be yourself. Yet he did not like leaving her. He made one excuse after another, until at last she rallied him. I believe you are trifling, Wayne, and do not want to go, she said laughingly. He took her in his arms and kissed her with passionate love. You are right. I do not like leaving you, sweet Agatha. Since I have thought of it, a terrible sense of depression has come over me. What should I do if I left you some day and never found you again? That is not likely, she replied. Where you are, I must be. We could never lose each other. You would never let anyone take you from me, would you, Agatha? How could it be? When I am your wife, Wayne, nothing but death could part us. You would never let anything else, would you, Agatha? Promise me now that nothing in this world shall ever come between us. I promise, she said. Seal it with the kiss, Agatha, he said impetuously. And she did as he said. I shall return by six this evening, he said. You will be on the terrace to meet me? Most assuredly, I will, she replied. Then goodbye, Agatha. I must go or I shall be late. Yet before he had taken many steps, he was back again. Agatha, he cried in that loving, impetuous fashion of his, Are you quite sure that you are quite well? She laughed aloud, though she was touched by his insight. I am perfectly well, Wayne, and perfectly happy, she replied. I wonder, he said, what gives me this strange feeling about you, a restless craving anxiety that nothing can allay. It is nothing but nervous anxiety, Wayne, she said. I often have it, but I never take any notice of it. I positively dread going away, said Sir Wayne. I think I will lose the money and let the matter pass. It is a mistake of my agents, I suppose. Indeed, you need not do that. But there is no need for anxiety and I will not let you give way to it. You are right, he said. It is all nonsense after all. Now put your arms around my neck and tell me that you love me. There is no need, she said. You know that I love you. Yet she kissed him and did as he wished. And then, little dreaming of what lay before them, they parted. She watched him as he walked down the long terrace. He turned to salute her and the sunlight fell full upon his handsome face. As she saw it then, she saw it never more. End of chapter 25「Chapter 26 of the Earl's Atonement » by Bertha M. Clay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Vinay Mala. Chapter 26 With Murder in Her Heart Agatha stood for a few moments watching the tall, fine figure of Sir Wayne, wondering what sudden fits of anxiety and nervousness had overcome him, smiling to herself a tender tremulous happy smile as she thought how dearly and how well he loved her no wife in all the world was so well loved as she she thought what her life would have been if she had missed him if he had never visited the abbey or if she had been away from home she might never have seen him and then i cannot fancy that she said to herself my life without vain I should have been still at Whitecroft, tending my poor friends. She could not realize what her life would have been without Wayne. He was the beginning, the center and the end of it. 
her own life had so grown round his that she could not realize an existence in which he had no part then she went in search of victor hugo's last book the one she wanted to finish she had a great dislike to garden hats but as madame was always anxious when she saw an uncovered head she took a scarf of fine white lace and twisted it round her head and neck she took her book and went to the pretty terrace where sir wayne liked best to sit as she went out of the pretty salon where she had spent such happy hours she little thought that she should never enter it again slowly down the white stone terrace she walked in the golden sunlight she herself the fairest sweetest flower in that beautiful place she did not know that she was going to have her heart broken the shadows of the graceful trees fell on the terrace the red rose leaves came showering down the birds were singing the tame white doves that she fed every morning came fluttering round her as she walked on to her doom if she had known what she was going to hear she would have died there and then she began to sing as she drew near the cluster of rose and myrtle to sing a sweet love song and she opened the book with the echo of the last few notes still on her lips as she sat there the very picture of fair guileless and beautiful womanhood the folds of white lace lying lightly on her golden head the white hands holding the volume over which she was so completely engrossed if the birds could have whispered a warning if the wind could have bade her leave if any of the fair flowers could have spoken and told her that the shadow of death hung over her she would have been in some degree prepared for what was to happen it came upon her unawares she was enjoying her book the sun shining on her head the birds singing around her one white dove had made its resting place on her shoulder there could have been no fairer vision of youth and beauty a picture that was never seen again over the page of the book over the white terrace fell a shadow she looked up and saw valery coming toward her and the shadow over the open page was typical of the shadow over her life agatha smiled as she looked at her the last smile that was to be seen on her lips for long years to come my husband has gone to lucerne she said and i am just finishing this book by victor hugo i am glad that i have found you alone said valery i did not know that mr harriet was out the fact was she had watched every movement of the pair but it added a little zest to the intrigue to tell a few unnecessary untruths about it i did not know that he was out she repeated but i wanted to see you alone the repetition of the word alone struck agatha you wish to see me she said i am quite at your service but valery was in no hurry to begin she felt like a murderess who held the sword with which to stab her victim yet trembled to plunge it in she took a seat by agatha's side go on with your reading she said i will not interrupt you but agatha closed the volume it was the second of le miserable and she never finished the story no she said i can read any time but you wish to speak to me now i am at your service still the coward hand trembled and the coward heart hesitated valery looked at the lovely scene around her how bright the sun how fair the day how lovely the whole land about and her work was murder murder more cruel by far than if she held dagger poison or sword she was not altogether heartless if she could have separated them without pain she would have been better pleased she did not enjoy cruelty but as her way to what she wanted lay over a woman's broken heart why she must break it there was no help for it yet she was sorry and would have avoided it if she could the end she had in view was worth any sacrifice and any trouble to be sir wayne's wife lady carlion of gaswood she said to herself that she must try to keep that in view while she talked to agatha agatha waited two or three minutes in silence she was struck by the expression of valery's face it was pale and anxious quite unlike her usual bright self are you in trouble she asked suddenly her old instinct of wanting to relieve every kind of grief she saw coming over her no at least not in one sense i am not in trouble for myself but i am in great distress over someone else 
I am sorry for that, replied Agatha. I think the troubles of others are harder to bear than our own. This is more than a trouble, said Valery. It is a grief and anxiety all in one, a shock and to me a horror. I am sorry to hear it, said Agatha simply. Is it a trouble about someone near and dear to you? She hesitated for one half minute. It is of someone whom I like very much. Now for the point of the knife in the white breast. Someone for whom I have not only a great affection but also great respect, said Valerie. In fact, I may tell you that my trouble is over you. Agatha raised her face, so full of wonder that Valerie was dismayed. There was no fear. She did not change color. She looked perfectly astonished and mystified. About me? She said, that is hardly possible. You have nothing to do with me. And if you had, there is nothing concerning me which could be either a shock or a horror. I hope not, said Valery with a sigh. You hope not, repeated Agatha. I do not in the least understand you, mademoiselle. I do not understand myself, she said hurriedly. I only know that I have the most hateful task in the whole world to perform. I cannot think, said Agatha, what you mean. You must surely be jesting. Alas, said Valerie, if it were only jesting, I should be happy enough. You who read have perhaps seen the sudden change a thunderstorm brings when from the brightest sunlight the scene changes to the deepest gloom, when a funeral pall spreads over earth and sky and the light suddenly leaves everything. So it was now. All the brightness, the light seemed to pass away. Agatha was distressed. Valerie, whatever she felt, looked miserable. They were coming face to face now, the one who believes herself to be Sarvain's wife and the one who hoped in reality to be so. Agatha was perplexed and began to wish that Sarvain was at home. It was quite new to her to face any trouble without him, without his advice to guide her. What can she possibly mean, thought Agatha. How I wish Vane was here. Valerie had risen from her seat and walked rapidly up and down the white terrace. Then she came to Agatha's side. I must tell you, she said. I hate doing it. I must tell you, because if it be true, you have no right here. You have no right among people of our station. In fact, hard as it may seem, you have no place in the world at all. Hush, said Agatha with gentle dignity that almost subdued Valerie. Hush, you must not speak to me in this fashion. You are making some terrible mistake. For one moment, Valerie thought, could she be mistaken? Would there have been any error in that well-studied report? If so, but no, it was quite impossible. I am afraid, she said, there is no mistake. The details are far too minute for that. Will you mind my asking you one or two questions? You can have no possible right to ask me any questions, she said. But I will answer anything you like to ask. Are you Agatha Brooke? who disappeared some time since from Whitecroft? Yes, I am, was the calm reply. Are you the lawful wife of the person whom you call Mr. Harriet, but who is really Sir Wayne Carleon? Again the calm grave answer. Most decidedly, I am. Thank heaven, said Valerie with conscious hypocrisy. That then at any rate is false. End of chapter 26ॉकॉर्डिंगलोलीफिकल्ट Indignation and anger rapidly took the place of wonder and surprise on Agatha's face. She rose from her seat. A gentle calm dignity seemed to fall like a mantle over her. I do not understand at all, she said. Why you behave in this fashion to me? You have nothing to do with me, nor can you have any concern in my affairs. None in the least, said Valerie, except so far as concerns me. No affairs of mine can concern you, said Agatha. And now, if you please, mademoiselle, we will end the conversation. Not at all, she replied. We have not yet begun it. I have something to say which must be said and you must listen. 
it concerns you more than me but the truth must be sifted you say that you are agatha brook from whitecroft and that you are the lawful wife of sir wayne carleon now i want you to listen to this letter do not think i have brought it to you in an unkind spirit it is not that but having read it i must ask whether the contents be true or not pray take your seat again mrs harriet lady carleon or miss brook i am not sure which name is yours agatha sat down again and velry opened the letter you will believe me she said i am really sorry to read such words as these to you make no more apologies said agatha gravely let me hear what you have to read and velry holding the envelope under her eyes said you see the letter is addressed to me here is my name mademoiselle denvers chateau belleflas lucerne the postmark is paris the handwriting quite unknown to me and there is no signature an anonymous letter said agatha gravely yes but it seems also the letter of a friend at least i cannot help thinking so listen and tell me mrs harriet i will read it to you it begins thus the writer of this letter is a sincere friend of madame la bona and of her niece mademoiselle denvers madame is quite unknown to the writer who had however the happiness to meet and admire mademoiselle in paris the writer is averse to anonymous letters but this case is so peculiar and so painful he knows of no other method to adopt just before the writer tells his story he wishes to swear to the entire truth of every word written here it will bear the most minute investigation it will bear every inquiry it is true as an eternal truth this is the story and the writer writes it out of respect to mademoiselle if ever the truth should become known it would be highly prejudicial to madame and would probably affect mademoiselle's settlement in life most materially at this present time residing under the roof of madame at chateau belleflas are an english lady and gentleman who pass by the name of mr and mrs harriet they assume to be husband and wife but they are not so there has been no marriage and no semblance of marriage between them the gentleman's real name is sir wayne carleon the name of the person residing with him is agatha brook sir wayne carleon is a man of bad character he is very rich and his estate at gaswood is a very fine one he has never been a good man but always a roy and a profligate he has no respect for women a woman's honor or fair name is less than nothing to him he has been famous always for his amours and adventures his intrigues and gallantry his name has figured more than once in the divorce court it is said of him that he never spared a man in his anger or a woman in his love it is said of him that he has ruined more homes and broken more hearts than any man in england Six years ago, he ran away with beautiful, flighty Lady Dundee. She died in Italy some years since, and it was said that he has forgotten even her name. The writer could relate several true stories of the ruin and devastation this same man has brought on homes where only happiness reigned before. The girl with him is one for whom only profound compassion can be felt. She is not his wife, and poor thing, never will be. she is no more mrs harriet or lady carleon than she is the sultana of turkey there was never even a semblance of marriage between them the circumstances under which they came to live together are these sir wayne carleon went on a visit to lord croft at the abbey near white croft and there he saw agatha brook it is not the writer's province to tell how he compassed her ruin it is sufficient that he did so compass it and he persuaded her to leave home with him in justice to her it must be said that previously to this she led not only a good but a most exemplary life she was noted for her charity for her goodness to the poor indeed she was called the angel of the poor when she left home with sir wayne she left a letter saying that she was happy and married but that her marriage for some time was to be kept secret now the real fact of the matter is this that there never was any marriage sir wayne may have deceived her he is clever enough to deceive any one but he certainly never married her certainly never intended to do so 
men of his caliber do not choose a wife from her class she was only a doctor's daughter he could have married a royal princess judge whether it probable that he would marry her a faint gasping sound made velry look round hastily surely her victim was not escaping already a fainting fit at this juncture would spoil all but there was no fainting no sign of it only a white face with white lips and great frightened eyes so full of anguish and woe that it was pitiful to look at them the face a few minutes since so full of life and beauty looked more like a stone mask than a human countenance velry saw her lips move but no sound came from them only a long drawn quavering sigh like the faint wail of the winter wind she will bear it to the end thought velry and then she must die if she will velry resumed the reading of surely the most cruel letter that was ever written sir wayne's vagaries follies sins crimes do not concern me you will say no certainly not but this concerns me that he should dare take his mistress and pass her off as his wife under the roof of a friend whom i respect as i respect madam i for one cannot in silence pass so great an insult by i think that madam ought to know the truth so i tell it to you from what i have heard of agatha brook i should say that in some way or other sir wayne has most cruelly and basely deceived her if so you mademoiselle ought to tell her the truth the longer she remains in ignorance the more terrible will be the knowledge of the truth be when it does come some diseases require a sharp knife in this case of moral disease you must use a sharp remedy if she is innocent and has been betrayed you are bound to tell her the truth either she is servain's wife or she is not if she is then i have been grossly misinformed if she is not she ought to know the truth she ought to know that she has fallen from her high estate of pure womanhood that she can never be classed with the good the pure and innocent again that she is a fallen star that but for the paltry distinction of money and better clothes there is no difference between her and the woman from whom all other women shrink that while she keeps up the appearance of something like sanctity she is in reality a very megadolene as i said before it is just possible that she sinned in ignorance be that as it may she ought to know where her sin has placed her she ought to know that she has lost her good name her fair name her place among the pure and innocent her honor for all time that no tears and no repentance can restore them to her that other women will draw aside as she passes by lest the touch of her dress should be contagion that so long as she lives no woman worthy the name will ever consort with her or call her friend she will be forever a byword and a reproach a shame to all women if she does not know these things you are bound to tell her if she knows them and does not care you have nothing to do but insist upon their leaving the chateau at once if she does not know it tell her if she be wise if she would prove that she has been sinned against not sinning if she desires to show that she hates sin and loves virtue if she wishes to repair as far as she can the evil done she will at once when she knows the truth go she ought never to look upon the face of her betrayer again let her rise and go forth let her leave her sin let her hate her deceiver let her show her determination to have done with such horrible hateful sin by leaving him at once for your own sake for your own reputation you must tell this truth to madame la bohona and if you are ever to establish yourself in the world you must at once give up the acquaintance of one fallen from her pure estate of womanhood i write this in kindness i write it to put you on your guard i write to you as i should wish any gentleman any man of honor to write to a sister of my own were she situated as you are you a noble refined lady belonging to one of the oldest and noblest families in france you of stainless lineage and stainless name have no right to be under the same roof with the mistress of a roi a profligate who plays with the honor and the hearts of women if you wish to be merciful to her the kindest thing that you can do will be to help her away 
help her to some decent way of getting her living and keeping her from a yet deeper fall i do not sign my name but i beg you to believe that i am your best friend oh heaven oh heaven cried the voice so full of anguish that it was not like a human voice oh heaven it is not true a despairing grasp was laid on valeriza the face so full of woe was raised to hers it cannot be true she cried throwing her white arms in the air it cannot be true heaven could not be so cruel it is not true oh thank heaven i am indeed servain's wife those wicked cruel words would have made me forget i am servain's wife who says i am not he married me oh heaven who shall say these horrible things of me such bitter tears such bitter sobs such anguish and woe were in her face and voice that valery was almost afraid to look at her you had better refrain from those tragical airs she said and tell me what you mean by saying that sir vain married you explain it to me end of chapter 27chapter 28 of the earl's atonement by bertha m clay this librivox recording is in the public domain read by vinay mala chapter 28 your life has been a living lie valery was half frightened she had expected that the letter would make a great impression upon agatha she had quite expected that the girl would either weep passionate tears rave about her wrongs or grow sullenly silent and not speak at all but she was not prepared for this deadly despair she could not beat back the hands that clung to her with despairing cries she could not help seeing that the woe and anguish on that beautiful face were beyond any power to recall then agatha remembered another thing she had most faithfully promised sir vain never to mention the marriage yet she must either tell the story or she could not tell what would happen to live as a wife yet not to be one was she knew a crime so great so terrible that she could not endure the thought of having committed it in that case it was against heaven she had offended more than man and during the whole course of her innocent life she had never once to her knowledge wilfully offended heaven the bare idea was horrible to her these thoughts flashed through her mind with the rapidity of lightning with the dark eyes watching her noted the struggle he has told her not to mention it and she is afraid she thought to herself but i will have the truth agatha she said it is no use for me to go through the farce of calling you mrs harriet agatha you had better trust me tell me your story and i will tell you what you are trust me i know the word i understand the law and the legal ceremonies of marriage tell me your story and let me judge for you if there has been any marriage between you and sir vain the writer of this letter ought to be flayed alive the white stricken face that looked already as though years of misery had passed over it was raised appealingly to hers it is true with a great sob i am indeed sir vain's wife he married me then my dear child for you are nothing more than a child if that be the case if you are really his wife if you are really lady carleon why do you pass by another name a false name it is not a false one it is his second name none the less false if it be used for disguise why does he not give you his name and title no answer came from the pale lips men above all men of sir vain's rank do not give their wives a name to disguise them but to make them known again if you are his wife why does he bring you to the solitude of a swiss chateau you are beautiful and graceful why has he not introduced you to his friends taken you to his beautiful home at gaswood why has he shut you up here he knows best sobbed the faint voice i have never questioned him you must have noticed one thing continued valery most husbands share with their wives they use the same initials the same crests the same motto you do not everything belongs to servain is quite distinct from you that is the strongest proof to me i am his wife she repeated 
No one is more pleased to hear it than I am, she said. It would have been a terrible thing to have had all that exposed here. But you see, Agatha, I must look to myself. You may think it all right, but if it is all wrong, then it is complete ruin to me. I must know the truth. Tell me how, when and where you were married. I know you hesitate because you have promised Sir Vane. Do not hesitate. The truth must be known. Now that the question is started. If you do not tell it to me, you will have to tell it to someone else. It is not likely that my aunt after reading this will remain content. You had better trust me. I am young like yourself and can feel for you. Older women will sit in judgment on you. I should sympathize. Tell me and I will help you. Agatha had fallen on her knees on the white stone terrace. The same doves were fluttering around with pretty queen cries. The sunlight fell on the marble fawn and crimson flowers. It fell too on the white miserable face raised in despair to the dark one. I am indeed his wife, she repeated. Do you think, could anyone in this wide world think that I should be here with him were it otherwise? I could not. Oh, Wellry, I have loved and served God all my life. I have always thought of the Christian Virgin Agatha and tried to make my life like hers. She preferred to die rather than to deny God. And I, oh, believe me, I would have died a hundred deaths rather than have offended God. I would indeed. How could you? How could anyone think that I should be with Sir Vane unless he had married me? Something like pity stole into the heart of this cruel woman who was torturing the other. If this girl was really as innocent, as childlike and as simple as she seemed, then had Sir Vane Carleon done the deed that a fiend would scorn? As Valerie watched the tortured face, she despised him. Surely from a world full of women, he might have chosen another and have left this beautiful wild flower alone. I do not know much of the world, said Agatha in a voice that was so piteous, but I know right from wrong and I have not gone wrong. Believe me, believe me, I am his wife. Lady Anne and John, my father's old servant, warned me, both of them. They said I should know the true love from the false. They said if he, Sir Vane, did not love me, he would only amuse himself by talking to me and then when he was tired, he would go away and forget even my name. See how false it was. He would not go away without me. He said that he could not live without me and he asked me to go with him. Then I knew that he loved me. Keener pain and pity filled the heart of the beautiful woman who held the sword in her hand. It had been a cowardly, cruel thing to deceive such a child, most cowardly, most cruel. But Agatha, you should have been married first before you came away with him. So I was. Oh, believe me, I was married. He made me his wife. I should never have dreamed of going away with him if I had not been his wife. I hardly knew that people ever did such a thing. He would not have asked me to go away unless he had first made me his wife. I should have hated, not loved him had that been the case. For a few minutes, Valery looked puzzled. Could the detective have possibly made any such mistake? Had he sent her wrong information? It was hardly credible and yet this persistent repetition of a fact must have some foundation. Then she said slowly, It is true that you were married to Sir Vane before you left home? A light crossed the white despair of Agatha's face. It is quite true, she said. Now will you tell me when and where you were married? Then we shall be able to see our way more clearly, said Valerie. But no rapid frank reply came from Agatha's lips. A quiver of great fear passed over her face. Her heart beat more slowly. The blood seemed to freeze in her veins. Her hands grew cold and stiff. For the first time, a great overwhelming dread came to her. She had most implicitly believed Sir Vane. No doubt of his truth, honour or loyalty had ever assailed her. He had told her that the fashion of marriage had changed, that there was no longer any need for all the ceremonies and prayers people had once believed in. She never doubted the truth any more than she doubted the light of the sun. She had never in her short life heard of such a thing. 
but now a horrible fear came to her it seemed to clutch her heart like a cold iron band suppose there was anything wrong about the marriage what then oh heaven what then agatha continued welry tell me where you were married was it in the church at whitecroft no was it in any chapel there no were you married in england or in france in england and from the tortured heart came a cry to heaven for pity i am afraid said welry gently that you have not been married at all the laws of marriage in england are so strict so simple a child could understand them there can be no marriage without the law of the church or of the land a marriage must take place either in a church or in a registrar's office or if it be in a private house by a properly appointed minister unless you were married in one of these three methods you are not married at all for heaven's sake do not say so do not say so i shall die i cannot bear it you must face the truth your life has been a living lie long enough you must face the truth tell me where you were married it was pitiful to hear the sweet childlike voice that replied we were married at whitecroft sir wayne married me himself triumph flash in the eyes of the beautiful woman who was risking her life on one throw triumph that should have crushed her with shame yet she feared and reverenced the purity and innocence of the girl kneeling at her feet and clinging to her with such pleading hands tell me about it she said gently do not be afraid you will have to face the truth sometime face it now with me tell me all about the marriage we were together in a beautiful place in the woods place we both loved and where i often met him he told me he was going away and he asked me to go with him he said he could not live without me and i knew quite well that i could not live without him i loved him so well he began to teach me about the new law of marriage what is that asked welry i have never heard of it what is it alas alas if she this woman of the world who had every kind of knowledge if she knew nothing of it what then he explained it to me said agatha her eyes fixed with piteous entreaty on welry's face he told me that marriage was really the union of two hearts so it is interrupted welry but even hearts are human and must be governed by human laws he told me that when two hearts become one and when two people pledged themselves to each other until death and prayed heaven to bless them that they were then really married and that the old cumbersome signs and ceremonies were done away with there need be no ringing of bells and strewing of flowers he said but i had been to a wedding and i had heard the prayers i told him how beautiful they were and he knelt down i knelt with him and he said them all over then he told me and i knew i was his wife did you believe it asked welry wonderingly yes certainly i did and sir wayne taught you that yes then may heaven forgive him he is a greater villain than i thought any man could be and welry was silent for some minutes end of chapter 28chapter 29 of the earl's atonement by bertha m clay this librivox recording is in the public domain read by vinemala chapter 29 a woman crushed to earth welry was triumphant she would not speak for some few minutes lest the elation she felt should be shown in her voice it was just as she had expected a mere intrigue on the part of sir wayne a matter of life and death for agatha there had been no marriage sir wayne was free to marry and she congratulated herself on her plot yet she could not help pitying the terrified girl kneeling at her feet she must have known the truth sometime better perhaps that it should be now i am grieved for you agatha she said you have been basely and cruelly deceived you may believe me all the more that i am sorry for your sake to say it but that was no marriage you are no more married than i am do not say so oh heaven spare me do not say so poor child the sooner you know all the truth the better that is no marriage and you are no wife 
listen to me there are wicked men like sir wayne who have no sense of honor where women are concerned they love they betray they leave them as easily as they throw aside old gloves sir wayne has had many loves you see the writer of this letter knows a great deal about him he has never had any principle or sense of honor i do not wish to wound you but ever since he has been here while you have thought him devoted to you i have known someone else whom he has admired and made love to in an honorable fashion she waited for a reply but the girl was too stunned with her misery to ask a question you must see continued valery that to outsiders everything is quite clear sir wayne a rich unmarried baronet who has known no other love no other will than his own pleasure goes out visiting he meets you a simple country girl and you are even more ignorant and more inexperienced than any other girl of your age would be he sees you admires you falls in love with you after his fashion but he finds you good and innocent had you been less good he would have been far more frank he would not have gone through even that farce of marriage he would have said i love you but have no thought of marriage he found you good and innocent so he gave himself the trouble to deceive you he tells you all this nonsense and you believe it then he goes through the farce of marriage and you believe in it he adopts a false name brings you abroad keeps you secluded and never brings any friends near you now listen and believe me in another year or two he would tire of you he must marry some day and he will marry some noble or wealthy lady he must have heirs to succeed him this pleasant love dream with you is but a little interlude do you not see she sank lower and lower with such a wail of anguish and pain as had never before come from human lips it is a great pain to me she continued to tell you these things but you must know them the day would most certainly come when sir wayne himself would leave you and that would be harder to bear than this no graceful young tree with springing green leaves no fair flower opening its heart to the sun and suddenly struck with lightning no bright singing bird suddenly caught and caged could have been more abject and pitiful than this hapless girl struck down by the cruel words that declared there was no hope for her she crouched lower and lower until her face rested on the white stone terrace all the pride of her youth beauty love and life smitten from her with unerring hands ah where were those who loved her the fair young mother who loved her and who had named her after the fair saint with the palm branch where were the kindly father the faithful old servant the women men and children who would have given their lives for her she lay there crushed blinded stunned with her great misery and of all those whom she had helped and tended there was not one in this hour of need and despair to help her not one to raise the golden head with its weight of shame and woe not one to kiss the face that wore the whiteness and chill of death not one to clasp the cold hands and whisper words of pity valery looked at her as the head fell on the white stone it is very like murder she thought to herself but it will soon be over and she must have known it some time or other at least i have told her in kind words you must rouse yourself agatha continued valery i suppose you will see sir wayne and tell him this oh wayne wayne sobbed the girl oh wayne my love my darling would to heaven you had left me dead at whitecroft what have i done that such a horrible fate should be mine it must be some horrible jest or a dream or you have gone mad or i am mad wayne has always been good to me has always loved me why he met me first at the church door and he loved me from that moment he could not be so cruel to me he has not a cruel face or a cruel heart it is you who have stabbed me and slain me i was bound to tell you the truth said valery coldly you have evidently no idea of your position and you must be made to understand it but the cruel biting words passed over the girl's head she was far too miserable to heed them the prick of a pin does not pain when one suffers from a sword wound the very utterance of the name of wayne seemed to have unlocked the flood gates of her sorrow 
she wept such bitter passionate tears she sobbed until her whole frame shook she wept until valery in stern pity almost hoped she would die it was the thought of wayne wayne whom she loved so dearly in whom she had such firm implicit faith it was wayne who had betrayed her who had made her a shame and disgrace among women wayne whose beloved face she would never kiss again in stern pity valery let her weep on she could not check those tears agatha she said you must rouse yourself it will not do for anyone to find you here we should have a scandal all over the place you must rouse yourself and make up your mind what you are going to do she was not a tender hearted woman but the sight of that crushed figure lying there the golden hair all dishevelled the grief such as few ever know on her white face made valery feel uncomfortable it was as though she had plunged a knife in her heart and was waiting until she died valery felt that she could not bear it much longer something she said must be done at once you cannot remain here my aunt and i would both be compromised you must both go at once perhaps it will be better for you to tell sir wayne that we know the truth and cannot meet you again it was something to remember the way in which agatha rose from her crouching attitude and faced her accuser you tell me she cried that wayne my lover and husband to whom i trusted my body and soul has deceived and betrayed me that he has lied and cheated and made me a byword you yourself called him villain and you dare to suggest that i should see or speak to such a man again if i am all you say it is unconsciously so i call heaven to witness that i would rather have been a dead a thousand times than have offended heaven i have not done it wilfully but do you think after finding out my sin after knowing all you have told me that i should ever see sir wayne again valerie's heart gave a great thrill of triumph this was even better than she had dared to hope if she went away quietly without any scene or scandal then the field was clear to her she would ride triumphantly as it were over the course it would be your wisest and best plan certainly to decline seeing him again agatha you know the best though of course he must make provision for you provision for me she cried do you think it possible that i could ever take anything from him how little you know me so much the better thought valery these affairs are better ended at once i admire your spirit she said but you must consider the result you must live and you cannot live upon air would it not be better to see him first and see what he will arrange for you how can you speak to me in that way she cried with such a pathetic mournfulness that valery for half an instant felt shocked at herself what can anything matter to me now she said and you think that i can care whether i have money or none i shall creep away from here and die ah if you or any one else had loved my vein and found him false you would understand what could a hundred lives matter after that less than nothing valery said to herself that certainly nothing could be better than to creep away and die it would be the nicest thing she could do far wiser than to live on with that horrible pain in her heart and that anguish of woe in her eyes there is one thing said agatha and a flush of color rose for one minute to her white face and then faded there is one thing i have not sinned wilfully i knew little of life and i was very young i loved sir wayne and i believed what he told me i never asked myself whether it was right or wrong i believed it as a simple and perfect truth i thought i was sir wayne's wife now i find that i have accepted the position of a great sinner i protest again of my own will i am no sinner and what you have read in that letter does not apply to me i am innocent of any knowledge of wrong still said valery although you may be quite right you will find the world will decide against you its laws are strict and severe where the honor and purity of women are concerned when this same world knows what you have been it will not wait to ask whether it was your fault or not the very fact of holding such a position will cut you off from the word of good men and women i will not believe it cried agatha what have i done i believed the man whom i loved 
What harm have I done? I suppose, said Valerie, that you are paying the price of ignorance. I, but she had not time to finish her sentence. A servant came to say that some visitor had arrived, and Madame would be pleased if Mademoiselle would go to the salon. I will not be long, said Valerie. Wait here for me. I have more to say. Will you give me that letter? asked Agatha. Yes, she replied, placing it in her hand, little dreaming what use she intended to make of it. End of chapter 29Chapter 30 of The Earl's Atonement by Bertha M. Clay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Vinay Mala. Chapter 30 You have deceived others, but none so cruelly as me. Successfully carried out, thought Valerie to herself, thankful to get away from the sight of the white, despairing face, thankful to be out of hearing of that sad, sweet voice. Nothing was ever better planned or better executed. I would make an excellent ambassadress. I could arrange all those little difficulties between Germany, Austria, Spain and those wonderful provinces that people talk so much about. Yet no one seems to know just where they lie. I am thankful that it is over and it has been done effectually. I shall never forget her. I shall always say that I have witnessed a murder. How innocent and simple she is. How cruel of him and what a wicked man he is. Yet, wicked and cruel as she thought him, it made no difference to her fixed intention of becoming his wife. Even as she talked to the visitor, she was wondering in her own mind what Sir Vane would do or say, how long he would grieve over Agatha, how long it would be before he asked her to marry him, and whether he would be vexed with her if ever her share in the matter came out. The visitor did not seem inclined to go, having driven some distance to see Madame La Bohona. She consented to remain to dinner and Valerie had to entertain her. There was no chance of returning to the terrace to give the finishing blow to her work there. Once during the course of the long sunny afternoon, Madame asked, I wonder where Mrs. Harriet is. I have heard nothing of her today. She was in the garden this morning, replied Valerie. I saw her there. Mr. Harriet had gone to Lucerne, Joseph tells me. Do you think she is lonely? Would she care to join us, do you think, Valerie? And Mademoiselle shuddered as she thought of the ghastly face and figure she had left on the terrace. I think not, she said. Our visitor is not very amusing. Mrs. Harriet would not like to say no and she would most certainly be bored. Better not ask her, aunt. And the kindly Bahuna bowed to the decision of her niece. When Valerie left her, Agatha made an effort to go to the house. She had no intention of remaining there until Valerie returned. Grief has a strange physical effect on some people. In the midst of her horrible anguish, a sudden lethargy came over her, a sense of almost intolerable fatigue, pain in her limbs as though she had walked long miles. Her eyes were so hot and heavy, she must close them. Her head ached. Her brain seemed to be on fire. If she could but creep away to lie down somewhere, close her eyes and die. She almost forgot what her trouble was in the pain of that sense of fatigue. There was a great group of myrtle and ilex behind the marble fawn. She looked with wistful, piteous eyes at the marble face and the rippling waters. And then she could never remember how she came to be there. She found herself on the soft grass underneath the myrtle. She could see the blue sky and it seemed very close to her. The wind gently fanned her face. The white doves fluttered and cooed near her. Oh heavens, what was the sweet sense of rest coming over her? What horrible dream, what nightmare possessed her? A face was smiling above hers. The very face of Saint Agatha in the eastern window smiled on her and seemed to bless her. Then her white eyelids fell and she slept. That sleep most certainly saved her life. She awoke after two hours, shivering, cold and seriously ill. At first, she could not remember why she was sleeping there alone. Heaven help those who forget a sorrow in sleep and awake to remember it by degrees. There is no experience in life more terrible than that. Little by little, it all comes back to her. 
She remembered every word of that fatal letter. Nay, she held it there in her hands. A long convulsive shudder came over her. She knew that she must never see Wayne's face again. She could not rise from the ground until the trembling of her limbs had stopped. She lay quite still with closed eyes and began to think. To try to think, for at first no idea would come clearly to her. She could only keep this one fixed that Wayne had deceived and betrayed her. She was never to look upon his face again. She tried to think it over. Wayne, the handsome, ardent, eager lover. Wayne, whose beautiful face had seemed to her like the face of a god. It was so grand and so noble. Wayne, whose dark eyes had always been full of the light of love for her. She remembered the sweetness of his voice, his adoring, caressing love, his constant worshipping care. How should she live without it? She cried aloud in her distress, but no Wayne answered. Never again would the warm clasp of his hand, the warm loving kisses from his lips comfort her. Never more. She was desolate and in despair. To this girl, whose faith and love were so great, it was a terrible shock that one human being could ever so cruelly deceive another. All the time that he was at Whitecroft, when he was in the woods and fields, when he stopped and talked to her over the garden gate, when he was with her at the beautiful church, all the time it was her betrayal he had planned. It was not love. Not love. O oh, vain, my lover, not love. She cried aloud and the white doves scared flew away. She thought of her old home. She could never go back there in her shame and disgrace. Never should she see her father or Joan again. How Joan had warned her. All men are wolves, the old servant had said. At the time she had laughed in her heart, thinking how unlike that handsome lover of hers was a wolf. Now she realized what the words meant. He must have loved her. He never could have feigned all that. But then Valerie said he would have tired of her. What should she do? The first thing was to go away. To go where she should never see his face again. The writer of that letter said that while she wore the outward appearance of sanctity, she was a Magdalene. Ah no, that was not true. It should never be true. She would rather die than offend God. Rather die than do wrong. Now that she knew the horrible truth, she would not see him again. She would not wait for him. It might be even now that he loved her well enough to marry her. But if he knelt to ask her, if he prayed as man had never prayed, she would never marry him. She would go away where he could never find her, where she would never see him. She had not willfully offended heaven and she would try to atone. The one thing clear to her mind was that she must go, go before his return. He would be back soon, for the sun was shining over the lake with the peculiar brightness that comes before setting. He would be back soon. She had promised to be on the terrace to meet him. Ah, never more would she be there to meet him on his return, with shining face and loving lips. With all her resolves, she knew how she loved him and how weak she would be in his hands. If she would save herself, she must go. If she would protest against the wrong that had been done to her, if she would show that her share in it was unconscious, if she would show that she hated vice and loved virtue, she must go. If ever at any time her story became known, those who told it must add. The very same hour in which she found out the truth, she left him and never spoke to him again. What would her father and Joan say if they knew that she was not married after all? What would the poor women who had loved her so well think? Stately Lady Anne and Madame here who had been so kind to her, they must all hear the same story, that she had left him at once. She rose and stood leaning for a few minutes against the marble fawn. It was goodbye to the rippling waters and the pretty grounds, to the white terrace. Never except in her dreams should she see them again. She walked back to the house. It was well that she saw no one, for her face had not regained its colour and her eyes were wild with fear. She went to her room and the first thing that caught her eye was the beautiful jewelled writing table that Sir Vane had given her. She would write to him and enclose the letter. Then he would know why she had left him and when he thought of her in the future, he would see how she hated money and remember that she left him dearly as she loved him 
the same hour in which she found it out. She took pen and paper. Her heart did not break as she addressed this her last letter to him. Her eyes were dry and tearless. Even the very faculty of suffering seemed dimmed and deadened. I know all vain, she wrote. I enclose you this letter that you may know it is no longer a secret how you have deceived me. You have been away a few hours, and while you have been absent, while the sun was shining and the flowers blooming, my heart was broken. O oh, Wayne, how could you be so cruel to me, whom you loved? I was so happy in my old home, and I can never be happy again. I shall never see the old church, nor the dear Agatha, nor my mother's grave again. Never again. Why did you not leave me? If I were not good enough to be your wife, if you were shamed to marry me because I was a simple country girl, why did you not go away and leave me? I should have been always content with my life but for you. You have taken away my fair name. You have covered me with shame and disgrace. You have taken me from the ranks of good women. I cannot write what you have made of me. Mademoiselle showed me this letter this afternoon. Remember always that at once, when I knew the truth, I went away. Dearly as I love you, I have not waited to say goodbye. I shall never see your face again, Wayne. Oh dear, lost love, goodbye. Dear love, who has betrayed me, goodbye. My life is all spoiled, all blighted, but I cannot part from you in anger. I have loved you so well. You will miss me very much. You have been wicked and cruel, yet you have some little love for me. You have deceived others, but none so cruelly as me. My dear, lost love, I go from you. We shall meet face to face at the judgment seat, and then I shall ask you for my innocence and my soul. Goodbye. Remember that the last words which will ever pass between us are these. I forgive you. End of chapter 30「Chapter 31 of the Earl's Atonement by Bertha M. Clay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Vinay Mala. Chapter 31 A Lonely Wanderer Agatha folded the anonymous letter in the one she had just written, placed them both in an envelope, directed it to Sir Wayne, placed it on the toilet cushion where he must see it at once when he entered the room. She kissed it with trembling lips, while the word lasted, while suns rose and set, while golden stars stretched over the heaving seas, while she lived and he lived, this was the last communication between them. No more words, smiles, kisses or tears, no more greeting or reproach, eternal silence henceforth and forever. She looked once more round the room in which they had been so happy, and all the time she said to herself, he has been deceiving me. When he kissed me, when he caressed me, when he spoke most lovingly to me, he was most cruel and most false. She was perfectly stunned. Every few minutes the whole reality seemed to come to her with unknown force, seemed to overwhelm her afresh, seemed to daze and confound her. One thought was quite clear to her. She must go before he came home and go at once. She never thought where, in what direction her wandering footsteps were to go. She never thought of taking money, of providing for herself. She never even went into the room to put on a dress or cloak. The hat which she wore in the garden lay there. She took it up and wrapped a garden shawl around her. She wandered through the rooms, through the pretty corridors. She had no fixed determination where to go. No resolve, no idea, only that she was to go away so that she might not see Sir Wayne. She wandered through the grounds, down to the shores of the lake, walking always like one half-blinded. It did not seem to her that she was walking without an object, without any end in view except to get away from Sir Wayne. She walked through the long, quiet afternoon, the sun set and the moon rose. She had gone far from the lake now. The blue deep waters were left behind. She had made her way into the pretty town of Lucerne, and as she entered it, the clocks were all striking one. Yet the faintest dawn was not near. This was the darkest hour of night. 
she found herself in a large square ornamented with a fine statue and four fine fountains then with a sudden shock she realized the fact that she was here in a strange city quite alone she knew so little even of the ordinary habits of life that she never thought of going to any hotel the only place of refuge that occurred to her was the railway station and she made her way there she was flying from lucerne but she never thought whether she was to go to england or france or where she sat for some time having walked incessantly without resting she would have sat there in all probability until she fainted with fatigue but that a porter went up and asked if she were going by train to bear as well there as anywhere she said yes she asked if she could go from bail to paris he told her yes then she remembered that she must purchase a ticket then she bethought herself of money in her desk at the chateau she had a roll of bank notes but she had not thought of them sir wain had always been most generous in the way of money she could have as much as she liked as much and more than she could possibly spend if she had remembered it even she would not have taken it she would not have touched it now the immediate necessity was for money to travel to paris when she reached paris she could of course seek work she put her hand in the pretty little fancy pocket attached to her dress ah heaven be praised her purse was there she remembered afterward that she had taken it because she had promised to lend some money to a needy woman she had found in a poor chalet by the lake she was glad to find it was filled with money he would have no difficulty now in reaching paris she sat in the railway station until the same civil young porter came to tell her that the train was about to start she bought her ticket and the man looking at the white haggard young face suggested that she should take some hot coffee before she began her journey she looked at him in surprise did anyone think that she could eat or drink or care for anything in this world again if anyone had asked her suddenly why was she going to paris she would have answered to die it was a long journey but she did not feel the fatigue of it she seemed past all ordinary sensations it was not so much the present with its terrible burden her mind wandered continually to the past she was at whitecroft with sir wayne always in the woods listening in fancy over and over again to the eager and impetuous words in which he had wooed her in which he had told her of the supposed new law of marriage then she was with him at paris where he had lavished such costly gifts upon her and it had seemed to him nothing because of his great love then she was at belleflas it seemed to her that she could do nothing but contrast the fiction with the reality she could only contrast her thoughts of him as they were now and as they had been then all the time he had been false it was like barbed iron entering her soul to remember what the writer of that letter had said about him she had believed so entirely that she was his first and only love he had seemed so perfectly indifferent to all other women during the whole time she had been with him she had never seen him give to any other woman a thought and yet wellry said that even there at belleflas he had cared for someone else there had been no truth no honor it had all been a foul scheme and plan not only an error but a crime there was one part of her journey during which she lay back with closed eyes and tried to imagine herself back in the old grey church praying to heaven with her whole heart and soul that this unconscious sin of hers might be forgiven praying with weeping eyes and then she woke suddenly to find herself in a railway carriage with a dull dreary sense of pain such as words could never describe the rest of the journey was a dream when it was dark she leaned back against the carriage with staring eyes blinded more by pain than by darkness when it was light she watched the magnificent scenery the cloud topped mountains the valleys the quaint old towns the rivers spanned by rustic bridges the green valleys they were dimmed and blurred to her although the moon and stars shone upon them she sat quiet without speaking or moving people went in and out of the carriage and she did not see them many looked in wonder at the white beautiful face with its expression of agony and woe what could have brought a blight upon one so young and fair 
at one of the stations between Belle and Paris, the train stopped for passengers to take refreshment, and though several ladies went from the compartments, Agatha did not stir. One lady went to her and said gently, You look very ill. Let me order some coffee for you. Her lips were so cold, so stiff, so dumb, she could hardly open them to answer. I advise you to take something, continued the kindly lady. It will be some time before we reach Paris, and the train will not stop again. I could not drink it, she replied. It annoyed her that anyone should think she could either eat or drink. Did they not know that although her body was living, her heart was dead? And at last, late at night, the train reached the great railway station, which even then was full of traffic, noise and bustle. When the passengers left the train, there was the usual confusion of passengers crying out for their luggage, of porters and guards, of cabmen and coachmen. Through them walked this girl, with the beautiful figure, lovely colourless face, with white set lips and burning eyes. Speaking to no one, looking neither to the right nor the left, she walked out into the brilliant evil streets of Paris. Evil escaped her. The bruised heart and crushed soul were aching with pain. She could not understand anything just then but sorrow. If she had met a weeping woman or a crying child, she would have stopped to comfort her or it, but the light-hearted revellers, passing her by with laughter and song, they were less than nothing to her. She neither heard nor saw them. Down the white hard pavement came a group of girls, singing, dancing, poor, painted, wretched, lost for this word and the next. They surrounded her and danced a wild war dance around her, until catching sight of the colourless face, they ran off scared and wondering. They are mad, she thought. She walked on through the narrow streets, through the broad boulevards, and again the same sensation of extreme fatigue came over her. She felt that her eyes must close. She never thought of going to any hotel. Hundreds of little children sleeping then in Paris would have been far more awake to the realities of life than she was. Hundreds of sleeping children would have known better where to go and what to do. Away from this wide boulevard, she wandered down a wide street. Tall white houses stood on one side. On the other, she saw something like a square of green. The street was very silent. There was not a sound. She came to a large house. It could not be a private house. It was so large. There was a great porch with fluted pillars and seats round its broad steps. And over the door was a huge lamp which burned brightly. She crept into the silent porch. In the shadowy corner, there was no sound. Great golden stars throbbed in the blue sky. Far off, she fancied that she heard the rushing sound of a river. By the bright light of the lamp, she could see a great crucifix hanging in the porch. And she knew then that she was under the roof of some charitable institution. She sat down in the dark shadow of the porch. But that was not rest enough. So she lay down stretched out her whole length on the wooden seat. Ah, that was rest. She looked from the sorrowful face and thorn-crowned head of the crucifix to the green leaves in the square. Ah, it was so sweet, this rest. Slowly the sounds that had filled her ears, the rush of steam, the shrill shriek of the railway whistle and rolling of the wheels died out of her ears. Her eyelids drooped. She did not think of waking again. She did not wonder what she should do when morning came. The golden head that had for so long pillowed on her lover's heart had a hard resting place now. But she was a tired child, falling asleep as a child on its mother's breast. End of chapter 31「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「ヴィネマラ」「It was long since he had enjoyed a game of billiards and at the Hotel Angelo there was a fine table and always good players. He went for an hour, 
but he did not enjoy his game. The same terrible sense of foreboding followed him there. It was so strong upon him that his hand trembled and his game was spoiled. He tried to laugh at himself. I have laughed at nervous women a hundred times, he said to himself, and now I am more nervous than the most fanciful of women. Yet he could not conquer it. It was all of Agatha, the most depressing thoughts and ideas, sudden starts of fancy. He thought once that he heard her cry out for him in the most piteous voice. How foolish it was! Yet his nervous terror and apprehension were so great he determined to hasten back at once. There is more in the world than even philosophers dream. Between these two, there was the strongest, deepest love. And though they were wide apart, the sorrow and despair of one influenced the other. Who knows the mysteries that are yet to be discovered in the strange influence people have over each other? Sir Wayne drove rapidly to Belleflas. He was thinking of Agatha the whole way. He looked with satisfaction on the various little parcels placed in the carriage. He had seen a bracelet of pale gold studded with magnificent pearls, and he had thought it would add to the beauty of the fair rounded arm that was whiter than even the pearls. He had purchased it for Agatha, paying the exorbitant price demanded by the jeweller with the sunk fro that would have been creditable to a millionaire. In another shop, he saw a cloud of fine white peerless lace and he said to himself how well it would look wound round the golden head and white shoulders. He saw some English novels and purchased them, with some photographs that he thought would interest her. Finally, he purchased a bouquet of magnificent flowers. She likes me to take her plenty of flowers, he said. She is always well pleased with them. So he drove home in the beautiful mellow sunlight through the finest scenery in the world, with his heart heavy as lead because he could not understand the presentiment that seemed to haunt him. Ah, there was the blue gleaming water of the lake. There the grand mountains covered with snow, and as he drove on, he saw the tall round towers of the chateau between the trees. The sense of relief that came to him was indescribable. He found now that he had been afraid to come to the lake not knowing what would meet him there. The blue waters laughed in the sunlight. As he drove up the hill, he said to himself that he would never laugh at nervous people again, that he should never forget that day and all that he had suffered. A turn of the hill and then he sees the beautiful grounds of the chateau, the tall trees, the graceful fountains, the myrtle and the ilex. He sees the long white terrace and he knows that he is near her now. There stands the marble fawn. He is sure to see her in the spot where she promised to stand. The sun shines on the myrtle and the ilex where a few hours since the girl who loved him so well had been slain. She was not there. The sun shone on the white fawn on the rippling water but Agatha was not there. His heart sunk with the feeling of awe and fear. She had never broken a promise she had made to him, however slight. She had said she would be there waiting for him and she was not. Surely there was no reality in the terrible fear that had been tearing at his heart all day. He threw the reins to the groom, gave orders that the different parcels in the carriage were to be taken to Mrs. Harriet's room, then hastened to find her. She would be among the tall myrtles, he was sure, hiding perhaps half in jest, resting perhaps for the afternoon was warm, sleeping perhaps and he fancied the golden head resting against the trunk of a tree. Agatha, he said gently, but there was no reply. He did not notice a half-broken branch of the myrtle and several crushed flowers. He did not know that just where he stood was where his victim had fallen when the sword was plunged into her heart. As Valerie had said, murder was not pleasant, and murder had certainly been done there. He called her name again, but there was no reply. He went among the myrtle trees, looking where the shade was deepest. There was no sign of her. But he saw on the grass a piece of the ribbon she had worn that morning in her hair. Ah, then she had been here, watching most probably for him. Bless the loving, faithful heart and the beautiful face. Then he walked through the grounds. He could hear from the open window of the salon the magnificent voice of Valerie Denvers singing an Italian love song, singing so beautifully that he stopped to listen. 
that woman would have made a fortune on the stage he said to himself and then he laughed as he remembered the scene of the morning as though it were within the bounds of human possibility that he could care for a woman of her type my agatha is an angel he said to himself the light of heaven is on her face the stars are not so clear and true as her dear eyes the other is a parisian coquette a stage queen and as he stood listening to the rich voice he thought of his innocent young love ah thank heaven she would never know he had grown to respect her innocence and purity so greatly that he could not bear to think of the wrong done to her if it could have been undone he would have undone it the only thing that he could do now was to keep her in the same state of ignorance and innocence ah sweet agatha who was like her who had hair of such lovely gold lips so dainty and sweet who was like her he walked slowly back to the house she would be in her room he looked everywhere but could not find her he went through the suite of rooms but saw nothing of her he did not go into his own once he fancied he heard her footsteps in the outer hall and he hastened to her with a joyful cry it was only the wind stirring the great vine leaves there was no gatha in her dressing room he saw her dinner dress all prepared the light blue velvet embroidered with seed pearls and the beautiful suite of pearls to match still he could not find her the inmates of the house were summoned and a strict search instituted but it was useless suddenly he remembered what agatha had said she was going to read to finish le miserable in all probability if he could find the book he should find her he looked where he had seen it that morning but it was gone nor could he find it he went to the spot where the tall myrtles grew he called this time aloud agatha agatha there was no reply no sound save the evening breeze as it rustled in the leafy branches but under the garden chair he saw a book and when he picked it up it was le miserable so that she must have been reading and have dropped her book but where was she if we were in greece i should think she had been stolen by brigands it is just as though she had come out here this morning and had never been seen since this time he left no nook or corner unsearched but he could find no gatha again as he went round to the western side of the house he heard the rich tones of the magnificent voice singing a popular air there was something of subtle triumph in the notes end of chapter 32chapter 33 of the earl's atonement by bertha m clay this librivox recording is in the public domain read by vinaymala chapter 33 you have murdered her if once during his excitement he had thought of going into his own room the mystery would have been explained to him but he never thought of it he was hurried excited eager to have some intelligence of her so that the envelope with its enclosure remained untouched he was absent with the men servants for two hours searching the grounds during which the sun set and the fair woven earth was wrapped in silence and darkness the waters of the lake were hushed and still there was no sound look where they would there was no sign of agatha it was quite dark when they reached home the moon and stars had not yet risen sir wayne was beside himself with wonder and alarm then that happened which soon brought the terrible truth home to sir wayne he was going to lucerne and he went to his room in search of a warmer overcoat by this time his alarm and anxiety had increased now he knew that there was something wrong something had happened to agatha but it never occurred to him that she had left him of her own accord the lamps were lighted everything was ready for him almost the first thing that he saw when he entered the room was the white envelope pinned on the toilet cushion in one moment the truth flashed across him she had written that letter placed it there and had left him a great fear came over him surely she had not found out the truth if so great drops gathered on his forehead he took the letter with a low moan opened it and found the enclosure he read agatha's letter first oh heaven she knew and she had gone she had left him forever 
He was stunned at first and could hardly realize the words of the letter that Mademoiselle had shown her the enclosed. Then he understood that he had to read the enclosed. He read it word for word, his own story written by this cruel, treacherous hand. As he read, the veins upon his forehead swelled until they stood out like great cords. His eyes literally flashed fire. His strong hands were clenched. If I knew the hound who had written that, I would thrash his life out of him, he said aloud. Oh, my Agatha, my beautiful loving Agatha, it has killed her, I know. His first thought was for her, her anguish, her sorrow, her desolation, her despair. Reading these cruel haunting words by the light of her pure and innocent eyes, he knew she could never look up again, that they would crush her and kill her. He was a selfish man, but in that moment, he would have given his life to have saved her from the knowledge. His own face burned with the crimson flush as he read the words. How horrible they were! What must that poor child have felt as she read them? What shame! What humiliation! So great that she had gone out, he felt sure to die. Of all the revelations of his forebodings, nothing could have been so horrible as this. At first, his thoughts were all for her, for what she had suffered, for the shame and sorrow that had overwhelmed her. In that moment, he hated and loathed himself. He saw his cruelty, his deceit, his treachery in their true light, and he hated himself. What would she think of him, now that she knew what he had done to her? He had killed this innocent child by the most cruel of deaths. He had never intended her to know. He had meant to keep her in utter ignorance, far from the world, a beautiful flower blooming in solitude and blooming only for him. Now she would know that the man she had loved so dearly was a villain. And knowing it, she had gone out to die. If he could but strike dead the one who had written these words, who could have written it? Who knew his story? To whose interest had it been to strike this blow to the fair and gentle girl who had never injured anyone? Why had it been done? Above all, who had shown her how fiendish he had been? Mademoiselle, of course. This wicked letter had been written to her, sent to her, and she had taken it to Agatha. Why had she not brought it to him or have taken it to Madame? Why have taken it to her? While he had been away in the sunshine, she had been slain. How little he had dreamed that he was leaving her for this. He began to see through the motive. It was Valerie who had given that letter to Agatha and the motive was jealousy. I must have been mad, he said, ever to have spoken to the girl. I will see what she means by it. Five minutes later, he was standing in the salon with the two letters on the table before him, looking very erect, very proud and indignant, a darkening frown on his handsome face, his brow knitted, such stern determination on his lips as was seldom seen there. Ask Mademoiselle Danvers if she will come to me at once, he said. Valerie relayed all her force and stood before him, bright, defiant, yet with an assumption of compassion. Dear Mr. Harriet, she began, but the words died on her lips. One look at his face showed that her cause was lost, at least for the present. Then she saw that fatal letter on the table, and she knew in one moment what had happened. She knew that she ought to have destroyed it when Agatha had read it. And she wondered, when she stood there, how she could have been so mad as to give it to her. Of course, she could not tell how things would turn out. He expected to go back to Agatha. She had not said all she wished, and while she was absent, it seemed to her that Agatha might as well read that letter again and impress it on her mind. She never dreamed that she would show it to Sir Wayne. She would rather have slain her a hundred times over than that. What a fatal oversight it was. She had ruined herself by it, but she must face it now. Those dark eyes of Sir Wayne's, so terrible in their anger, were fixed upon her face, and quick as a flash of lightning, she decided upon her course of proceeding. Will you be kind enough, he said sternly, to tell me what you know of this cruel, foul, treacherous letter? What letter? she asked, and suddenly, if ever the face of a beautiful woman expressed innocent surprise, hers did. Will you look at it and see? he replied curtly. She would sooner have touched a live snake or an adar. 
but she dared not disobey him. She raised it slowly, then affected to find out suddenly what it was. Why, this is my letter, she said, and her face fell. No actress could have grasped the situation better. Oh, Mr. Harriet, how sorry I am that it has been shown to you. Your letter? He retorted. Yes, I see that the vile concoction has been addressed to you. How dare you show it to my... He was going to say wife, but his conscience smote him, and the word died on his lips. How dare you show it to that innocent girl? Have I done wrong, Mr. Harriet? She asked. I am so sorry. I had no thought, no idea. Nonsense, he cried. You must have known that that letter would either kill her or drive her mad. He stuck her white hands together and looked most imploringly at him. Do not be angry, she cried. I would not grieve you or vex you or annoy you for the whole world. If you look at me in that way, I shall die. She covered her face with her hands and seemed to tremble. But it was too late for all those affectations. Sir Wayne's anger was roused. I want to know, he said, when you received that letter, why you did not bring it to me. I, I dare not, she said. I can believe, he replied, that you were afraid to bring such a thing to me. My wonder is that you were not more afraid to show it to a young, innocent, tender-hearted girl. Do you know what you have done in showing her that letter? You have murdered her. I am sorry, she said with drooping eyes. I am more sorry than words can tell. I meant no harm. The letter said she was to be told. I did not know it was so very wrong. You must not be angry with me or I shall die. The pity is, he said bitterly, that you did not die before. End of chapter 33、Chapter、34。I have made a terrible mistake. Valerie Danvers raised her head in wonder. You would sooner that I were dead? Oh, Mr. Harriet, you cannot mean that. I do mean it, he said. What right had you to show that letter to a girl? It is no compliment to you that any person, man or woman, would indict such a letter to you. It shows plainly that the writer has no respect for you. But that he or she considers you, to say the least of it, a woman of the world, To whom nothing is sacred, nothing is innocent, nothing pure. Thank heaven, no one would have written such a letter to her. How can I help it? she said. It is not my fault. I do not say that it is, but it shows the writer's appreciation of you. Had a quarter of those things been written to Agatha, she would not have understood them. You, I must say, have a singular knowledge of that which you ought not even to understand. The tone of sarcasm hurt her more than any reproach could have done. She felt at once how much she had fallen in his esteem. She saw that in his mind she was far below Agatha and must regain that place before she could make any progress. I see now, she said with an air of pretty contrition, that I have done wrong. I am so sorry now that I did not bring it to you. Indeed, I meant to do no harm. The letter was most emphatically written, I must show it to her, said I, and explain it to her. I thought I was doing right. I do not see how you can blame me. You cannot ignore my share of interest in the matter. If that be true, and you do not deny it, he interrupted her. Why should I deny it to you? he cried. If it be true, said she, looking at him with bright, fearless eyes, then you had no right to intrude such a person on my aunt and myself. It is cruel to her and cruel to me. I do not wish to hurt your feelings, he said, but I am confident of one thing. Agatha is an angel of innocence and light compared to you. She has the transparent mind of a child. So it seems, she said, but her face flushed hotly. No matter what I am, I have kept my place among pure and good women. She has lost hers. He restrained himself by a great effort. Even his lips became white with rage. You take too much for granted, he said. What right have you to assume that this miserable letter is true? It may be a tissue of contemptible lies. I know it is true, she said, and so do you. 
as a gentleman and a so called man of honor you cannot deny it you know that you are sir wayne harriet carleon of gaswood you know that the person you have brought here and introduced as your wife is agatha brook only a doctor's daughter you know that you deceived her most cruelly and that she believed herself to be your wife she would not have left whitecroft but that she believed herself to be your wife his face grew paler and paler with suppressed passion his eyes flamed on her dauntless face will you tell me he cried what business this is of yours i will she replied it would have been no business of mine if you had taken her elsewhere as you have brought her here under my aunt's roof it becomes my business at once i say that you have taken an unwarrantable liberty and one quite unworthy of an english gentleman in bringing such a person under our roof you would not have taken her to your own mother or sister i am quite sure i should have done so he cried then pardon me you would have married her first she interrupted and i must remind you that my aunt's family is quite as good as your own mine on my father's side i should say much better and i have a right to complain when i find you have made so little of our house he had no reply to make i do not see continued valery that you have anything to complain about i think the right to complain lies with us in all good faith my aunt takes you in she is one of the proudest women in switzerland and you deceive her by bringing a person of that description here then i am told of it told to question the person herself and i find from her it is all true agatha broke told me the story of her most foolish incredulity of her simple folly if she had not told me i should never have thought that any girl could be so absurdly and easily deceived she told you the truth did she and now i suppose she has gone to die because she believes herself unworthy to live i do not know i know nothing of her will you tell me what passed between you he asked ah if she dared she would gladly have told him that the woman he loved lay a crushed helpless heap at her feet there was little enough she said i gave her the letter and she read it through she cried bitterly and then she told me the whole story of her marriage and i told her how basely she had been deceived as i told you before my aunt sent for me while we were talking and i went and you mean to tell me that my loving innocent darling read those bitter wicked words you should have married her sarvain if you intended her to keep her fair name you take a base and cowardly advantage of my absence he said you ought not to have dared to have shown it to her but to have waited for me you forget how indignant and injured i feel her whole face changed her dark eyes grew glorious in their softened light her lips quivered she went nearer to him and held out her hand ah forgive me if i have done wrong she said softly i thought of you only of you i did not remember her or anything else but you only you if i committed an error can you not forgive it when it was love for you perhaps heaven help me perhaps i was not altogether sorry to know that you were free the voice in which she whispered the words was so sweet the beautiful face she raised to him so bewitching in its loveliness he would have been more than mortal if he had resisted her she saw his softened expression and she knew that she had gained some influence she knew that she had chosen the right path if you knew she whispered i am so sorry i have made a terrible mistake all through love of you but i will give my life to undo it i will do everything in the world to help you if it were any man in this wide world but you i should hate and loathe him ah me i cannot help loving you do not be angry with me if you are vexed with me there will be no light in the wide world for me say you forgive me he relented visibly he had been terribly angry with her but if she meant no harm if she had thought only of him if she had not been altogether sorry to find him free he could not be so angry i cannot say that i forgive you he said i must know more of what you have done at first sight it seems unpardonable what am i to say to madame he asked abruptly what you will she replied i must tell her something of the truth he continued 
for your own sake she said i advise you not i should give any explanation that occurs to you but certainly not the truth my aunt would never forgive you and it will make her miserable her whole life long did she agatha tell you where she was going or what she was going to do no not one word i would tell you if i had the faintest notion he began to pace up and down the room the frown and perplexity deepening on his face he did not in the least know what to do wellry went to the table with the intention of reclaiming her letter he held out his hand do not take that he said it may be valuable evidence to me another day it is my letter she said yes but you have given it out of your hands he replied a few more turns up and down the room then he stopped abruptly wellry he said i must find her i could not live without her i shall go to paris to night it is useless looking for her here i shall go to paris and employ the cleverest agents the secret police have i must find her even if it takes my whole life and when i find her i will marry her she was vexed at the words she had not thought he would take it in this way she had half fancied that he would be relieved now she saw that he was the most miserable of men no arts or blandishments of hers were of the least use now the only thing was to face herself as it were for the present i must find her he said and if it takes every hour of my life and the whole of my fortune i will find the writer of this letter even if only to slay him she looked at him with startled eyes and he saw the start an idea came to him of which he did not speak then but which was afterward realized i shall go at once and catch the express from lucerne and i shall be in paris soon enough i will not go by by but not now she said you cannot go now i must i could not stay in this place where my darling has been murdered if i were to stay here another hour it would drive me mad her face grew quite colorless and she went to him with pleading eyes do not go i could not bear it she said and her voice died with sobs do not go i must it is your fault he cried but she may return she may write to you and you will not be here i shall leave my address with madame who can forward any letters or telegrams to me i could not stay here every room would be haunted by her i should see and hear her everywhere i am not heartless enough for that do think of me she said what shall i do if you go much the same as you did before i came you have never in your life done a more cruel deed than when you broke that girl's heart with that letter i will ring for madame she caught his hand between her own let me speak to you she cried do not be so cold so cruel to me i shall die if you leave me in this way and she fell to weeping bitter tears which angered him still more my time is too precious to waste in these scenes he said had you not better retire before i see madame you will not tell her she gasped no i will not betray you as you have done me he said then without another word he rang the bell and asked for madame there was nothing for wellry but to hasten to her room end of chapter 34chapter 35 of the earl's atonement by bertha m clay this librivox recording is in the public domain read by vinay mala chapter 35 a lady visitor i have news of my wife madam said servain when that astonished and much tired lady came before him very bad news too i am sorry to hear it replied madam my wife has left me he continued under a mistake a great grave terrible mistake i hope to set everything right and to find her for that reason i am going away to night it is sudden said madam but you are quite right i am very much grieved for you mr harriet give me 5 minutes madam he continued my wife had left a letter for me i did not find it until i went into my room she tells me why she has gone but not where and i am going to find her i will leave here everything that belongs to us for we may return i will with your permission arrange our pecuniary matters now money was nothing to him 
Agatha was everything. He placed a check in Madame's hand and she gave a little cry when she saw the amount. This is too much, she said. I cannot take it, Mr. Harriet. Pardon me if I insist, he replied. I should have remained here another year, but for this. My wife may return here. I should like to keep everything just as it is for a year. And I will leave you my address. Promise to send to me by your own hands, not to trust to any others, all the letters or telegrams that may come. I promise, said Madame, affected to tears by his generosity and her sorrow for him. After a few more minutes of conversation, Sir Wayne looked at his watch. I must go, he said. I have no time to spare. Will you not wait to say goodbye to my niece? She cried aghast at the sudden breakup of a seemingly happy party. I cannot, he said. I must leave it, madame, for you to do for me. Pray make my adieus to mademoiselle. Ten minutes afterward, he had left the chateau. The groom was to follow with the horses and all that he required. The address that he left was Sir Wayne Carleon, Hotel du No, Paris. If Madame thought anything of the name, she made no comment. Before sunset, the next day, the groom with the horses and all Sir Wayne's belongings had quitted the Bellaflas and the silence and solitude were broken no more. The surprise and dismay did not last long. Everything is excused to a rich baronet. Even his sins are known by a gentle and tender name. Valery bided her time. She had overreached herself. And she saw it now. Her letter was a work of art, but her error in placing it in Agatha's hands had been fatal. She had that false step to retrieve, and she could only bide her time. There was nothing to be done at present. However hard his words and thoughts, she must not resent them. She must appeal always to his love, pity and vanity. Then she felt that she should succeed. She bore it for one week. Then she could bear it no longer. She was miserable. She found that she loved Sir Wayne with the whole passionate love of her heart. That life without him was not worth living. She was bitterly disappointed at the result of what she felt to be a very clever intrigue. Nothing could have been better than Agatha's disappearance, leaving him so free and unfettered. But all that was nothing while he persisted in searching for her. He would never find her. She felt persuaded that Agatha meant what she said, that she would never look upon his face again. Valerie felt almost sure that she had sought and found death. But it was not Agatha of whom she thought now, but herself. She had played good cards and yet had spoiled her game. And now she had awoke and a strong sudden sense of her own fate came over her. She had not known while Sir Wayne was with her how entirely and completely she loved him. She knew it now. She knew that life without him would be unendurable, that she could not bear it, that she must see, hear and be with him or she must die. In her blind folly, she would not look at the truth. She would not remember the bitter things he had said to her. She flattered herself. They meant nothing. He was angry and excited when he had said them, but she let her mind brood and her thoughts dwell on the other words, all the tender, whispered nothings that had in them no sense. Over those she brooded until she lost her common sense. She would not bring her reason to bear upon them at all. She brooded over them until she persuaded herself that Sir Wayne really loved her. He had been obliged to show some sorrow at the loss of Agatha. But that would all vanish when she went to him. Her passionate, ill-disciplined nature had never known any control. She was not likely to exercise it now when for the first time she loved with her whole heart. She could bear it no longer. The long days that never brought him, the suns that set, the suns that rose without any news of him, the longing that was eating her heart away, it was a living death. She could not endure it. And she shuddered when she thought what the hapless girl who had rapturously loved him must have suffered. Aunt, said Valerie to Madame, of course Mr. Harriet left his address with you. This was a few days after his departure. There is a packet of letters for him from England. 
and one is marked immediate. Shall I send them for you? If you will, my dear, said madame, only too glad to be relieved of the trouble. Since these events happened, she had not been so strong or so well. Valerie had not liked openly and without reason to ask for his address. It would have looked suspicious, but she gladly availed herself of this opportunity. Madame gave it to her. Sir Vane Carleon, Hotel du No, Paris. Valerie looked at Madame. Aunt, she said, do you not think it strange that your English lodger should have two names? I cannot say so, she answered. I never attempt to understand the English. I have heard of such things before though. People of rank often lay aside their titles and travel incognito. It is to save trouble and secure a little peace, I imagine. I have always thought this Sir Vane, how strange a name, was an aristocrat. It is curious to think that gentle quiet girl who loved solitude was Lady Carleon. Valerie's face flushed. It was on her lips to cry out that she was not Lady Carleon, but she restrained herself. It would never do to let her aunt know that she had had any share in the affair. She forwarded the letters, waited a few days longer, then told her aunt that she had received an invitation from an old school fellow who had just married and gone to Vienna and she should probably be absent for some time. Madame, who never attempted to control or influence her niece, sighed with a sense of relief. After all, she thought she should not be sorry to have the whole place to herself and recover from her fatigue. Valery went away and Madame was alone. She thought a great deal of the fair angelic girl who had so suddenly disappeared. She wondered what was the great and grave mistake that Sir Vane had spoken about. Every family has its skeleton, every life its hidden side, every heart its pain. Madame wept more than once over the fate of the beautiful girl whom she had really loved. More than once, too, she grew nervous when the evening shadows fell and fancied she could see a white shape moving between the trees, fancied she could hear the wailing of a woman's voice, fancied that she could hear light footsteps along the floor and the faint rustle of a woman's dress. But never again did Madame see Agatha Brook. Sir Vane had been for some days at the hotel and already he was beginning to tire. The vehemence of his sorrow was fading. He felt the loss. He was lonely, disconsolate and would have given his whole fortune to have found her. But it did not seem likely. Knowing nothing of the purse in her pocket, he had told the clever and astute agents of the secret police that she had left home without money. Then they said if that were the case, she could not have left Lucerne. His own opinion was that she had drowned herself in the lake. She was so gentle, so helpless, so unfit to find her way. He began to feel quite sure that she had wandered down to him the lake and was lying underneath the waters. Ah, fair sweet Agatha, better so, a thousand times, than living with the sword of burning fire in your heart, better a thousand times. In those days, no smile was ever seen on his face. He wandered like an unquiet spirit. He could find no rest, no enjoyment, no repose. Agatha's face was never out of his mind. He could tell what she had suffered. Poor gentle child. She had seemed unwilling at first to believe him when he told her that by virtue of his promise she was indeed his wife. He remembered her anxious, wistful face and her sudden resolution to trust him in all. This was how her trust had ended, in betrayal and perhaps in death. He had loved other women and had left them, but he had never been haunted by any sad memories of them. He had forgotten them. This is the one love of my life, he said to himself over and over again. The more he regretted Agatha, the more he hated Valerie. All his sorrow and unhappiness were caused by her. It was she who had brought it all on him. He hated her. He could not endure to think how she had taken advantage of his absence to give this death wound. There came one evening more unbearable to him than any other had been yet. He was possessed by the picture of a woman drowning. He could fancy the fair hair caught by reeds and water lilies. He could fancy a white beautiful face raised to the moonlit sky, white hands beating the waters, then lying so still. Wherever he went, this picture was with him. 
he wiped the great drops of perspiration from his brow and he cried out once if this be the punishment of a sinner i would that i had been a saint he went to the most brilliant cafes in paris to dine but he could eat nothing he went to the opera but he left it he could not bear the music he went to his room at the hotel a bright cheerful sitting room beautifully furnished on the first floor he sat there the very picture of despondency when one of the waiters came to him and said that a lady wished to see him a lady he repeated ask her to come here heavens it is agatha agatha come back to me end of chapter 35a lady he repeated an english lady tall and fair with golden hair make haste do not keep her waiting good heavens i shall go mad with delight i will ask her on my knees to marry me and so help me heaven i will be a good man i will indeed he never thought of valerie she was far from his mind the whole world to him was agatha no one but agatha the frightened waiter answered i do not know monsieur i cannot tell the lady is veiled it is my agatha good heavens how grateful i am it is to me as though she were given back from the dead he was blind and dazed it seemed to him a miracle that agatha should come back he staggered rather than walked to the door hungry thirsting for one look at her up the wide staircase with its crimson carpets its marble statues its wealth of green plants came a tall slender figure he could not see distinctly for his eyes were dimmed with tears ah thank heaven she was not lying under the dark waters of the lake he tried to speak to her but his lips were stiff and could articulate no sound a blood red mist seemed to hang over him he caught her arm and drew her into the room he clasped her in his arms he covered her face and hands with passionate kisses he murmured the wildest words of love and welcome to her he was quite mad and beside himself with joy my darling my love thank heaven you have come back to me my love my wife she was strangely still she trembled in the strong clasp of those strong arms a gleam of light from the lamps fell on her face and head surely the hair falling in a rippling mass down her shoulders was black he gave a little cry it was velry not agatha he had thought to gather agatha to his heart and to atone to her by his passionate love and instead it was the woman who had been her murderess who was lying in his arms she knew there was no hope for her when she heard that cry it froze her very heart you he cried with a great oath flinging her from him you what brings you here she stood for a minutes a silent beautiful embodiment of despair what brings you here he cried my love for you and your promise to me she replied what promise he asked curtly you said that if you had met me first you should have married me you promised that if ever you met me and were free you would marry me i am here to claim your love and remind you of your promise he muttered something between his teeth hard words she knew but as this was her last card she decided to play it well she would keep her patience and courage while they were of any use to her and then it would be war to the knife you do not call that kind of fooling a promise he said it was your seeking any man would have said the same thing when a woman urged him you know and i know it was only sentimental nonsense we laughed at each other I know this one thing she said I loved you with all my heart then as I do now that is not my fault he retorted great heaven what pain you have given me why did you come here i thought it was agatha listen to me she said impressively laying her hand on his arm nay be patient and listen i love you a thousand times better than that baby girl was capable of loving 
she went on in a tone of deep emotion the tears standing like pearls on her beautiful lashes i would go through fire for you i am not a foolish school girl i am a woman of talent and power i could make a worthy helpmate to a man like you i could help you to be famous think of it above all i love you so dearly and so well that i would give my life for you do you hear sarvain she said passionately my very life i would give for you and think it but little there was pathos in the ring of her voice passionate love in the expression of her face he felt that it was true and not feigned this is hardly the time for talking nonsense he replied i do not wish to seem inhospitable but i should be greatly relieved if you would go i i thought it was agatha and i am unnerved i am not myself the passion deepened in her face but something of anger mingled with her emotion i might she said have expected this kind of language from you yet strange to say i did not i will know my fate were all the words you said to me false were all the promises false did you not mean what you said not one word he replied scornfully and you know it you are a practiced coquette though you are but a young girl and you knew that it was merely past time you cared nothing for me nor i for you when she looked up at him her dark eyes were swimming in tears i do not know how it began she said i only know it has ended and that is in my deepest love and devotion to you of course i am grateful he said impatiently but i do not want it it is quite useless to me you said you loved me sarvain now be reasonable valry you can when you choose what can a man do when a beautiful woman follows him as you did me you will own that you did it was never i who sought you what did you do you followed me in my walks you sought me when i was alone you threw yourself in my way you made the most of your beautiful face and your glorious voice you may have charmed my senses but you have never touched my heart and never will for one moment the tall graceful figure swayed to and fro and the brilliant proud face grew white as death you should spare me she said because i love you you of all people in the world should be kind to me i am not unkind he replied but i protest against this sentimental nonsense i will have no mention of love because it does not exist it was all a piece of acting valry and i played second to your first you even you cannot be so absurd as to think the few sentimental scenes that were enacted in that garden had any meaning they had to me she said faintly they had none to me to tell you the real truth he added with brutal frankness i always laughed at them even the most tender points they were so ridiculous so got up and i assure you that i always went back to agatha loving her doubly for her fair sweet innocence a red flush covered that beautiful face this was more than she could bear you laughed at me she said fiercely of course i did you must have laughed at yourself valry unfortunately i did not but i will answer for one thing you shall never laugh at me again i will give you such cause to remember myself and my name that though you may curse me you will never laugh at me now do not be tragic valry and let us end this unpleasant interview i will tell you the exact truth about yourself i admire your beauty every one must do that i admire your talent although i think you are an intriguant and not to be trusted still truth is best you are one of the last women in the world i should ever love i knew your type years ago and tired of such women as you listen one moment longer if i had admired esteemed loved you i should hate you more because of what you have done to agatha for that alone although i forgive you because you say you meant no harm for that i shall always like you less than any person i know that is your real meaning and decision she said calmly yes he replied and i should like to enforce it to make it as emphatic as i can i thank you i quite understand there is no need i shall waste no time in abuse but i tell you this to your face sarvain you are the most disloyal dishonorable man who ever went by the name of gentleman
Perhaps from this you may learn a lesson not to trifle with women. You have trifled with me. You saw that I was inclined to admire and like you and you enjoyed the incense offered to your vanity. I grant that I was greatly to blame in letting you know that I loved you. You were still more to blame in accepting that love and homage. Why were you true to one thing for once in your life? Why did you not say plainly that you loved Agatha and Agatha only and that no other woman had any interest for you? It would have been better, I admit, he said. You see what it has led to. You led me on until I cared enough for you to do anything which would win you to myself. What did you do? He asked curiously. She knew now that her game was lost, that never would her hopes and dreams be realized. Sir Wayne was dead to her, but he should never laugh at her again. He should take his punishment with him. You shall never laugh at me again, she said, never. I will tell you what I did. I wrote that letter and addressed it to myself. She had expected him to grow half mad with anger and indignation. But to her surprise, he merely shrugged his shoulders contemptuously. To tell you the truth, mademoiselle, he said, I more than suspected it. It was so entirely like you and so worthy of you. Well, you have done your worst with an anonymous letter. It was a good shot and it took effect right through your rival's heart. O oh, gentle womanly hands, that could do such a deed. Oh, rare and womanly heart that could plan it. His lips worked nervously and his face grew livid. I said that if ever I found out the writer of that letter, I would slay him. You are not even worth my anger, but you have my infinite contempt as one who stabs in the dark. It seems to me that your contempt is better and less dangerous than your love, she said curtly. So you wrote the letter. You are a clever woman, Valerie, and the idea is worthy of a French play. Would you mind telling me how you secured your information, which I admit to be perfectly correct? I should really like to know. She told him in a few words. His look of anger softened into contemptuous admiration. You are a clever woman, Valerie, wonderfully clever. I admire your talents. I admire your courage. But I would not advise you to exercise them in this fashion again. I have wounded you. I have hurt you. I have reached you at last, she said. By a very clumsy weapon. An anonymous letter, he said. The fittest instrument for such a deed. And for several minutes there was silence between them. End of chapter 36「ジョン・ o m e I think, said Valerie, that however greatly you may be tempted, you will never laugh at me again. I have more to tell you. You had better be careful, said Sir Wayne. I feel something almost like murder rising in my heart. I wish it were murder and you would kill me, she said. I should welcome death from your hands. I would not kill you, he said. I think the heaviest punishment for you will be to live. What more have you to tell me? Only this, that I took my letter to your fair-faced Agatha and I read it to her, word by word, slowly and impressively, so that she might understand it. And when I had finished, she read it, word for word, herself. It may make you more pitiful to women to know how it affected her. It killed her. If ever a smile comes to her face again, it will be more wonderful than the standing still of the sun. She fell at my feet, and she lay there a crushed, heartbroken woman. She told me that she would go away from you and never look at your face again. She told me also that if you knelt to beg her to marry you, she would not now, so that even should you find her, you will have no chance. You can leave that part of the business with me, he said. 
if or rather when i find her that will be all right he spoke calmly but his face was as pale as that of a corpse if she had been a man her life would not have been worth a moment's purchase i was very sorry for her she continued i do not think any woman ever suffered so much her face became ghastly white and she looked like one who had a sword right in her heart i was sorry for her but it was highly necessary that she should understand her position how he restrained himself he never knew afterward when he recalled this interview his one great wonder was that he had not killed her it seemed to him a miracle he made no answer to her taunts but they made him feel as he had never felt before let this be ended now he said you have done your worst now go i go she replied women have spoiled you servain you have made toys of them and have trampled upon them they have given you blessings instead of curses i am of different metal and i intend to take my vengeance you are entirely welcome to it he replied and pardon me if i seem flippant you can take as much as you like it seems little enough now she said but i will spoil your life i will spend mine in watching yours and at every turn i will spoil it you remember perhaps certain words of congreve the poet heaven has no rage like love to hatred turned nor hell a fury like a woman scorned keep them in your mind why should you take vengeance on me he said it is i who am wrong you have spoiled my life and i hate you for it she cried in a fury of passion my love has turned to hate i am all hate and i bid you beware of my vengeance i am not in the least degree afraid of it he replied and your manner of announcing it is worthy of the stage and now mademoiselle you have confessed your intrigues you have accused yourself you have denounced me you have sworn vengeance all after the kind of a true tragedy queen and to those favors one more leave me in peace i will she said but remember the time shall come when you will fear my vengeance and fear me until then fear well she was gone there was no time for another word he saw the tall figure vanish down the broad staircase and he went back to his room he was more unnerved more unsettled than ever he had partly suspected that she might have had something to do with that horrible letter she was more wicked and desperate than he thought and now he felt quite sure that agatha was dead she would be in despair she would go down to the lake and throw herself in no one had seen her since the servants saw her at the lake side poor pretty agatha he sighed deeply it was the saddest ending to a pretty romance still it was of no use mourning over a woman who was dead if she could have been living and he could have found her all well and good he was never constant for very long together this had been by far the longest love of his life now it was over there was an end of it and it was of no use repining he knew he had always known that if ever this knowledge reached her she would die of it it was a most unfortunate business and he would have been more content to have laid her in some green english churchyard than in the depths of the lake waters he was very depressed and unhappy for two or three weeks so much so that he considered himself a model of constancy and then he began to cheer up a little he met some english friends in paris and they spent some pleasant evenings together once more the love of fast life took hold of him its false glare blinded him and he could not believe that he had spent so many months in the solitude of belleflas he resolved on leaving paris and going home to england there in the midst of the world in which he had lived he should forget all the sooner he was dreadfully grieved and sorry but he did not feel at all as though his life was finished or marred far from it he had to live it so after a few weeks he returned to gaswood and was soon plunged into the midst of business politics and gaiety he was even more handsome and attractive than ever 
quite as eagerly welcomed, quite as much sought after. To be mistress of Gaswood was still the desire of many a fair maiden's heart. There was only one thing which he could not do. He would not go to the abbey when Lord Croft invited him. He never ceased to love Agatha and he never ceased to grieve over her. But as time passed, the impression grew less. It had only been one of many episodes in his life. It had been the whole of hers. The same evening that Agatha found her way to the porch of the hospital of St. John, one of the finest institutions in Paris, a sad accident happened to the young Count de Tierney. He was returning with his mother, the beautiful and wealthy Countess de Tierney, from a ball when their carriage came in collision with the fiacre that was rapidly driven by a man not quite sober. He could never answer for the consequences, for he was killed at once. The collision was of terrible force. The horses were so seriously injured that they had to be shot. The two belonging to the count were most valuable. The countess was thrown out but escaped uninjured. The count was flung with violence against the curbstone and lay there like one dead. Crowd collected at once and two gendarmes came to the scene. It was a curious sight to see that beautiful lady in her diamonds and magnificent dress kneeling on the pavement, crying out that her son was killed. She would let no one raise the injured head but herself. She laid it on the soft satin folds of her dress. Find a doctor, she cried in most heart-rending tones. For heaven's sake, find a doctor. A gentleman in the crowd went forward and said, Madame, it might be half an hour before a doctor could be found and brought here. The hospital of St. John is just around the corner. The best plan will be to carry him there. Do you think he is dead? asked the lady. The stranger placed his hand on the Count's breast. He is not dead, madame. His heart is beating, though faintly. He may rally if he has immediate help but not if he waits here until the doctor comes. In that case, he must die. Then for heaven's sake, let him be taken there, she said, and it was done at once. There was an instant stir in the crowd. A Frenchman seldom required asking toys for help. The door of the carriage was taken quickly from the hinges. He was laid upon it. Several strong men came forward with offers of help and he was carried quickly down the street to the hospital of St. John. The countess walked by his side. She would not leave him for one moment. The usual crowd followed. It was not an uncommon but a most picturesque procession. The wounded man, his mother in all the splendor of her ball attire, the diamonds gleaming in the light of the lamps, her jeweled hands clasping one of her sons, the crowd all agape with wonder following. There was the deep old-fashioned porch with the bright light shining and the great crucifix hanging in the hall. They rang the bell and while they waited for an answer, the countess saw the silent figure with its white face and folded hands lying on the seat. Even the stir of the crowd had not aroused Agatha from the deadly sleep of exhaustion. The countess went up to her. Dear heaven, she cried, what a face! What a beautiful angelic face! How did this girl come here? No one knew. She is a lady, said the countess, and I fear she is dying. Bring some help for her. Oh heaven, what a night! How full of misfortune and accident! In the confusion that ensued, when the attendants hastened to answer the bell, they assumed naturally that the young girl lying on the seat belonged to the party. Agatha was carried into the hospital and taken to a room and many hours elapsed before the truth was known. The doctors examined the young count and formed a favourable opinion of him. He was not so severely injured as had been feared at first. And when Madame la Countess, in her delight and gratitude, sat there weeping happy tears, one of the sisters came to inquire what should be done about the young lady who did not seem to be injured but who was very ill. The countess said in surprise, We had no young lady with us. Then she remembered the beautiful face in the porch. She does not belong to us, said the countess. But I am so grateful to heaven for its mercy that if she be in want or in need, I will take care of her. 
and that was how agatha became the protege of madame la comtesse tierney end of chapter 37
who or what she is does not concern us much but what can we do for her she is very ill she looks to me said sister anna as though she would never open her eyes again and then the kindly sisters drew nearer in anxious dread may heaven pity her said sister clear surely she will not die without a word or a prayer we must do something at once sister anna you will be the best to remain with her sister gertrude will you find dr rainer at once the sisters dispersed each carrying away with her a vivid recollection of the beautiful english girl lying on what seemed to be a bed of death then dr rainer came and looked astonished at the beautiful girl something serious he said to sister anna he bent down over the pale face he laid his hand on the girl's heart she is alive he said but this is a worse case than the young counts he looked at the white face and tried to raise one of the white eyelids it is the brain he said to himself i feared as much most probably sister he said aloud this is the swoon that often precedes brain fever it will go hard with her poor child nothing is known of her i suppose nothing replied the sister when they carried in monsieur le count she was found just as you see her now in the porch the countess de tierney has taken charge of her as an act of gratitude she says for her son's almost miraculous escape from death suddenly the fair head stirred and the beautiful eyes opened wide with a vacant stare vain vain she cried and the doctor looked at the sister vain vain she repeated and the doctor looking wisely at the sister said that is a name an english name vain it is a droll one said the good sister but these english they are just a little droll do you not think so you are right sister and now what had we better do if we knew anything of her story or antecedents it would guide us vain vain cried the girl and the golden head tossed wearily on the white pillow vain 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 is a man's name said the doctor vain is certainly a man's name most probably a love story vain vain she cried and good sister anna shook her head it will be long before he hears you my child she said but agatha only looked at her with beseeching eyes and uttered her usual cry vain vain brain fever said the doctor and it will be a bad case but she is in good hands you can do nothing more at present than use eyes to the head the sister took up the long golden hair in her hands the kindly loving heart shining out of her eyes i hope this will not be cut off she said we will save it if possible he replied vain vain cried the girl a burning flush mounted to her face her eyes were full of wild burning light the white hands beat the air helplessly the golden head was tossed incessantly to and fro the quick rapid cry of vain vain never stopped that will be trying said the doctor as the voice reached to a scream of keen distress it will be very trying for you sister it is worse for her said the kindly woman much worse but the time came when sister anna would have given anything for relief from that one piercing cry it never ceased at one time it was low and tender then it rose into a prolonged wail of despair as the fever grew higher she began to talk about other things she lay and murmured something of a church of a fair faced saint with the palm branch of her mother's grave but all ended in the cry for vain she must have suffered terribly the sisters said she has a fine though delicate constitution and the fight will be for dear life the doctor said the countess herself came often to the bedside and more than once her eyes filled with tears as she heard that ever pathetic cry vain vain then came the time of recovery when by degrees the cruel mist cleared away and memory more cruel still came in its place good sister anna will never forget the day when the beautiful eyes looked in her own and the weak voice asked sister where am i in the hospital of saint john my child heaven be praised that you can speak sensibly where 
In what hospital? You are in Paris, my dear, answered the nun. Paris? I thought I lived by a lake, she said. Paris? How did I come here? I cannot tell you. We found you in the cold stone porch. Slowly enough, the memory of it came back to her. A stone porch with a great crimson lamp burning. Ah, and a crucifix hanging on the wall. She could see the white face and the crown thorned head. Why had she come there? Then she was in a railway train, travelling by night and by day with speed. And then she was standing on the terrace, with Valerie standing before her and telling her over and over again that she had never been married and she was not Wayne's wife. She remembered it all then. She looked in the gentle face of the nun. Sister, she said, do you think I am ill enough to die? I hope not, my dear, was the gentle answer. Oh, pray for me that I may die. God hears the prayers of good people. Pray that I may die. Death is not always better than life, said the sister. You differ from the last young girl whom I nursed. Do I? In what way? She asked, interested in what the sister was saying. Ah, my dear, she was a young girl, just like you, but French, not English, and the French are so emotional, you know, so quick. She had been in great trouble, and the doctor said he thought she would die. In the middle of the night, I was sitting with her, and I shall never forget how I was startled at the time. A low voice broke the silence of the night. Sister, she said, pray heaven that I may not die. Why, my dear, I asked, there are rest and peace in death. There is something better in life, she said. There is time for repentance. Pray for me that I may not die, but that I may live and suffer and repent. You differ from her, my dear? Yes, replied Agatha. But she took the lesson to heart and never prayed again that she might die. The day came when, to the great relief of Madame, the Count was able to be carried home. Agatha, too, was recovering then and had become a great favourite with all the good sisters. The impression that her beautiful natural character made upon them all was so good that no one ever suspected her, even ever so faintly, of the least wrongdoing. End of chapter 38。Chapter 39 of the Earl's Atonement by Bertha M. Clay。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Read by Vinay Mala。Chapter 39 I have been sinned against。The Countess de Tierney sat alone in her magnificent boudoir, a room so luxuriously furnished that it might have been prepared for an empress. The room was a fit shrine for the handsome, stately woman who used it. The Countess wore a dress of rich black velvet rimmed with rare point lace. She wore diamond rings on her fingers and a diamond brooch fastened the rich lace. She was thinking deeply. She had received a letter that morning from the sisters saying that the young English girl was now convalescent and that her room was wanted for others. Would Madame let them know what was to be done? The result of which was that the Countess had written to ask if they would send the young lady to her. She would soon decide what was to be done. She was waiting for her now and in a few minutes a servant ushered her into the room. Madame looked at her in wondering admiration. She had only seen her twice and each time she was under the influence of the fever. The sisters had done their best for her. They had purchased a plain black dress and bonnet, quaint and old-fashioned, but they made her look the more beautiful by contrast. The tall, slender figure and pale, beautiful face were seen to greater advantage than would have been the case in any other dress. Madame noticed the air of distinction, the high-bred grace, the elegance of every attitude. This girl is a lady, she said to herself, a perfect lady. She smiled kindly and held out her jeweled hand in greeting. I am pleased to see you, dear child, she said. Come nearer to me. Agatha went up to her. I should like you to understand, she said gently, the source of my interest in you. I have an only son. Do you know what an only son is to the mother who adores him? I adore my son. 
he is the whole world to me sometimes since as you know we were returning from a ball together and by some accident our carriage was nearly destroyed and he was almost killed he was taken to the hospital and by the prompt kindly skill there displayed his life was saved you poor child had taken refuge there the same night and when i heard of you i vowed as an act of gratitude to heaven i would make you my special care are you willing that this should be so you overwhelm me with gratitude madam she replied with tears in her eyes nay i would not do that dear child you agree to become my charge that is well do not think that i wish to pry into your life or ask any questions there is but one i must ask and my heart answers it before my lips speak it one cannot help seeing that you have had a misfortune of some kind or other tell me quite frankly has it been your own fault to herself this kindly lady admitted it would be just as easy to accuse an angel from heaven agatha looked at her with a pale fearless face i hardly know how to answer your question madam she said how far i am to blame in the eyes of god i know not i never had the least intention of wrong in my life but i am afraid that i am weak credulous and ignorant enough to stand worthy of blame before heaven poor child said madam thinking how wicked any one must have been to take advantage of such innocence as hers very hard and bitter things have been said to me she continued i cannot tell you if i deserve them i can only say that of myself i would at any time prefer death to sin but i have been sinned against madam my dear young mother named me agatha after the fair young saint on the old church window a saint with a halo round her head and a palm branch in her hand and her story is this that she preferred to die rather than offend god i would do just the same the fair pure face the tender eyes the sweet sensitive lips the clear vibrating voice all impressed madam i believe you she said and i trust you that question is at an end whatever misfortune may have been it was not i am sure your fault now you must decide your life in your own way i leave the decision with you you are a lady i am a doctor's daughter said agatha simply and madam smiled by appearance education and manner you are evidently a lady well qualified to take your place in any society now i offer you your choice i adopt you in gratitude to heaven you will forgive my frank speaking if i tell you that you are so beautiful and winning that if i introduce you into society you would marry well the sweet face grew just a little paler oh no madam i shall never marry she replied and your rank is so far above mine that i would rather not if you are good enough to take any interest in me madam let me be taught to work i do not think now that i could live unless my mind were always employed if i have leisure to think i shall most surely die it shall be as you wish said the countess what would you like to be what would you choose some profession i should like to make my life useful to others she said and i love children i think madam if you are willing i should like to be a governess i think it is a very sensible decision replied madam she was silent for some minutes during which agatha watched her anxiously then she spoke what are your qualifications my dear she asked what could you teach music replied agatha her face brightening i understand it well and french and italian and i think i am a good english scholar a very fair list of qualifications said madam well pleased of course there will be a difficulty about situations at first you had better take one with me come and stay with me as my companion for 6 months you can read to me write my letters play to me for i love music you need not be seen you can have two rooms and when i have visitors which i do have three times each week you can always retire then when the time is over unless you wish to remain i can give you such recommendations as will ensure you a good situation anywhere how must i thank you madam she cried my heart is full of gratitude how good you are to me what should i have done but for you thank heaven my dear child which has made me the means of carrying its bounty to you thank heaven 
When I lay in the little room, said Agatha, how often have I wondered what would become of me when I grew well. I did not know. And now you, madam, have taken every shadow of care from my heart. I thank you. We must go to into details now, said madam. Of course, you are quite unprovided with dress and indeed with everything else. I am indeed, said Agatha. Madam opened her desk and took from it a bank note. That will provide you with two or three neat dresses and all that you want besides. She said, and you may repay me, my dear, when you grow rich. A few more days and Agatha was installed in the luxurious mansion of the Countess de Tierney. Every attention was paid to her. She had two very nice rooms and she had time for herself. Madame was by no means an exacting employer. In time, she became greatly attached to the beautiful English girl whose sweet face was always so sad. She loved her very much and the more time she spent with her, the more she admired her. The purity of her character, the frank, noble simplicity that could hardly even comprehend deceit or meanness in others. The fervent spiritual mind, the way that seemed so natural to her of thinking more of heaven than of earth, all charmed the countess. You like to visit the poor, she said to her one day. You shall have a carte blanche. There are over a hundred families at least that I should like to assist. You shall be almoner. And something of the old light came back to her when she was once more of use to the poor. The intolerable sense of degradation under which she had suffered and smarted seemed lessened. Once more, the sweet face did its work among the poor, wounded hearts, brought sunshine where darkness had long reigned. The first day of her residence in that superb mansion, the countess asked her what was her name. There is nothing in a name, said Madame, laughing. Still, I must have one for you. You ought to be called, Lily. You are just like one. Yesterday, when you threw my blue shawl over your arm, you looked to me so exactly like one of Raphael's Madonnas. I was quite startled. My name is Brooke, said Agatha. While the countess had been talking, she had been thinking and the result of her decision was that she would take no false name, that she would use no more disguises. She had done nothing that compelled her to hide herself. My name is Brooke, she repeated. Then she bowed her head while a great fitful flush rose to her face. I will not hide from you, madame. She said that for a short time in my life I bore another name which I equally believed to be my own. But I had been deceived. I had no right to it. And Madame respected the frank young soul that struggled against all deceit and untruth. All went on gaily, pleasantly and happily until the young Count returned. He had been in the south of France for some weeks for his health and returned well and strong. He had been in the house some few days before he even saw Agatha. When they met, it was at the foot of the grand staircase. And Henri Count de Tierney gazed in wonder at the fair English girl. He made her a profound bow. He was a fine, gallant young fellow, brave as a lion, but vain. And he considered himself irresistible. A look from his fine eyes was he considered an arrow in the heart of any woman. France was the finest country in the world. Frenchmen, the grandest race. French women, adorable. French characteristics, the finest known. Of himself, the young count had the best opinion. He did not think the woman was born who could resist him. He was perfectly good, as moral as a French count could be. The very soul of good nature, but vain as a boarding school beauty. He darted one glance at the pale, beautiful face, and then he treated Agatha to his best bow. That must impress her, he thought. It is impossible for it to be otherwise. While Agatha, whose horror of man had reached a frenzy, hastened away without the least acknowledgement of the Count's courtly bow. He stood looking after her and he smiled to himself as though his thoughts were very pleasant ones. End of chapter 39